absolutely thrilled to bring you today a meticulously crafted course that I've poured significant time, effort and passion into. This isn't just any course. It's the ultimate spring boot experience, offering a whooping eight hours of rich and carefully crafted content. First, let's answer this question. Why spring boot? Well, in today's market, it stands tall as one of the most sought after frameworks. Mastering it can be truly a game changer. Consider this. The demand for skilled Springwood developers is soaring and it shows no signs of slowing down. Top tier companies worldwide are actively seeking professionals like you. Picture landing that dream job or better yet, forging your own path to success armed with Spring Boot experience. So how do you grab these opportunities? It's straightforward. Join me on this course. Let's take a sneak peek into the incredible journey that you're about to embark on. First, we have Spring Core, Spring Boot in Action, Dependency Injection, Spring Profiles Magic, RESTful APIs, Data Persistence and Spring Data JPA, DTO Pattern, Robust Service Layer, Data Validation Techniques, uh, Testing, uh, Mokito, and much, much, much more. So envision this. Mastering Spring Boot doesn't just make you a developer, it transforms you to a problem solver. A digital magician turning code into cutting edges solutions. These skills will swing open doors to job opportunities and elevate your career to new heights. Remember, your future begins with the choices you make today. It's a new year, so start investing in your skills is investing in your future. Before we dive in, a quick reminder, you, my fellow followers, you are my driving force. I urge you to share this video, invite your friends to join the channel and let's grow together. Let's spread knowledge, help others learn and create a community of learners. And if you're new to my channel, smash that subscribe button, it's gonna be left or right and enjoy a plethora of video content with new videos dropping weekly let's the learning journey begin what is spring framework the spring framework is an open source framework for building enterprise java applications spring aims to simplify the complex and cumbersome enterprise java application development process by offering a framework that includes technologies such as aspect-oriented programming, dependency injection, plain old Java objects, and so and so forth. Even with all these technologies, Spring is a lightweight framework that can be used to create scalable, secure, and robust enterprise applications. At a macro level, we can consider the Spring framework a collection of sub-frameworks such as Spring Webflow, Spring MVC, Spring ORM, and so and so forth. Core features of Spring Framework The IOC container, or the inversion of control conta container. IOC container is one of the core features of Spring that provides a streamlined way to configure and manage Java objects. This container is responsible for managing the life cycle of a defined Java object, significantly increasing the configurability of a Spring-based application. IOC uses dependency injection or dependency lookup patterns to provide the object reference during runtime. AUP Aspect Oriented Programming AUP aims to provide more modularity to the cross-cutting concerns which are functions that span across the application such as logging, caching, transaction management, authentication, and so and so forth. And then data access framework, so Spring simplifies the database communication process by providing direct support for popular data access framework in Java such as JDBC, Hibernate, Java Persistence, API, also known as JPA. Additionally, it offers features such as resource management, exception handling, and resource wrapping for all the supported data access frameworks, 
further simplifying the development process. Finally, we have Spring MVC. So the Spring MVC enables developers to create applications using the popular MVC pattern. It is a request-based framework that allows developers to easily create customized MVC implementations that exactly suits their needs. The core components of the Spring MVC is the Dispatcher Servlet class, which handles user requests and then forward them to the correct controller. This allows the controller to process the request, create the model, and then provide the information for the end user via a specified view. Spring Beans. A Spring Bean refers to an object that is managed by the Spring Framework in a Java application. The term Bean is used in the context of the Spring Framework. The Spring Framework creates these beans, manages their life cycle and organizes their dependencies with other beans. It takes care of the instantiation, configuration and wiring up of objects, saving developers from a lot of manual work. Also, the Spring Beans can be configured using XML, Java annotations, or Java code. Life cycle of a Spring Bean. First, let's understand the life cycle of an object. So the life cycle of an object means when and how it is born, how it behaves throughout its life, and when and how it dies. Similarly, the bean life cycle refers to when and how the bean is instantiated, what action it performs until it lives and when and how it is destroyed. So the bean lifecycle is managed by the Spring Container. When we run the program, the first of all, the Spring Container gets started. After that, the container creates the instance of a bean as per the request, and then dependencies are injected. And finally, the bean is destroyed when the Spring Container is closed. Now, let's see how we can configure a bean. So first we can use the configuration annotation, which declares a class as a full configuration class. And here you need to note that a class must be non-final and public. Also, we can use the at bean annotation, which declares a bean configuration inside of a configuration class. And the method must be non-final and non-private. So it can be public, protected, or package private. And here is an example. So we see we have the app config class annotated with the add configuration annotation. And inside it, we have a payment service, which has the add bean annotation. So this will return a new payment service implementation, and we can pass any other dependency, for example, in this case, we have the account repository as a dependency for the payment service implementation bean. Also, let's see a full example where we can declare multiple beans. So again, we have the app config class annotated with the add configuration. And inside that we have a payment service bean, we have account repository bean and a data source bean. So the data source will return the data source connection to our database, for example, or our data source. And then we have in the middle, the account repository, which is also a bean that takes a parameter or as a parameter, the data source bean that we already created. And finally, from the top, we have the bean payment service that takes the account repository as a dependency and Spring will manage all that. So Spring will know that we need to create a data source first and then pass it to the account repository. And then we create the account repository bean and pass it as an injectable bean to the payment service. Spring component sample. So the Spring component contains class level annotation that marks a class as a Spring component using the add component annotation. So the constructor dependency injection is automatically done using the add auto wired by injecting the constructor parameters. So the auto wired on constructor is optional if there is only one constructor. And here we see an example. So we have our payment service implementation class, which is marked as a component. So this means that we want to mark this class as a spring bean. And then we have a private final account repository, which is refers to another spring bean. 
and we have a constructor payment service implementation with the annotation autowired and we have or we pass a parameter of type account repository and then we assign the local or the the class instance account repository we assign it to the account repository that we get as a parameter from the constructor so in this way we are injecting via the constructor the account repository bean into the variable or the local variable account repository spring components so spring provides component stereotype to classify classes as spring components the subtypes are available as a refinement for the standard components. So the component annotation as general component annotation indicating that the class should be initialized, configured and managed by the core container. Also at repository, at service and at controller as meta annotation for the component that allows to further refine components. Own stereotype annotation can and should be defined to support general architecture principles. Now let's understand the bean naming. So here assuming that we have this configuration class that contains the three beans that we explained already before, payment service, account repository, and data source. Now we see that in the data source bean, we provided a name, we call it DS. So now let's see how Spring is going to name these beans. So first, when we talk about the first bean payment service, which returns a payment service object. So this, we give it a name or a bean name payment service as for the method name. The same for the account repository. If we don't provide a name for the bean, Spring automatically will use the method name as a bean name. So the bean of type account repository will be named account repository. Finally, for the data source, when we provide the name, so Spring will take that one as a name for the bean. So the data source bean name will be DS. So bean naming is really important in case we want to fetch or to get programmatically any bean from our application context. So now we know how Spring names the beans. Beans injection. When we talk about beans injection, we also mean dependency injection. So the Spring framework provides four ways to inject beans. So the Spring can configure dependencies on different injection elements. First, we have constructor injection. So the constructor parameter to receive dependencies during bean construction. So the, we call this also the constructor injection. Then we have field injection and this field definition to receive dependency injected with the reflection access, also called field injection. Then we have configuration methods with one or many parameters receiving dependencies through method parameters, also called method injection. And finally, we have setter injection or setter method injection. So the, so the Java setter method are specialized configuration method with only one parameter and a defined naming scheme called also setter injection. So the injection target can be referred using two different modes. Type injection injects an object of matching type or name injection injects any object by name constructor injection. So here, let's first see the example of uh, the case of a service. So we have here a class uh, called default payment service that contains uh, a final account repository. And then we have the constructor default payment service. So in the default payment service constructor, we are declaring also an object or we passing a parameter of type account repository. And like that spring will be automatically injecting this account repository bean. Then we have, for example, in case we have a repository. So we see that we have a JDBC account repository implements account repository. So then we have a final or private final data source and then we have the constructor GDBC account repository and we pass also a parameter which is the data source and then Spring will automatically inject that using the constructor. Also for injecting beans we can specify or we can tell Spring which bean to inject and for this one we can use the, the annotation called qualifier 
and here let's see an example. So here we have a class called application config annotated with a configuration and inside that we have two beans of the same type. So two beans are of type account repository and we have a primary and a secondary. So this means that we will create two beans. The first one will be called primary and the second one will be called secondary. But these two beans are referred by type, which is the account repository. So here we can give a qualifier for each bean. So the first one we will call it or we give it a qualifier primary and the second one we will give it a qualifier secondary. And when we want to inject one of these beans, we can also on the class level or for example, the service level, let's say we have the default payment service and we want to auto wire or to inject a bean of type account uh, repository. And here we want to choose or we can choose which bean to inject. So we can use again the qualifier annotation on the service or the object level. And as we can see in the default payment service constructor, we are telling Spring that we want to inject the bean that has the name or the qualifier called primary. So this is how we can use the qualifier annotation to inject the bean. Also, if we want to, to define a bean as primary, we can use the primary annotation to define which bean should be primary or should be prior or prioritized for spring to be injected. So in this case, we don't, we don't need the qualifier annotation. So assuming again that we have the application config uh, class, uh, configuration class, and then we have the same two uh, beans, but now instead of giving a qualifier annotation, we can choose which is the primary. So for example, we have the, the account repository primary, and then we give it the primary annotation. And then when we want to inject a bean of type account repository, all we need to do is just to inject it using the constructor or the field and so on and so forth. And Spring will know automatically that the account repository bean, which is called primary, is a prioritized bean. So it will inject that one. Unless we want to change, for example, we can give a qualifier. And then when we use the qualifier, so Spring will use that one over the primary field injection. So field injection allows direct injection into field declaration without constructor or method delegation. But here you need to note that this type of injection is discouraged because it makes testing of component in isolation more complex, therefore should only be used in test classes. And here is an example. We have the default payment service, which is a class annotated with the add service annotation. And then we have a variable or a field uh, of type account repository. And then when using the auto wired annotation, this means that we want to inject this account repository using field injection. Method injection. So the method injection allows setting one or many dependencies by one method. So it also allows for initializing work if needed while receiving dependencies. And here we see an example. We have our default payment service annotated with a service annotation. And then we have a method called configure class, which is of type void void. And then we have two variables or two fields, which is account repository and fee calculator, for example, and assuming these two um, these two classes or these two objects are beans and then all we need to do is to set the auto wired uh, annotation on the method level and then spring would understand automatically that we need to inject these two beans so this is what we called method injection setter injection so the setter injection follows java bean naming convention to inject dependencies and here we see an example so assuming again that we have a class called default payment service annotated with the add service annotation. And then all we need to do is to declare our field and then use the setter method to inject this bean. So here we see that we have a public void set account repository, and then it takes as a parameter account repository. And then it's just a classic set method annotated with the add auto wired annotation. So spring will understand that this is a setter injection and it will inject the field using the setter method. 
Now let's see the official recommendation for constructor based or setter based dependency injection. So I copied this from the Spring Core documentation and you can see the link down here. So here, since you can mix constructor based and setter based dependency injection, it's good rule to them to use constructor for mandatory dependencies and setter for method or, or configuration method for optional dependencies. And here, like you can read it uh, your, uh, on your own. And then here, the Spring team generally advocates constructor injection. So it's always recommended and it's always better to use constructor injection to inject your beans into a class. Bean scoping. So first let's understand what is a bean scope. So bean scope in Spring Framework refers to the life cycle of a Spring bean and its availability in the context of the application. So when a bean is instantiated or looked up, its scopes determines its life cycle and which other beans can, in can interact with it. So the Spring provides multiple scopes to register and configure beans and scoping has an impact on the state management of the components. Also, the default scope model is singleton, means one instance per application context. Shared instance will be accessed by other components. Therefore, components must be thread safe. So now let's see what are the bean scopes provided by Spring. So first of all, we have the singleton and as we mentioned, it's the default. So this is the default bean scope in Spring Container. Only one instance of the bean is created and all requests of that bean will receive the same instance. This is useful for bean that do not, uh, do not hold state or where the same state is to be shared by all users or threads. Then the second one is prototype. So this means a new instance is created each time a bean is requested from the container. This is useful for beans to carry state that is specific to the uh, to other user or thread and thus can't be shared. The third type is request. So this scope is only valid in the context of web over spring application context for a single HTTP request. A new bean is created for each HTTP request. Then we have session. So the scope is also valid only on the context of WebAware Spring application context of an HTTP session. So it's, a, it's different from the request. So the HTTP request or the request scope is available for the HTTP request and the session is for HTTP session. So this means a new bean is created for each HTTP session by the container. Then we have application. So this scope is also valid only in the context of WebAware Spring application context for the lifecycle of a servlet context. So this bean is scoped at the application level. And finally, we have WebSocket. So this scope is valid only in the context of WebWare Spring application context for the life cycle of a WebSocket. The bean is scoped at the WebSocket level. So bean scoping is really important if you want to correctly manage your bean. And as I mentioned before, by default, the bean scope is singleton. Now, let's see how we can define a scope for a specific bean. So whether we can specify it by name. So for example, let's say we have bean one annotated with the bean annotation, and then we can give it the scope annotation, and then we just provide the name of the scope. Also, we can use the annotation to provide the scope annotation. For example, let's say session annotation. So we have a specific annotation for that. Personally, I recommend using the annotation to specify the scope, just to avoid mistakes or to avoid typos. Now let's talk a little bit about some special spring beans. So first of all, we have the bean environment. So the bean environment is an environment abstract abstraction. So Spring provides an environment abstr abstraction to decouple application code from the environment with the support for bean definition profiles that allow different sets of beans depending on the environment. For example, we have local environment, dev environment, cloud, prod, and so on and so forth. Also, it helps resolving properties for external sor uh, sources. For example, database settings from 
the configuration file or reading creden credentials from uh, CLI arguments and so and so forth. Environment can also be injected into the code if needed. And now let's see an example. So here we have the application config class annotated with the add configuration and then we can inject the environment bean. So all we need to do is to create or to declare a field of type environment and then auto wired. And as you can see, we can get, for example, uh, we have uh, in this payment service method, which is a bean, we have a profile so we can read or create a profiles of type cloud. And then we can say this dot environment dot accepts profile and we can pass the cloud profile as an environment. And then, for example, we can also read some property. So all we need to do is this dot environment dot get property and then the property name. So this is how we can use this predefined bean. Then we have the bean profiles. So a profile in Spring is a named logical grouping that may be activated programmatically or set as active through configuration. So this feature is particularly useful when you have beans that should be active or registered and used in certain environments or conditions. For instance, you may have different configuration for development, testing and production environment and you want to make sure that certain beans are only used in one of these environments. This is how we can use this profile bean or the profile annotation. We can use it in three different ways. First of all, on a Spring component. So here we have the first one is the default payment service class. And I want this service to be only available for the profile cloud. Then we can use it on the configuration level. So I want this configuration to be scanned and and applied by Spring only for the cloud profile also. Also, we can declare the profile on the bean configuration. So this means that a specific bean is only available for the cloud profile. Also, a bean can be active or activated programmatically. For example, let's see this code right here. So first of all, we create a variable of type annotation config application context. So this is our application context. So it, it equals new annotation config application context. And then we have the application context and we have a method called get environment. And then we can set the active profiles. And then we, all we need to do is just to provide the profile name. Then we need, for example, if we have a different package to scan, so we said also application context.scan and then we can provide the base package. And then of course, don't forget to refresh. So Spring will refresh its own context. And then for example, we can get the bean which is available for this cloud profile. So we can get, for example, the payment service equals application context.get bean and then we pass the service class. So also we have another different way to define the active profile. So using the properties file. So for example, we can use the YAML representation and it will be spring profiles active and then the profile name or using the application properties, which is also spring.profiles.active equals cloud. So in spring framework, the value annotation is used at the field level or method or constructor parameter level for expression driven dependency injection. This annotation is commonly used for injecting values into variable in a class, whether they are primitives, strings or complex types. These values can come from properties files, system properties, or they can be hard coded. And here is an example how we can inject values using the value annotations. So assuming that we have an application config class annotated with configuration, and then we have, for example, we want to create a data source bean. And for that, we need the, the URL, the username and password of our database. And assuming that these properties are stored in, the, in a file called database.properties under our resource folder. So first of all, we need to inject or to tell Spring from where we want to read these property sources. And for that, we use the property source annotation. And then we provide the class path. So the class path will refer 
to the the resource folder and then we provide the file name so it's 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 called database.properties for example and then if i want to inject the url variable or the url property which is called in my properties file jdbc.url i use the annotation at value and then dollar and then curly brackets and between the curly brackets is the property name also the value annotation can also resolve dynamic expression to access other beans or well-known beans like for example system properties so if i want to get a property from my system properties bean all i need to do is to use the value annotation and then i use the dash uh, symbol and then between the curly brackets i can use the system properties and then i read the property called user.region for example to inject the default locale or to look up the default locale from the system properties let's see now some best practices for the spring framework so first of all split configuration so configuration class can be split into several classes first of all to avoid large configuration classes and also to allow splitting classes based on architecture or other drivers so the class can um, classes can import each other or application context can be constructed with multiple classes and here is an example so for example we have a first configuration class called server uh, service config and this one it will configure a bean of type payment service we have then repository config and this one it, it will contain a bean of type account repository and then we have a class which has also a configuration class called app config and then for this app configuration we need the service config and the repository config and for that we can use the import annotation to import the two previous configuration classes so like that we are applying the best practices and we are splitting our configuration into multiple configuration classes and then we can import only what we need so like that we will have a more maintainable code spring initializer provides a simple web ui to configure the project to generate uh, an endpoints that you can use via plain http all you need to do is to go to start.spring.io website and you will have this user interface so the service allows you to customize the project to generate the build system and using for example groovy maven or uh, or gradle also you can choose the language whether you want to use java kotlin or groovy and then you can choose the spring boot version that you want to use so here like at the time of recording this course the most recent version the stable one is 3.1.0 and then we have a set of metadata where we can provide and give the information about the group id the artifact id the application name and description and then the base package name then we provide the packaging whether we want to package our application as a jar file or war file and the recommended one is always to use jar file with spring boot and finally we have the java version that we want to use for example for spring 3 the minimum required version is java 17 and if you want for example to use uh, to use spring 2.7 point something you can use java 11 or java 8. so the project generated by the spring initializer contains a spring boot application and we will have a demo application.java and then if you run the main method of this demo application you will see an empty spring boot application starting at localhost and then the port 8080 which is we need for that case the web dependency at least to be able to run the spring boot application as a web environment Spring Boot is an approach to develop Spring-based applications with very less or no configuration. It leverages existing Spring Boot projects as well as third-party projects to develop production-ready applications. It provides a set of starters, POM or Gradle build file, which can use to add required dependencies and facilitate auto configuration. Also, Spring Boot comes with a lot of auto configuration so depending on the libraries on its class path spring boot is able to automatically configure the required classes now let's see why we need to use spring boot first of all it comes with standalone applications 
and also it comes with embedded servers such as Tomcat or Jetty, so there is no need anymore to deploy WAR files. Also, it, co it provides opinionated starters, POM or Gradle, depending on your project configuration, to simplify the Maven or the project configuration, generally speaking. Spring Boot automatically configure the Spring framework whenever possible. Also, it provides production-ready features such as metrics, health check, and externalized configurations. And finally, there is no more requirements for XML configuration or any other type of configuration. It only needs configuration whenever it's required. First of all, let's start with creating a new Spring Boot project. So, as we explained before, all we need to do is to go to the start.spring.io website and you will have this nice looking UI where you can create a new Spring Boot project. So first of all, let's choose our uh, dependency manager. So in this case, we'll be using Maven because personally I prefer Maven because I'm so familiar with the Maven structure and also the XML structure. Then we have the language. So we will be using Java as a programming language for our course. And then let's choose or let's select a Spring Boot Mover version. So here, as you can see at the time of recording this video, the most recent stable version is the Spring 3.1.0, but we will be using the 3.0 point something. So make sure you use the version 3.0 because as for now, like the Spring 3.1 comes with, with some deprecations and even for, for the future, I assume that companies, they will not migrate yet to the Spring version 3 even or even the Spring 3.1.0. I will make a video explaining why you need to skip the 3.1.0. All right, so let's select the version here and then let's provide the metadata of our project. So first, this is the group ID. So the group ID refers to the company, if we may say so. For example, let's take Meta or like the old Facebook company. Now it's called Meta. So for example, for the group ID, it, it will be com.meta. So this is the company name. And then the artifact refers to the project or, or to the sub company. For example, here, let's say Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp and so and so forth. So here the com.meta or like the group ID refers to the company and the artifact refers to the project itself. So here I will say com.alibu. Com let's use Alibu as a group ID and here let's say example, okay? So here it will automatically use the artifact ID as the project name. So let's also keep it example. And here you can also provide a description for your project. So here it's a demo project for Spring Boot application. So this is also fine with us. And also the package name is the concatenation of the group and the artifact ID. And of course you can update or you can modify the package name. And this will be the base package of our application. And then we have the packaging what is the, the format or the package format of our final application, whether we want to use jar files, which is Java archive or war file, which is war ar web archive. And then we need to specify the Java version. Okay. So the Java version right here, if we use the spring 3.0 point something or spring 3.1, the minimum required version of Java is Java 17. All right, so now after specifying this, we can move on and add dependencies. So as explained before, Spring Boot comes with a set of starters and the starter is already a Spring Boot application, which comes with a lot of auto configuration, which will simplify our life of coding. So here we need to click on add dependency and then we can filter or we can search for the dependency that we want to use, for example, if we want to create a web application or RESTful application, we can filter or like we can search for web. And here you will see that we have the Spring Web Starter. And as the description says, build web including RESTful application using Spring MVC, uses Apache Tomcat as the default embedded container. 
So for now, let's say that we want to use web. So I will select this dependency and also you can click and add more dependencies. So for example, if you need JPA or if we, if we want to implement a persistent layer on our application, we can choose Spring Data JPA or for example, if you want to use Postgres SQL, we can also search for Postgres SQL or for example, even for my SQL and so and so forth. Okay, so for now, let's start with this simple dependency, which is Spring Web. And then we will, we will see how we can even add manually a new dependency. So here you can whether click on this explore button and here you will see the project structure or like the future project that will be generated. And as you can see here, we have the pom.xml selected and I will explain this in the coming video. So now you can close this one and click on generate and this will download a zip file containing the project that we already created. So now I will just place this one in my workspace. So it will be here and then source code and I will just save it here. So now I have my zip file downloaded. Now let's move on and open this file using IntelliJ. Now start your IntelliJ and then click on open. So if you have already open project, you will see a button right here called open or all you can do is just go to file and then open. All right. So this will open a prompt right here and then navigate to the location of your source code and then select the pom.xml. So here I have the example.zip file, which has, which is I already unzipped. And as you can see here, we have this list of files and this SRC folder. So all you need to do is to select the pom.xml file and then click on open and then say open as a project. And of course, trust this one and then start. So this will open a window like this containing the project structure that we see right here. And as you can see, we have this, but this structure right here. So in the next video, I will explain everything. But before that, I want to show you something. So before we start exploring our project and checking the project structure, first of all, I want to highlight something because so many of you have been requesting and asking the same question about the theme or the UI of my IntelliJ. So as you can see here, for example, if I select this file, right here, you will see that it's really nice looking and we have all these icons and so and so forth. So this is, is part of the newest version of IntelliJ and you need to go and activate this UI. So what you need to do, go to IntelliJ and then settings or file settings for Windows users and then go to appearance and behavior. And here you will see that you have a menu called new UI and it's in the beta version for now. So here you can click on enable new UI and then you have this compact mode that you see in my screen right now. So like this, you will have the same UI as me, as me. And this might be also helpful for you to have a better and a nice looking IntelliJ or nice looking IDE. And also it will be easier for you to follow what I'm doing right now. So I'm going to click on cancel and now let's go back and, and explore our project. Now, before we move on, let me show you a few things that you might need to set up also your working environment and in order to use IntelliJ in a, in, a, in a good way. So first let's click on file and then select project structure. And in here you will see in the project. So here you see the SDK. So here you will have a list of SDKs that you can use within your project. So if you don't have, for example, the Java 17, all you need to do is to click, for example, no SDK, or you can click on add SDK and then you can click on download JDK. So this will provide you a list of the, the available JDKs. For example, if you want, for example, let's say Java 19, and then you can select the vendor or the provider. So it's whether Amazon Coreto and so on and so forth. So you can select that one and here you can keep the location by default. So IntelliJ will store it in its location, like the location that IntelliJ will choose. And then all you need to do is to click on download and then you will have it in the list right here. So like this, you won't be prompted or like blocked if you don't have already the SDK or the JDK installed. 
all right so this is a, an important step for you before we start coding or before we start diving into our code so then click on apply once you download the sdk or, or change the version just click on ok or apply and then you will have your sdk ready to use all right now we can start to check out our project structure so here when you create a new spring boot project you will find this idea or uh, yeah it's called idea folder which is uh, automatically created by IntelliJ so we can just ignore that because it depends on your IDE you will have this folder right here and then we have this .mvn folder that contains a wrapper and then we have this maven wrapper.jar and maven wrapper.properties so this means that you really don't need to download manually and install manually maven because when you create a new spring boot project with uh, using the Ma using maven so it it will create or it will download automatically a maven wrapper.jar file and you can use this one in your command line to run some commands and we will see that later on how we can use this maven wrapper because for example for my machine i did not install maven on my machine so i always use the maven wrapper provided by the spring boot project and i would say this is a good approach because like that you are not depending on a specific version which is installed on your machine but you depend on the version which is provided by the spring initializer so then we have this source folder which contains two main subfolders we have this main and we have the test so first of all let's check the main folder the main folder contains also two subfolders we have first of all this java folder where we will have all the java files of our applications all the classes and object of our application will go into this java folder and then we have the resources folder so the resources folder contains two subfolders static and templates so the static is for example if we want to put some static files like html files or we want to build for example a ui for our rest api that we will be building so we can move or put all the files in here but i really don't recommend that because we need to think rest okay so we need to have a rest api and then if we need we can create a front end using any front end framework and then we have this application.properties files so by default it has the the file extension properties or we can also use yaml representation so the difference between properties and yaml files is just the representation and the way we write things and the application properties will hold all the properties that are needed by spring boot or even custom properties that we want to read from our application okay so now let's go back to this com.alibu.example and as you remember this is the base package or the concatenation of the group id and the artifact id so here we see that we have this example application which is a simple class with just a static void main and it contains a spring boot application annotation so this will be the main class for our application so if you want to start the application all you need to do is to run this file by right clicking and then run example application or just clicking on here or also clicking on this button right here so you have multiple ways to run the application from your id then we can move to the test fo test folder so this test folder this is where we have all the test files that we will create so all the unit tests all the integration tests all the end-to-end -end tests that we want to create for our rest api they go to this test folder so next let's have a look on the pom.xml file so the pom.xml file looks exactly like this i'm gonna make it full screen so if we start from the beginning so here's just providing or specifying the xml version and here like we we provide also the project and the xml namespace which is maven apache org and so and so forth so this is some information that you need and also the schema location and so and so forth and also this is the model version of our project and then we see here that we have 
a parent tag. So the parent tag contains also group ID, artifact ID, version, and a relative path. So this parent means that this Maven project extends from this parent, okay? So this means that this Spring Boot application extends already the Spring Boot starter parent having the version 3.0.7, which we already specified and selected in our Spring initializer. And then we have the group ID that we specified, which is com.alibu and the artifact, which is example. And then we have a default version, which is 0.0.1-snapshot. Snapshot means it's still under, uh, under progress or like in progress. And then we have the name, which is, we mentioned before, it takes by default the artifact ID. You can also change it. And then we have the description. All right, and then it comes uh, a tag called properties. And the, here we can provide a set of properties for our application. So here, for example, we have this java.version and we are specifying that we are using the Java version 17. After that comes the, the most important part, which is the dependencies. So we see that we have a tag dependencies and this is a list of dependency. So here we see that we have this dependency uh, tag. So also here we provide the group ID and the artifact ID. So for example, here it's org.springframework.boot and the artifact is the Spring Boot Starter Web, which is the dependency that we added when we created our project. And also by default, when you create a new Spring Boot project, you will have always provided dependency, which is the Spring Boot Starter Test and the scope of this dependency is test. So this dependency will be available only when we run the tests. Also, there is something which is really important in here when we use Spring Boot. So Spring Boot really makes it easy to manage versions. So here we don't need to provide any version because here, if we check, we, we have already a property called version and we can provide any version that we want. But when we use Spring Boot, we don't need to provide the version because it will automatically extend the parent version. So this in case of an upgrade or a downgrade of the Spring version, you don't need really to worry about the Spring Boot starter, starter's dependencies. All we need to do is to update this one, refresh the project, and then we will have our project totally and fully migrated to the newest, to the new version that we provided. All right, so this is the application. So now let's start our application and see and try to analyze a little bit what we have. So first, just click on this button right here or this play button right here and run example application or right click on this file and then run example application or select the file from here, right click and then run this application. So it's up to you to choose the way that suits you the best. So here, let's analyze a little bit what we have. So here we see that we have this banner right here and I will show you in a few seconds how we can also change that. Then we see that we have a bunch of logs. So here we have a list of info logs and as we can see here, starting application using Java 17 with process ID something. And here also we see that we have no active profile set. So then we, uh, later on, we will see how we can work with profiles. So here falling back to one default profile, which is called default. And even if you don't provi provide this profile name, it will be selected by default. Then we see Tomcat initialized with port 8080, starting service, and then we see that we have started example application in 0.5 seconds, and then the application or the Tomcat already started on the port 8080 with a context path which is empty, all right? So now this is not the most important part. First, I want to show you how we can change this banner right here and to make our service or our application looks really nicer. First, let's go to our browser. And here, this is a, a cool website that I really like, or even you can just Google text banner generator. I will leave you this, this link in the, in the description of this video. And then, for example, if you type something, let's say Alibu, and then we can choose the font. So here I will choose uh, this one. So I prefer this one, this ANSI regular, or you can use also ANSI regular with shadow. 
and you can use like you can play with it you can change the character width you can change the spacing and so and so forth okay so here for example if you change it to full fitted you will see that it will change and it will be different from one one the other <coughs> So once you generate a banner, just click on select and copy. So this will copy this text to the clipboard. Now let's go back to our application. And also I will stop the application right now and reduce this. And now in the resources, so Spring will automatically scan and look for a file called banner.txt. So I will create a new file right here and I will call it banner.txt txt and I will just paste the content here okay so now if I restart my application we will see this banner showing up instead of the old one so here maybe I will ch change a little bit so let's say spring boot 3.0.7 just something like that and here maybe let's say all right let's just adjust a little bit the spacings and now let's start our application so now instead of the old Spring Boot banner, we see that we have a new banner, which is Alibu. And we generally use the banners to give the, the service name. So when we start the application, we know which service or what is the service that we are starting right here. So as you can see, we have this Alibu and we have the Alibu and then the Spring Boot version, for example and so and so forth also we have the same logs as we had before and the application again is started on the port 8080 but which is the default one and we have also the application started the example application java file in few seconds so let's create our first bean class so here in the uh, the package com.alibu.example right click and then new and then java class and let's call it my first class for example or my first component or my first service just you can call it whatever you want so in this my first class i will just create a public string it's a method that will just say hello so this method will return hello from the first class or from my first class for example just to know where the message is coming from so now in order to use this first class and call this method called say hello, what we need to do, for example, let's go to our main method. And here, let's say first or my first class, let's call it my first class equals new my first class. So all we need to do is to create an instance. And then I will use system.out.println just to print out the message. So I will use my first class instance object, and then I will call the method say hello. So now if I run the application, we will see that here we have the message hello from my first class. But this is not really recommended when we use the Spring Framework because we are not using the power or the, the, the core feature of the Spring Framework, which is dependency injection. So to do that, let me show you how we can transform this my first class or this simple class to a Spring Bean. So now going back to our example application class file and here I will create a bean. So this is a bean annotation and then I will do public my first class and I will call it for example my first class. Okay. And then when I need a bean of type my first class, I need to return a new instance or new my first class instance. All right, so I will just keep this line right here. Now let's see how we can, if I remove this one, so if I remove the instance or the manual creation of the my first class and delegate that to Spring, so Spring will be able to inject and create a bean of type my first class. Okay, so now, first of all, let's see what this run method is able to return. So this run method method will return a, a class or an object of type configurable application context. So I will just assign this one to a variable and I will call it context. So CTX just as a short name. 
So when we run up our application, it will return a context, which is the context of our application. So here, my first class, now I want to get the my first class from the context or from the application context of my Spring container. So here, I will just go equals and then context dot get bean. So I have a method called get bean. So actually we have uh, three or four, uh, four or five methods of type uh, called get bean. And the first one, for example, it takes a class then we can pass a name and the required types. Also, we can pass the required types and object or just a string or just a string name and the object arguments. And the arguments, for example, if I say, or if, for example, I need a string for, or to instantiate my class and so on and so forth. So it's any parameter or any field required in order to create an instance of my object. But in this case, we can use whether the first one, which is just passing the class or we can use the second one, which is passing the name and the required type. So it will transform it automatically. Or we can use also the get bean with a parameter string name. But after that, we need to cast the object to the required class. So here, since I already know the return type or the type of my bean, I will use the first one. And then it will be just my first class dot class as a parameter. All right. So here, as you can see, I did not do anything or I did not create a manual instance for my first class object. I just created a bean or transformed this class to a bean. So it will be fully managed by the spring framework. So now all I need to do is just to restart the application and see if it still returns the same output or not. So as we can see here, we have always hello from my first class. So now this is the first way or like this is how we can create a bean. Now let me show you a different way how we can also tell Spring that this is a bean. So now if I remove this bean annotation or even if I comment out or totally remove this method right here and try to run the application, let's see what will happen. So first we have an exception. And the exception is saying no such bean definition exception. So this means there is no qualifying bean of type my first class available in the application context. So we are not able to get or to look up a bean of type my first class. So why? Because we just commented out this bean annotation. So when the application starts, Spring will not be able to find or to instantiate a bean of type my first class. So we said, or I mentioned before that I will show you a different way or a second way how to use or how to declare a bean in Spring. So now I will just stop the application for now. And then to mark a class as a Spring bean, all I need to do is to add an annotation. So this annotation, I can use the component annotation that we already spoke about before. So when I use the component, automatically Spring will consider this class. So when the application starts up and Spring starts scanning all the packages and all the classes, each time it will see this annotation, it will consider the class as a Spring Bean. So now all I need to do is to restart my application. So here, if I restart my application, we will see that we no longer have the exception and we see the hello from my first class. All right. So now let me also show you the other annotations that we can use. We can use the annotation service and the annotation repository, which are, which are a, a refinement of the component annotation, as we mentioned before. So whether using, for example, service, and if I restart again, so we see also that the message is showing up and the application starts with no issues. And also if I go to the definition of this service and then click on download source to download the source code of this class. So we see right here, the first thing, this is like the public interface service. And then this annotation or this interface class is already annotated with the add component. So in a, uh, in a 
different way, the service annotation already extends the component. So both of them are the same thing. So here, as also mentioned in the documentation, you can also see component and repository. So it's the same way if I use also a repository and I go to the documentation, I will see also that it's a component. All right. So whether using service or a component or a repository, these are a markdown annotations to mark an object or a class as a spring bean. So I will bring it back to service if I start again the application. So I will have my bean and I will also be able to display the message that I already return in here in this say hello method. As mentioned before, splitting the configuration is one of the best practices. So first let's start with a cleanup. So I will remove this service annotation and I will optimize the import to, to remove the unused one. So also if I use a shortcut, you can use a pop-up right here telling you what was the shortcut I used to do such action. So now I will go back to my example application right here and then I will open the project and I will create a new application config class. So I will co call it application config. And then I will just take this bean declaration and move it to the application config. So now I will bring back this bean annotation and of course import it. And then don't forget to add the configuration annotation to your class. So Spring will scan this class at the startup. So now the application configuration is ready to use. And again, if I start my application, I will see that everything is still working as expected. So we see here that we have the hello from the first class. So now I will also optimize the imports right here. So whether you move it manually or use the shortcut Control Alt O for uh, Linux and Windows or Option com uh, Control O for Mac users. Now let's understand the bin naming in Spring application context. So here, as we mentioned before, to get a bin, we can use the class or the object class, or we also can use another method which takes the, the bin name and the required type. So for example, here to get this my first class, and just to, to remind you that in the application config, we created a bin we gave it the name my first class. So if I copy this name and I go back here and pass this the bin name as parameter and I run the application so Spring will also understand that we are looking for this bin. So for example, if I change this one to wrong bin name and I restart the application, it will tell me that there is no such bin. Okay, so no such bin definition exception and it says that, that we don't have any bean named wrong bean name because by default Spring will use the method name or the, the method that we created here and we annotated as a bean as the bean name. Okay, so now let me bring this back or let's see a different way how we can name a bean. So here we have a bean and for example, let's call it my bean. And now Spring, when it scans and, and declares this class as a bean, it will automatically give this Spring bean or this string bean name as the bean name. So I will copy this one and now I will use it instead. Okay, so if I rerun the application, we see that the application is running and now we are using or we are showing the message coming from the say hello method of my first class bean. Okay. So now this is how the bean naming works in Spring Boot. Also, if I go back again and just remove this parameter right here, and for example, I change the name to my first, my first bean. So I can use here my first bean as a bean name, and I can just run the application and it will show the message that we already have in our say hello method. All right, so now let's move on and see more things and more features about how to manipulate and work with Spring Beans. 
Now let's extend a little bit my first class bean. So here first I will create a private variable. It will be a string and let's call it my var for example. Okay. And now I will add a constructor parameter. So I'm just using shortcuts again so you can see it in here. So here I will select the option add constructor parameter and then it will propose what will be the variable and say do refactor. And as you can see here, it will we have a constructor having a string my var and then this dot my var equals var. And just I will adjust the say hello. So it will be hello from the first class. And then let's, for example, display the my var. So it will be my var equals and then just my var. Okay, so now we see that we have already one problem. So what we need to do, we need to go back to the application config and pass this my var as a parameter. So here, let's say first bean. And now if I run the application, the application will be running correctly and it will display here the variable or, uh, or, the, or the value of the my var that we passed to this my first bean bean. Okay, so it says hello from the from my first bean class or my first class and my var equals first bean. Now let's move on and dig more and explore more how we can work with beans. To better understand dependency injection, let's start by preparing the ground up for, for it. So first I will create a new class and I will call it my first service. So my first service as a class and this one I will mark it as a service. And then for this, my service, I will just create a, a method. So I will do public string and then say message or tell story, for example. So this tell story, it will just use one of the existing services or the existing beans that we have, which is the my first class in here to just display the message or like to, to make a call to the say hello method. All right. So here I will just first need to inject a bean. So, so all I need to do is to create a private, my first class, and I will call it my first class. So I will make this one full screen and then I will just return. So the bean is saying, or like, let's say the dependency, is saying and then I will just concatenate the my first class dot say hello method. Okay, so when I run this class and I run this tell a story, I expect to have an output in my console telling that the dependency is saying and then we have the hello method or the say hello method that we have right here. So now let's move on and understand in deep the dependency injection and the different types of dependency injection. Now, if we go back to our example application class and here, let's do some changes. Instead of my first class, I will just try to inject my first service and I will just rename this one to my first service as a variable name. And then I will tell spring to get bean. I can also remove the name and instead of my first class, I will just change it to my first service. And here I will just call the tell story. Okay. I will just rename this one. So it's service. And now if I run the application, let's see what will happen. So here we have a null pointer exception in the my first class dot say hello. Okay. So if I click to check the trace, so the my first class is null. Okay. So now I will rerun again in debug mode. So I will just add a breakpoint right here and I will make that later on a special video how we can debug in details. So now just click on this debug example application. And then when the example application here, so first we start by running the application and then we look up or we try to load the my first service bean, which is already a service right here. So that's why we are able to load the bean. And then we try to call the my first service dot tell story. And this is when the breakpoint hits. Okay. So we are trying to concatenate this string with the string coming from the say hello method. 
So as we can see here in IntelliJ, we have already a null pointer exception because the my first class is null. Why it is null? Because it's not yet injected by Spring because we did not tell Spring how to inject this class. Okay, so that's why we have our null pointer exception. So let's resume the program. And now if I go back to the console, we see again, we have this null pointer exception. So now let's see how we can inject a dependency using the constructor. So all I need to do here, I will use the auto completion and uh, or the code generation, and I will ask IntelliJ to create a constructor using this my first class. So here I just asked it and now it also IntelliJ is recommending to make my first class final. So we also add this final keyword. So now all I need to do is to add the keyword auto wired and this annotation needs to be on the constructor level. So like that, when I start the application spring, we'll know that we need to fetch a bean of type my first class the one that we declared right here, and it will be assigned to this my first class. So since here in our application config, we have a bean of type my first class, Spring will know that this is a bean, and then the my first service needs this bean to be injected, so it will automatically inject it. So now let's just restart the application. And now I will just restart it, not with debug mode. And here, we have the magic. So here the dependency is saying hello from my first class and the my var equals first bean as we specify it in our application configuration right here. So now I guess you are able to link things. So this is how constructor injection works. Now let me show you a little bit of enhancement that was introduced by the spring framework. So now if I go back to my first service, I can also remove this breakpoint. Here with Spring Boot, if we have or if we want to use constructor injection, we no longer need the auto wired keyword. I will also optimize the imports. So we no longer need the auto wired keyword or annotation because Spring, it will try to inject or anything that is injectable. So when the application starts and Spring start creating this my first service bean or uh, or service, it will first see that in the constructor we need an object of type my first class. Okay, so it will look up in its context if it finds a bean of type my first class. If yes, it will inject it. So now after removing the annotation, I will rerun the, again the application and make sure that everything is working fine. So here, as you can see, we no longer need the auto wired annotation. So this is how constructor injection works. Now I will go to my application config and create a second bean of type my first class. So I will duplicate this one and I will call it my second bean. So this my second bean, I will pass a parameter. I will call it second bean. Okay, so now I have two beans of type my first class. Now, if I rerun the application and try to fetch or to display the message in here, I expect things not to work. And even IntelliJ is able to highlight this. So if I highlight this one, it says could not auto wire. There is more than one bean of my first class type. And this is what will happen or what will be displayed in our console. So I will run the application. And here we see that we have application failed to start. And it says parameter zero of constructor my first service required a single bean but two were found. Okay. And here it give uh, it gives us more details. So we have first my first bean defined in my by method. So defined by method my first bean in class application config and we have the same for my second bean. So also it gives us some actions. So consider marking one of the beans as primary or use qualifier. So this is this introduces us to the qualifier topic. So now what I will do, I can just come here and add a qualifier annotation. And for example, I will say bean one, I will copy this 
and here I will say bin two. So I have the first bin called bin one and the second bin has a qualifier called bin two. So this qualifier doesn't mean that the bin will be called bin one and bin two. No, the bin will stay my first bin and my second bin of type my first class, but as an extra information, we will give it a qualifier called bin one and bin two. Now, if I go back to my first service, I can just come here and add a qualifier information to this bin. So for this bin here, I will just tell it to use the qualifier, for example, bin one or bin two. Okay, so let's use bin two because before we used the bin one and here, let's just make sure that we have second bin as a variable. All right, so now Spring will be able to locate or to load or to inject the correct bin using its qualifier. Okay, so now if I run the application again, so we see that we have the message and now the variable, my var has a value second bin, which is this bin right here. Okay, so this is how we can use qualifier to inject a specific bin if we have multiple beans of the same type. So as this example right here, we have two beans of type my first class. So now we just give it a qualifier for the first bean and a qualifier for the second one. And then Spring will be able to locate and decide which one to inject. Also, when working with beans, we can tell Spring which one to inject first. So instead of using qualifier, so I'm gonna remove this qualifier from here and then I will go back to my application config and I will also remove these two qualifier annotations. So for example, let's say that I have a third bin right here. So I'll just duplicate the code and I will say this is my third bin. And then I want Spring, for example, to inject this third bin. So I will just change also the text here. So all I need to do is to use the primary annotation. So this primary annotation will give a higher priority to this bean called my third bean. Now, if I go back to my first service, we see that the highlight from, uh, from IntelliJ is already gone because Spring will know that there is a higher bean of these three beans, which are of the same type. So when this service, my first service needs a bean of type, my first class, it will look up all the beans and it will choose this primary bean as a higher priority bean and it will inject that one. So now when I start the application, I'm expecting to have this third bean printed as an output. So as we can see here, we have this dependency is saying and the var now is saying third bin. So this comes from this primary annotation. So like this, we can define a priority or higher priority to our beans. Now let's see dependency injection using field injection. So I will keep my conf configuration as it is. I will keep my third bean as a primary and I will go back to my service. Now I'm gonna remove the constructor. So I don't need the constructor because I will use field injection. So to inject uh, a dependency using the field, all I need to do is to add the auto wired keyword or the auto wired annotation to the, the property or to the bean that I want to inject. Also already you can see right here that it's already also highlighted and field injection is not recommended as I explained before it's always recommended to use constructor injection or setter injection over field injection. So also the, the spring advocates, they always recommend using constructor injection. So now if I start the application, I will get the same output telling third bin. So as we can see right here, so now it's telling third bin. Also, we can mix this uh, in the field injection, we can mix with, with uh, the qualifier. So here, I will just uh, comment out the primary. And now I will show you how to use qualifier even without having the qualifier um, name or the qualifier annotation on the bean declaration. So here we see that we have three beans. And now I will use the qualifier keyword or the qualifier annotation. 
and all I need to do is to provide the bean name. So the qualifier will use or will try to look up the bean by its name or by its qualifier name if we provide it. So for example, if I want to use my second bean, I will just copy the method name because as I mentioned before, when we don't, we don't provide a bean name, it will take the method as a bean name. So now I will go back to my first service and give it my second bean as a qualifier. So if I restart the application, I'm expecting to see this second bean. So this is what we see already in here. So the field injection also works with qualifiers and also qualifiers, we don't need to provide them on the bean level. All we need to do is to use whether the method name or the bean name if we provide it. So for example, if I give a name to this bean, so let's call it for example, bean one, and then for, I will copy this name and I use it as a qualifier and I restart the application. So here we see that we have first bean instead of bean two because the qualifier will be also using the bean name. The next type of dependency injection is method injection. So I will go back to my service right here and I will remove these two. I will just do command X to keep them in my uh, clipboard and I will create a public void method and I will call it init or inject beans, for example, inject beans or inject dependencies. So this inject dependencies, it will take as parameter my first class. So here my first class and I will call it my first class. And then all I need to do is this dot my first class equals my first class. So now all I need to do is to add the auto wired annotation. And here, of course, because we have three uh, beans of type my first class, so I need the qualifier keyword right here. So I will just remove this one. And for example, let's say I want to use the qualifier bean one. And now when I start the application, this method will inject the needed or the required dependencies. So let's start, let's try it out. So here, as you can see, we have the, the message and here we have first bean. And for example, if I switch to the second one and I use this qualifier with the my second bean bean and restart the application, we will see that it will print out second bean and it will be the same if also I change the other one. So here what happens is Spring, when each time it sees that we have this auto wired annotation, it will try to use that one, whether it's a, a simple method, a setter or a constructor in order to inject uh, the, the necessary beans that are required for this class. The final type of dependency injection is called the setter injection. So all we need to do is to create a set method for, uh, for our dependency that we want to inject. If we have multiple, we need to create a setter for each. So here, for example, if I say set my first class and also I need to provide the auto wired method. And of course, here we need the qualifier because we have three beans of type my first class. And like this, it will be using the setter method to use or to inject this my first class bean. So now if I restart the application, I will see that I have the correct output that I'm expecting. Also, if I switch to bean one, for example, it will print out first bean instead of second bean. So this is what we see if we restart the application. And here we have first bean. So this is the final one. And this is called setter injection. Also, as I, as I mentioned before, always use constructor injection because this is the best way and the recommended way by the Spring advocates to inject beans or dependencies into a class. As explained before, Spring also provides some special beans. So for example, we have the environment bean, which is a bean that help us to read some environment properties, some environment uh, system, and also access the application properties and read the properties from there, even reading the command line arguments. So let me show you how we can read the environment or the system properties using this environment bean. So first I will create a private environment 
and I will call it environment. For that, I need, of course, to create a setter and a setter and add the auto wired keyword. So here I will add auto wired. So this to inject the environment bean into my first, first service class. And then I will just create a method. I will just duplicate this one and I will call it, for example, get Java version. So I want to return the Java version used for this project. Okay, so I would remove this one. And then all I need to do is environment dot get property. And then I know that in the system properties, I have a property called Java dot version. And now all I need to do is to go to my example application when I, where, where I have the main method, and I will duplicate this one. And here I will just get Java version. So now if I run the application, we will see that the application will print the Java version. Okay, so here we see that the Java version that I'm using is 17.0.6. For example, if I create another method, let's call it get OS or get OS name. So I want to return the operating system name. So it will be OS dot name. So this is the property to return the operating system name. And then I will also just display it right here. So I will use or call the method get OS name. And then I will restart the application and I'm expecting to see the operating system name, which is for my case, the Mac OS X. The environment bean is also capable of reading any property defined in our application properties file. So for example, here, if I go to application properties and I will create a random property or a custom property, so it will be my custom dot property and I will give it a value. Hello, Alibu students, for example. Okay. So now this environment bean will allow me or can help me read the property from the YAML file. Okay. So here, all I need to do, I will create um, a new method. So I will call it read property or read prop just to say uh, property. And here I will just copy this property name and I will paste it here instead. Okay. So now I will go back to my example application.java and I will duplicate this one and I will just call the read prop method that I just created. So here, if I start the application, let's see if spring is able to read it or not. So it's the case. So here we have hello Alibu students. So this means that this environment bean will try to read the, all the properties, whether from the system, or even if we provide an application or a property declared in our application properties. So it will understand and scan also these application properties. And like that, we can read this custom property. Before we move on, let's clean up a little bit what we created. So here I will remove the environment since we already uh, saw how it works. So I will remove all this code and then I will just move this to the bottom or I will create or inject it in a constructor. So I will add the final keyword here and then I will say add constructor parameter. And here I will also provide the qualifier uh, name. So for my bean, so it will be qualifier. And then for example, let's say bean one. So this is one of the beans that we have. So this is my constructor and I have now tell the story. So I will go back here. I will, I will just remove all this. So now I will go back. Also, I guess we need to optimize imports, but yeah, I guess we, I already did it. So now we have our code cleaned up and now we can move on and see what comes next. Now let's assume that we have an other application.properties file where we are storing some custom properties. For example, I will create a new file right here and I will call it custom.properties. So in this properties file, I will create, for example, my prop, okay, equals Alibu, let's say, okay, just, just an example. Now I want to inject this my prop into my first service. So normally now you get it. If we want to do that, all I need to do is here. So here I will here I will say my custom property from another file. 
and then I will use the value annotation and for the value an annotation I just need to use this my.prop as a property name okay so here I will just paste this one and now let's create a getter method for this one and now let's go to our example application and try to read this one okay so from another file if I start the application so here we see that we have an exception saying that could not resolve placeholder my.prop okay so we are not able to resolve the property or the placeholder called my.prop because it's not in our application.properties file because spring is able to scan only the only a file called application dot properties or dot yaml so now how to provide or how to tell spring that i want to read properties from a different file okay so all i need to do i go i need to go to the class level right here and here i need to use an annotation called property source so here we see that we have property source and property sources so i will use the first one and here i need to provide the class path so I'm going to make it full screen again. So it's class path and then custom because we called, we call the file custom dot properties. Okay. So now if I run the application, let's see what will happen. So we see right here that we have this message from the previous implementation. And then we have hello Alibu students because the hello Alibu students is coming from the application properties. And also we have this int, which is one, two, three. And now spring is able to read the custom property from this custom dot properties file, because here in this class, we told spring also to load the properties coming from this file right here. So if we provide a wrong file name, of course, we will get an exception. So now let's duplicate this one. So let's say custom file two, for example. And here, let's say my prop dot two. And here, let's say hello Alibu. Okay, so now I can inject multiple files. So here, instead of using property source, I need to use another annotation. So it's just property sources. And this property source, it takes a table of type property sources. So here I will provide the, the table. So it will be a property source, this one, and then the same again, but here I will call it custom dash file dash two. Okay. So here I will duplicate this one. I will call it, uh, read property from another file too, just an example. And here I will just move the value and make prop dot two, because this is the value or the property that we want to read. And then all I need to do now just to test this one, I will create a getter for this method. So now if I go back to my main class and duplicate this one and use the two, now, if I restart the application, let's see what will happen. So here we have Alibu coming from the custom dot properties and we have hello Alibu coming from the custom file too. So in this way, we can inject multiple property sources and we can tell spring to use that one to load the properties that we need. What we will see now is how we can inject a property from our application properties into our Java class. So for example, let's say here I have a private string custom property and I will just create a getter for this custom property. Okay. So here create a getter for custom property and I will use this get custom property just to display this custom property in my main class. So here I will just use get custom property if I run the application right now, so by this custom property, I want to read this one. Okay. So what we see right here, we have a null value because we did not tell spring how to read or that we want to read this custom property. So I will close this one. Now I will go back to here 
and then what we can do to in order to inject a value from our application dot properties file into a variable whether it can be a string or an integer or something like that so we can use the value annotation okay and the value annotation it takes as a parameter a string which is the value so the value should be in this in this way dollar and then curly brackets and inside the curly brackets so i can use my custom property so like this when the application starts up and spring starts initializing the beans and the, and the components anytime it sees that we have a value annotation it will try to read this property from the application.property or the application.yaml file so now if i restart the application i'm expecting to see uh, the message coming from here so it's hello alibu students for example let's go and let me show you that we can inject also other values so here i will just duplicate my custom properties my custom property and then i will say it's an int and here for example let's say one two three okay so now if i go back here and i will just duplicate this one and i make it as an int and here i will say it's an integer okay so i'm gonna make this full screen and then i will also use the same uh, value annotation and here instead of property i will say dot int because this is what we created in here and now i will create a get method for this one so create getter for custom property int and here i have the get customer property int so here again i would just duplicate this one and call this int so this is just to show you that spring is able to convert types so if i restart the application we see that we have alibu students and one two three and for example if i do one two three and with a string and restart the application let's see what spring will do so here we see that we have a number format exception so here spring was not able to cast this string to an end okay so you need to be really careful with that so if you uh, it depends on the property that you want to inject you need to have the correct or the exact exact type spring profiles provide a way to segregate parts of your application configuration and make it available only in certain environments they can be used to apply certain bean definitions conditionally for example different beans might be registered in development environment versus a production environment so each profile corresponds to a set of configuration that define how the application should run in a specific environment so an environment might be a development test staging production or another similar concept the beans that are part of a profile can be registered in the spring application context only when the profile is active this capability can be particularly beneficial in several scenarios for example in environment specific configuration you might have certain beans that should only be active in development environment and different ones that should be active in a production environment for example in a development environment you might want to use a bean that clears and recreates your database with this data every time you start your application in a production environment you would certainly not want this bean to be active also uh, profiles can be used for component switching you can use profiles to switch out entire entire component or services for example you may have a quick in-memory database for development while in production you would use a full-blown database server also profiles can be used for toggling features Profiles can be used to enable or disable features if you're developing a new feature that's not quite ready to be deployed in production you can put this in its own profile until it's ready and in the next part we will see how we can work in action with profiles let's see now how we can work with profiles on the level of the application properties so for example here we have our application.properties containing two property my custom property and my custom property int so now in order to create 
a profile specific application property all we need to do is to create another file called application dash profile name dot properties so what i will be doing i will copy this one and then paste it so here let's say for example I will call it dev so this application dash dev properties will be available or will hold all the information for the profile dev so here in this application dash dev dot properties i will change a little bit the um, the value so here hello alibu students in dev environment okay so here let's keep this one or like let's make it three to one so in order to see the changes now let me show you how to run or how to set a specific environment while running the application from your IDE. So here click on this uh, arrow just to have the list here and then click on edit configuration and then you see this is the configuration of your main class and then we see here that we have active profiles. So here we can we can set multiple profiles to be active at the same time. Okay, so now I want to set my profile or my active profile to dev and then click OK. So here spring when the application starts, it will see that we have an application properties. So first of all, it will be loading all the information in the application properties and then it will set the active profiles to the dev. Okay. And then what Spring will be doing, it will be overriding all the properties which are similar in the application properties or and the application dev dot properties. So here, let me explain it. So at the application startup, Spring will load all these properties in its context. And then it will see that it has an, uh, an active profile and it will check that this property already exists in here so it will override the value using this one okay so now let's go back to our main application and we know that we have already something to display this property so all i need to do is to simply run the application and here we see that we have hello alibu students in dev environment and also we have the value three to one so again, if I stop the application and remove the active profile from this configuration right here, click OK. And then if I run again the application, it will be displaying Hello Alibu students, as you can see right here. Also, we can change the profiles using the application properties itself. So here in the main application dot properties. So also I want to highlight something. It is always recommended to have an application dot properties that holds all the common properties of your application. And then you can change and override all the properties depending on the environment. So here in the application dot properties, we can also tell spring which profile we want to be active. So here, all we need to do, let's put it in the first line. So here we have a property called spring.profiles.active and here this spring.profiles.active accepts a list of profiles with comma separation. But in our case, we want to set the dev environment as our active environment. And that's all. Now, if I run the application, we will see that spring will, or the, our application will be displaying this message instead of this one. So let's try it out. So if I click on start the application and then we see that we are displaying this. Also, let me show you how it's how it will be displayed in the logs. So here we see that Spring is detecting that we have one profile active. So it says the following one profile is active, which is dev. For example, if I said if I set another profile or let's say test, for example, and custom. All right. And if I restart the application, even if we don't have these environments or these application properties specific for the environments, it doesn't matter. So Spring will not block the application. Spring will not throw any exception if it doesn't find any properties for that environment because the environment is the developer responsibility. So when you set an environment here or if you set an active environment, make sure that you have the properties or like the necessary properties and configuration for that environment. So here in the logs, we see that 
the following three profiles are active dev test and custom so here let me show you also something which is really important now i will just duplicate these dev properties and i will make it test so since we already set an active profile test so here i will just say for the test in test environment so i just want to show you if the order matters or not so now all i need to do is to restart my application and here we want to focus on the output of this one okay so let's restart the application so here we see that test environment okay we are displaying the properties from the test environment and here, here here how it works so let me show you in a different way so i will set test first and then dev and then i will remove test from here and i will restart my application and let's see what will happen so here we see it's displaying in dev environment so here spring first of all it will start loading the properties from the application dot properties and then it will check the first profile and then it will override all the properties that can be overridden and then it will check the next one and again it will override the properties and so and so forth so you need to really be careful about the order for the profiles and also this information can be useful for you in case for example you set some active profiles and you see that a property is not correctly overridden or is not correctly set so you may want to check the order of your properties the active profile can also be set programmatically so let's do this i will comment out this property so it will not override our configuration and i will close all this and then i will go back to my example application in our main method and here i will externalize a little bit so here i will create a variable app equals new application new spring application and for this spring application i will just pass the example application dot class which is our main class and then all i need to do here is switching app dot run and we need to remove this so here after set or after getting the application or the spring application what we can do we can say app dot set default properties and for this property we need to pass a map of type string and object so we can use collections dot singleton map and here we can pass the key and the value so the key is the property spring dot profiles dot active and the value is for example let's say dev now if i run the application we will see that it will display alibu students in dev environment and again if i switch it to test since we have also our application test dot properties and then if i rerun again i will see student in the in test environment so this is how we can programmatically set the active profile in our spring application next we will see how we can also have beans which are available only for a specific profile now let's see how we can make a bean available only for a specific environment so let's go back to our application config i'm going to make this one full screen and now in order for example to make this bean one available only for dev environment and this bean available for test environment all i need to do is to add an annotation called profile and in here all i need to do is to provide the profile name so let's say this one is uh, sorry it's profile not primary and let's say this bean my first bean should be available only for dev environment and again i'm going to duplicate this one and make the second bean available for the test environment okay so now if i go back to my first service and here i'm using my second bean so if i use for example this bean one in here so now i want to inject bean one in the my first service and then if i go back to the example application and try to run the application and here remember that we have our active profile which is dev and again just to remind you before we start we are injecting the bean having the id bean one so it is this one which is available for the dev environment so now if i run the application 
we see that we have hello alibu students in dev environment now if i switch to test environment i'm expecting the application not to work because this bin will not be registered for the test environment so spring will only register the bin for the profile environment so now let's restart the application and let's see so here as i mentioned before we have and we have an issue so here it says that the injection point has the following annotation we want to inject a bean qualifier but these following candidates were found so we have my second bean and my third bean because in the application config we have my second bean available for the test environment and also my third bean available for all the environments but the bean one is no longer and is not registered for the test environment or uh, sorry for the test profile which is the active one so we can say environment or profile it's also correct so in this way we understand that spring or if we set a bean or even a configuration available for specific profile it will not be registered for the other profiles so also let's try it out with a configuration in here so also we can set the profile annotation on the class level and here let's say this all this configuration should be available only for dev so i can remove all the uh, all the profile annotations from here and this means that i want to inject this profile or this application configuration only for the dev profile so here if i go back to example application i'm expecting again to have or to get the same issue but now we should not also see this one okay so let's try it out and see what will happen so here we see that again we have the same issue or like the same explanation that the injection point this means that spring is looking for a bean with a qualifier bean one but here it says that we did not find any other bean of the same type okay so it's already mentioning consider defining a bean of type com.alibu my first class in your configuration so here if i go back again and change the active profile to dev in here and rerun the application so the application will be up and running correctly so here you need to be careful how you how to define your profiles so now you understand that when you define a profile or you set the annotation profile on the class level this means that the whole class will not be registered if you set it on a method level this means that the specific method will not be registered when the application starts up REST stands for representational state transfer. It's a software architecture style that defines a set of constraints to be used for creating web services. These web services are often called RESTful APIs or RESTful application programming interfaces if they adhere these constraints. REST was first defined by Roy Fielden in his 2000 doctoral dissertation. The main idea behind REST is to treat networked resources as objects that can be accessed using standard HTTP methods such as GET, POST, PUT, DELETE, etc. And here are some of the fundamental elements of the REST architecture. First, client-server architecture. This principle establishes that the client and the server should act independently. They can interact with each other, but each side can be developed and updated independently. Stateless. Each HTTP request that happens from a client to a server should contain all the necessary information to understand and respond to the request. In other words, the server should not store any data between requests, which keeps each request isolated and independent then cacheable restful architecture allows client to cache responses responses must implicitly or explicitly define themselves as cacheable or not prevent clients from reusing outdated or inappropriate data in response to further requests then layered system the architecture allows for layers within the system architecture a client cannot ordinarily tell whether it is connected directly to, to an end server or to an intermediary along the way. 
which can include load balancing, security measures, and so and so forth. Then code on demand. This, this is the only optional constraint. It allows the server to extend functionality of a client by transferring executable code. And finally, uniform interface. This is a fundamental to the design of any RESTful system. It simplifies and decouples the architecture, which enables each part to evolve independently. The four guiding principles of the uniform interface are, first, identification of resources, then manipulation of resources through these representations, and then self-descriptive messages, and finally, the hypermedia as the engine of application state, or also known as HATIOS. So RESTful API have become a very popular in modern web application development due to their simplicity, scalability, stateless, statelessness, and compatibility with the web. They are often used to create interactive applications, mobile applications, and web services. However, they are not suitable for all types of applications and other architectures or protocols such as GraphQL or gRPC might be used to, to depending on the specific needs of the application. To resume, the REST is the web architecture principles, unique identification of resources or also known as URI, different resources representation, hypermedia link or link of resources, stateless communication, and finally standard methods such as get, post, put, delete, and responses such as 200, 404, and so and so forth. When designing a RESTful API, there are some standards that we need to follow. First, the resource should be always plural nouns in the API endpoint, and if one instance resource should be retrieved, pass the ID in the URL. For example, we can have get slash accounts, or if we want one single account, it should be a get method slash accounts slash the ID. Or for example, for deleting one single element, it's delete slash accounts slash two, which is or which represents the ID of the resource that we want to delete. In case of nested resources, which means resource under a resource, the resources should be accessible as follows. For example, if we want to get the payment from the accounts, it will be accounts slash one, which is the account ID slash payment, and then the payment ID. So use the HTTP methods to specify what to do with this resource. With the method get post put uh, patch delete, you can provide crude functionalities. The crude stands for create, read, update, and delete. Use HTTP methods, also as known as verbs, to specify what to do with this resource. With the method get, post, put, delete, you can provide crude functionalities. And here, this is an explanation how we can design our resources. For example, here if we want to get the, if we have slash accounts, and this means when we have a get method with slash accounts, this means that we want to get all the accounts. Post, this means we want to create a new account. Put, it's bulk update all accounts. This means we want to update all the accounts. And delete, this means we want to delete all the accounts. Now, let's see when we have a single resource. So when we have account slash the account ID, then it's get account with ID one. So for the post, this should be an error because we should not allow that we post a resource with an, with an ID. Then. For the put, this means that we want to update an account with ID 1, and for the delete, it's deleting an account with ID 1. Then, for, for the resource, for example, for the nested resources, the slash accounts, slash 1, slash payments, this means when we have a get verb, this means get all the payments for the account ID 1. Post, this means that we want to create a new payment for the account ID 1. And then for the put, this is a bulk update, all payments for account ID one, and the same for the delete, this means that we want to delete all the payments with the account ID one. When designing RESTful APIs, we need to use HTTP methods, or also known as verbs. So here we have the following verbs that we can use to design our RESTful API. 
First, we have the get method or the get verb. This method is used to retrieve data from a server. It is a read-only operation, meaning it does not affect the state of the resource. And then we have the post. Post this method is used to send data to the server to create a new resource. The data is included in the body of the request. Then we have the put. So this method is used to update an existing resource or create it if it does not exist. The update or new data is included in the body of the request. Then we have delete. So this method is used to delete a resource specified by a URL. Then we have patch. Patch, this method is used to apply partial modification to a resource as opposed to the put method, which is useful for full updates like post and put. This data for the update is included in the body of the request. Then we have options. So this method is used to return the HTTP methods that the server supports for the specified URL. It can be used to check the functionality of a web server. Then, and finally, we have head. So this method is similar to get, but only returns the header of the response, not the actual data. For example, the body. So this is useful when you want to check if a resource exists before trying to download it or check if it has been modified. When implementing RESTful APIs, we cannot skip talking about status codes. So the response status code our HTTP status codes are three-digit codes returned by the server as part of the HTTP response, indicating the outcome of the request made by the client. The first digit of the status code defines the class of response, while the last two digits do not have any categorization role. There are five classes, ranging from 1xx, which is informational responses, to 5xx, which is server error response. So the first one is informational. The second one, which is 2xx, means success. The 3xx means redirection. And the 4xx means client error. And then finally, as mentioned before, we have the 5xx, which means that we have a server error. Now let's move on and check each one of them. The first category is the success category, which is represented by the code 2xx. So this 2xx has some, some codes. First of all, we have, for example, the 200, with, which means OK. So this is the standard response for the successful HTTP requests. When you make a GET request, for example, and the server successfully processes the request and provides the requested resources in the response, it will return a 200 status code. This status code simply means that everything went as planned and the result data, if any exists, is included in the response. Then we have 21 created. So this 21 status code in indicates that the request was successful and a new resource was created as a result. This is typically the response sent after a post request or something or sometimes put if you're creating a resource with that method, where a new resource is created and the server based on the data sent to the request. Then we have also a 204, which means no content. The 204 status code means the server successfully processed the request and there is no additional content to send in the response payload body. This is often the response to the delete request put or post request when there is no particular information to send back in the HTTP response body. But header is useful. In other words, it's a way to, for the server to say, I did what you asked where, and we're done. So you don't need to go anywhere else. This response may also be used when the server doesn't want to return any information, like as a result of a delete request, confirming the deletion is successful. The redirection category also represented by the 3xx response code. So the HTTP status code for this category, will, we will mainly focus on one which is the most important and the most used in, in RESTful APIs, which is the 304 not modified. So the HTTP status code 304 not modified is a special type of response that is used for caching purposes. 
When a client sends a request to the server, it can include a header such as if modified since or if non match. These headers are used to ask the server to validate if the client's cached version of the, of the resource is still up to date. If modified since uh, use a timestamp to determine if the resource has been updated since the last time the client requested. Also, we have the if non match. It also works with e tags or entity tags, which is a token associated with a specific version of the resource. So if the resource has not been modified since the given date time, in the case of, for example, if modified since or the entity tag still matches, so in this case, if non match, so the server will respond with a 304 not modified status and not send the body for the response because the client cache is still valid. By utilizing a 304 response, you can save bandwidth and make your web application faster by not unnecessary resending resources that the client has already cached. So this leverages one of the main principles of HTTP, which is the idea of being stateless, but still allowing for optimizing through caching. Client error category, or represented also with 4XX. So here we will check the most used responses. And first we will start with the 400 bad request. This status code means the server was unable to understand the request due to invalid syntax. This could be malformed request or a request with invalid arguments, the client should modify the request before repeating it. Then we have a 401 unauthorized. So this status code means the request requires user, user authentication. If the user already included authentication credentials, then the, four, the, four, the 401 response indicates that the authorization has been refused for these credentials. This could be due to a wrong username password or the user does not have the necessary privilege. This status is similar to, to the 403 forbidden, but specifically for cases where authentication is expected but has failed or not yet been provided. Then we have the 403 forbidden. So this status code means the client does not have the necessary permission for the requested resource. In Contrast to the 401 unauthorized response, authenticating will make no difference. This status code can also be used when the server does not want to reveal exactly why the request has been refused or when no other responses is applicable. So for all these status code are part of the 4xx class of HTTP status code, which indicates that the server was likely an error in the request sent by the client that prevented the server from processing it. As a best practice, the client should after its request or authenticate, and authenticate appropriately based on these responses. Now let's see an example how a REST API looks like when we implement it use, using Spring Boot. So here, for example, we have a payment REST controller, and this is the class where we will exp expose the resources for a payment object, for example. And in order to make this class a controller or exposed as a REST resource, we need to add the annotation REST controller. And then, as you can see here, we have a method. So this method will, re will return a response entity of type payment information. So the payment information will be the response body of this method called initiate payments. And here, as you can see, we have a post mapping, which is the verb or the HTTP method that will be used to, uh, inv to invoke this endpoint. And then it has a value slash payment as explained before the way that we need to name our endpoints. Then we see that we have a body coming within this request and it's annotated with the annotation request body. And then we have our business code and then we want to return like the result location, which is for example, slash payment slash ID, which is the ID that was returned after persisting or saving the payment into our database. And then we return a response entity dot created. So the dot created this, this method right here will return an a status code 
for the created representation, which is the 201. And then the body, we, because we can also return a body within the, within the response of this method, which is the confirmation that we created before. Also, in addition to that, we can specify the response code to this method. And this is how it looks like. So here we have a response status annotation that we can use. So to specify the response status of a controller method, annotate the method with the response status, and then we can give it the status code that we want to return. So Spring only uses the response status when the marked method completes successfully without throwing any exception. In the coming parts, we will see in action all what we discussed before. Server error category. So for this class, we will see the 500 internal server error. So this is a generic error message given when an unexpected condition was encountered by the server and no more specific message is suitable. In other words, it means that something has gone wrong on the server itself. It doesn't provide a clear reason because the error could be for a variety of reasons such as server misconfiguration or uncaught exception on the server side code or a server resource issue like memory depletion. Then we have the 503, which is service unavailable. This status code indicates that the server is currently unavailable to hand the request because it's temporarily overloading or down for, man for maintenance. Generally, this is a temporary state. It may include an optional retry after header indicating how long to wait before making a new request. So both of these status codes are part of the 5xx class of HTTP status codes, which indicates situations where the server is aware that it has encountered an error or is otherwise incapable of performing the request. These types of error are often outside of the client's control and may require attention from the server's operators. That's good, you made it this far. So now before we move, we move on to the Spring REST, let's first clean up our code. So what I will be doing is I will remove all the unnecessary classes and I will just leave this example application which is our main application and afterwards we will start implementing our first REST API. So what I will be doing, I will remove these classes. So just select them and then click on delete and then just click OK. So you click delete anyway, just also OK. And then we will clean up the code that we have right here. So I will just copy this one and make this spring run. And then let's remove this and also let's remove all this code. And then we need and then we need to pass the example dot class as a parameter. So now we have our application back as it was. And now I will optimize the imports. And also I will remove these properties because we no longer need them. We will see them afterwards if we want to work with profiles. So now we have our application back as it was. Now just to make sure that everything is working fine, just try to run the application and all we need to check is that the application is up and running. As we can see here, so the application started on the port 8080 and started example application in some time, like it depends on your machine. So now we are up and ready to continue with our REST API. Now let's create our first controller. So here I will just right click here and then new and then Java class. So here I will call it first controller and then this is the class that will represent our first controller. So here in order to make the first controller as a controller that will be scanned by the Spring Boot, all we need to do is to add the REST controller annotation. And in order to have this REST controller annotation, just make sure that you have the Spring Boot starter web dependency in your pom.xml or Gradle dot properties. So now let me first make this one full screen. In order to create an endpoint, 
First, we need to define what is the verb or the HTTP method for this part, for this endpoint. So let's assume that we want to perform a get method. So here we have an annotation called get mapping. If we use this get mapping annotation, so this means that inside this REST controller, we have a get mapping or a get method. So here, let's say, for example, a public string. This method will return string and let's say, or let's call it say hello. And then all I need to do is to return hello from my first controller, for example. And then, of course, don't forget th to give the, your endpoint a path. Okay, so here we can even work without a path. So let's, let's try it like that. And then let's see how we can enhance this. So I will run my application. So here we also see that the application is up and running. Now I will go to the browser. And as you saw in the logs, the application started on the port 8080. So to access any get endpoints using the browser, all we need to do is to access the local host and then the port number, which is 8080 in our case, and then just hit enter. So here we have a 404 because we don't have any endpoint defined on this URL. So if I add the slash right here, it's also the same. So that's why we need to define a mapping for our endpoint. So let's go back to our IntelliJ and here in this get mapping. So I will add slash hello, for example. Okay. So this is not respecting the, the naming conventions, of course, but we will see that in details later on. So now I will restart my application. Again, the application is up and running on the port 8080 with a context path empty. I will explain to you what is this context path later on. So now let's go back to the browser. And all we need to do is to refresh. And here, of course, we need the slash hello. So when I hit or when I try to reach the slash hello endpoint, Spring will go and will know that we have an endpoint called slash hello available after or under the default context path that we have. And this is the message that we provided with within our endpoint. So let's go back to IntelliJ again. So here, if for example, I duplicate this one and I create another endpoint. So let's say hello dash two. And here, let's say for example, hello two. And here say hello two from my first controller. And then if I add a response status, we will see the difference. But before adding the response status, let's go to the browser again and inspect a little bit more and see what happens. So here, if you click on F12 or right click and then inspect, so you will have you will have uh, this interface and then you can go to network. Now, if I refresh, we see, and then you need to click on all. We see that we have this endpoint hello. And here, this one, let me make it, let me zoom it in. So here we see that we have a bunch of information. So we have the request URL here. It's, it, it goes to the localhost 8080 slash hello. And the method is a get because we, in, in our endpoint, we defined it as a get mapping. And then we have a status code 200. And also we have the remote address and the bunch of other information. We also have some response headers, which are the default response headers, even if we don't specify them. Also, we have a request headers, which are included by the browser itself. Okay, so now let's go back to IntelliJ. And here, for example, if I do response status, and here, this response status, let me show you how, like the implementation or the code of this one, what we can pass as a parameter, which is the value right here. It's an object of type HTTP status. So this HTTP status class, it's an enum actually, contains a bunch of methods, okay, or variables. So for example, continue is 100. And here, for example, let's go back. And here, for example, if I search for the 201, you will see that the 201 is created, okay? Or okay is 200. So the default one is 200 if everything goes fine. So now let's play a little bit with, with this. So let's say that I want to use accepted 
as a response status for my second endpoint. So here, all I need to do is to provide an HTTP status dot accepted. So it will automatically go to this one and return to O2. Okay. So now let's respond, let's restart the application and see the changes. So again, in the browser, if I access the hello dash two endpoint, we see here that we have a status 202, which is the one that we specified before. So here it's a get method again, and we have a 202 as our status code, which is the one that we already specified as an annotation in here. So like this, we can specify a response status for each method, or we can leave it to the default one, which is 200, but it's always recommended to specify the response code or the response status as the verb or as the method or as the requirement of our application. Okay, that's good. So now you understand how we can create an endpoint and also how we can specify the response status. So now I will just clean up this one. Also, I will optimize the imports and let's create our first post mapping endpoint. So for the post mapping, it's always the verb and then mapping. So the annotations with Spring Boot are always like verb and then mapping. So for post mapping, get mapping, put mapping, and so and so forth. So here, let's say post mapping and let's give it, for example, slash post. And then I will just perform a public string post, for example, and here I will just return request accepted, for example, or saved or like you can say whatever you want. So here for this post mapping, we need, and as we mentioned before, when we perform a post mapping, this means that we want to post some data or to send some data from the client to the server. So the client in this case is our browser or any other tool that we want to use to perform REST requests. So here we need to provide a body, for example. So the body in here, I want, for example, let's say string and let's say message. Okay. So here I'll, I will just update this a little bit. Request accepted and message is, and then just message. We will just display the message that we get as a parameter. Okay, so now if I if I start my application and I go to the browser and try to hit this post endpoint, let's see what will happen. So again, let's check the server is up and running. Now, if I go back to my browser, let me reduce this one and let's try to access slash post and hit enter. So here we see that we have an error message. So this application has no explicit uh, mapping for error and so on and so forth. And here we see that we have this post 405. And this is because the browser does not support post requests. So it does not support post requests. This means that the browser address bar right here typically sends get request when you enter a URL and press enter. So this part of the design and specification of a browser. A GET request is meant to retrieve a resource, which is exactly what you're doing when you enter a URL, you're asking to, to retrieve and view the web page. So the POST requests, on the other hand, are designed to send data to server to create or update a resource. So POST data is sent in the body of the HTTP request, not in the URL. This is the part of the HTTP specification. So now, since we are not able to use the browser address bar to send post requests, let's see what is the alternative for that. Now, let's see what is the alternative for using or as a HTTP client to send requests to our backend server. So for this, if you are already familiar with Postman, you can skip this video and move on to the next part. But before that, let's first see or let's see or define what is Postman. So Postman is a popular API client that helps developer for build, test and debug HTTP requests. It's used for API development and testing and it simplifies each step for the API lifecycle, including design, mocking, testing, documentation and monitoring. So first, let's see how we can install Postman. So it's so simple, just go to the browser, go to Google, and then just search for download Postman. 
you will find the first link which is posting or like which is referring to the postman.com website and then click on download postman and get started for free. So here, as you can see, we have, or like we can download the app and this is how Postman looks like. So also you can change the, the theme, you can make a dark theme or light theme. And here, depending on your, uh, on your operating system, you will see the download button right here. So here, for example, for my case, I have an Apple chip, or if you have an Intel one, or if you have Windows or Linux and so on and so forth, you can just click and download Postman and then install it. So the installation is quite easy and straightforward. So now let's go back to Postman and start exploring Postman and its different features. So this, this is how the Postman UI looks like. So first let's start by defining the theme. So how you can manage and how you can define the theme. So here you see this cog right here, then click on settings and then you have themes. So for the theme, you for the theme, you can whether choose the system default. So it will be depending on the system uh, layout and, and look and feel. It, also, you can make it uh, a light version or also you can use the dark one, which is the developer's preferred theme. So I will keep it dark for the sake of this course. Then what we can see in here, we have this plus button. This is when and where we can perform HTTP calls to any backend. So here what we see, we have the URL or we have the URL that we can, that we want or the URL of the endpoint that we want to invoke. And here we have the list of the supported HTTP operations. And as we can see here, here we have get, post, boot, patch, delete, head and options. So these are the, the HTTP methods that we already explained and spoke about before. And here, all we need to do is to perform or like, or to paste or type the URL of our API. So here we also see that the, the history of my uh, previous uh, URLs that I used in here. And so for example, if I use one of these and since our API is also available on the localhost 8080, and if I try to reach the hello endpoint, and click on send. So we see here that we have the response that we also saw on the browser. So also here, this is a get mapping. And here, let's explore what we have in here. Okay. So for depending on the, depending on the method or the verb that we want to do, we, we have a list of a uh, few things here that we can do. For example, here we can pass request params. And here, for example, if I have, for example, I want to pass a parameter as like first name equals Ali, for example, you see here that it's immediately changing and like doing a binding between this request param or query param and the one right here. So for example, if I add a second one, last name, you see that it's also changing in the, in the URL or in the in the uh, URL address bar right here. So here, for example, if I say Bo Ali as a last name, you see that it's also reflecting in here. So here we are where we can pass query params. Then we have the authorization tab. So here, if we have a secure backend or secure API here, where we can specify the type of the security we have, and we can pass the values for it. For example, if my API is secured with an API key, so all, all I need to do is to select API key and then I paste or like give the key name, the key value and where I want to include this one as a header or as a query param, depending on how you implement it on your backend. Then we have the headers tab. So the headers tab, by default, we have few a few headers which are hidden. These headers are automatically injected and included by Postman or even the browser itself as we saw before. So here, for example, we have the Postman token, we have the host, user agent, and so on and so forth. Also, if I want to specify a special header that I need for my backend, I can also call it, for example, here, my header and then value, for example. And then we can also specify description. So this is where we can where and how we can pass extra headers to our backend. And then we have the body. So this body tab is mainly for all the requests like of type post, boot, patch, and 
and that's it for the delete i uh, we, we don't need to pass any uh, any bodies so for example if i have a post request and here i can ha or i have different types of uh, of bodies so the body can be none this means that i don't have a body for this request which is also valid for some uh, for some apis or for some endpoints so i will just clean up the url and then we have also form data. So the form data, it's just a key value. And for example, we can pass a text or a file in case I want to upload a file. All I need to do is to select file in here and then select the file from, from my system. Uh, then we have also another type of body, which is the URL encoded, which is a key value map. Then we have row, which is the part that we will see and we will use later on, or we can also pass a binary. So we can also select a file and, and send it. And even also if we have a GraphQL, we can pass the query and the query variables and so on and so forth. So now let's go back to, the, to this row and here. So the, the body can be whether a text or JavaScript or JSON or HTML or XML. And those are the supported body types. Then we have another tab right here, which is the pre-request script. So Postman also supports scripting. So we can, before sending the request, we can perform a script. For example, I can perform a script or I can write a script to grab some data or to grab a token from somewhere and inject it or save it to an environment variable that, that I can use, for example, in my authorization or even in the header and so and so forth. Also, we have the test tabs. So when I run or when I want to test some, um, to test my endpoint and if everything is working fine, I can perform test scripts here. So that the scripts are JavaScript based. And here, like you can see, for example, that you have some, some code snippets. So for example, here, if you want to test that the status code is 200, all you need to click on that and you will have the code ready to use. So also you can refer to the official documentation of Postman and you will understand and you will get everything you want to get started with testing with Postman. So here I will just go back to the authorization and move it back to none because we don't have any uh, security. Also, I will just remove this test. And finally, we have some settings. This, for example, if you have some specific requirements for uh, for your application or for your backend. So this is where you can specify these settings. But for now, it's not something that which is really important for us and relevant. So we will skip this part. Also with Postman, we have a bunch of other features. So here we can create collections. And this is the part that we will cover later on when we when we implement the, the test part. So we have here collections, we can create a set of collections, which is a set or like a group of the the requests that we want to perform. And we can have them for example, this is one, one of the requests of a previous bootcamp that I already animated. So here, for example, we can specify the order and the flow that we want to uh, that we want to execute within a single collection. And also this is this can be part of the end to end tests later on. Also, we have API here. So we can switch to workspace or like to like we need to set up a workspace. And here, for example, we can collaborate with other teams and so on and so forth. Also, we can define environments. So environments, it's something similar to what we explained before we can work with environments on Postman too. So for example, let's say I have this, uh, this URL right here, and I can run it on, for example, on a dev environment, on pre-production, on production, staging, and so on and so forth. So I don't need to change or to switch every time the URL from one environment to, an, to another. All I need to do is to set up my environment and just click or select or set that environment to the active one. Also with Postman, we can use mock servers. So users can create mock servers to simulate API responses, which is useful in the early stages of development when the backend is not fully built. So here you can, you can say, for example, when you access this endpoint, return this, and this is what we call mock or mock server. And also mocking, this is a part that we will be covering in this course later on. Also, we have some monitorings and here we see also the history of all the requests that you perform on Postman. So this is a global overview for uh, for Postman. And now we let's move on and try to test our post method.
now we can use postman to perform this post request so let's open postman and let's click on this plus icon and then all I need to do is to specify my euro my URL so I will use just an old one and then I will clean up so my endpoint is localhost 8080 slash post as we have it in our backend so here it's a post request so I need to select the verb or the method which is a post and all I need to do is to click on send so here let's check uh, okay so we did not start our backend so let's start it and now let's go back to postman and here because we saw this message uh, could not send request so this means that the that the server is not up and running so that's why I had to run it so now let's click on send again and here we see that the response or the answer from our post method saying that request accepted and message is null so the message is null because we did not pass anybody because my post endpoint is expecting a string message as a body so I need to pass that so as I explained before to pass a body click on the body and then we have the type pro because all we need to do is to pass a text or a JSON uh, body or XML it depends on on the body type that we want to expect but in this case it's just a message so it's just a, uh, a classic test or a, sp or a normal test body so here let's say Alibu for example and I will click on send again but even if I have my body right here the value of the message variable is always null even I have a 200 OK coming back from my backend so maybe let's change this one to JSON and click on send it's still always null let's try with XML or HTML it's always null as a response so let's go ahead and check why this is null let's quickly restart our application in debug mode and let's add breakpoint to the line 19 and then let's send the request again and see maybe there is we receive correctly the value for this message variable and maybe we have something wrong with our implementation so let's jump back to postman and let's click on send again so here we see that we have our breakpoint and don't worry about that about debugging because I will make a full video just to cover how to debug with IntelliJ but as you can see here the value of our message is null so this means that we don't have any issue with our implementation this means that we well no no issue so far because maybe we missed something but for this case we are receiving a null so this means that we are not able to map or to transform the message or the value of the message we received from postman or for or uh, our rest client and we are not able to map it to this variable now let me show you and let me explain why when we work with spring framework we need always to tell spring and to indicate for each step what is the request body what is the response body what is this what is that because spring is smart enough is a, a complete framework but it will not do the job for us so in this case we need to indicate that this parameter we have right here is a request body or should represent the body of our request or of our method we have right here so in order to fix that what we need to do we need to add one annotation which is a request body so this means this is the body of our request and the request body annotation is used in the spring MVC to bind the HTTP request body with the method parameter it's part of the Spring's approach to build RESTful web services and is used in the controller layer where the HTTP request is handled. So as you can see, here we have our request body in our method right here, which is already part of our REST controller. So now let's restart the application in a normal mode and let's test again and see what will happen. So again in Postman, if I click on send, now we see that we have Alibu. So here, let me explain a little bit what happened. So here, when we send Alibu as a message or as a body for our request, then here in IntelliJ, using this annotation, so when we annotate the method parameter with request body, Spring will use the HTTP message converter to 
convert the HTTP request body into the specified Java object. So here, for example, it can convert JSON data to the request body into the Java object, or if it's, for example, here, uh, the case of a string or of a simple string, it was able to convert anything coming from the bo from the request the body uh, of our request to this string message. So here, let me show you something else. Here we see that the type of the body or the type of this row uh, object is text. Now, if I transform it to JSON, and here, so here, this is how we m map or we match the JSON representation. So our parameter is called message, and then let's give it a value alibu. Then let's click on send and see what is the output. So as you can see, so the request accepted and the message, it just returned back this object. So for us, it's a JSON because we selected JSON as a type in here and we passed an JSON object. But here in our implementation, the object is of type string. So it, it's, it just transforms this JSON representation, which is also a string, to just string message. But if I have a complex object or a Java object in here, it will also be able to transform this to the Java object. We will see this in details later on. Now, let's assume that I want to post an object that should hold the information or the data of an order object. This means I want to post the customer name, the product name, and a quantity to save it or to do whatever logic we need behind. So let's go ahead and create such class. So here on our base package, right click and then new and then Java class and let's call it order DTO or let's just call it order for now. So click enter and here let's define some fields. So I will have private string customer name and then let's say we have also a private string product ID or product name, it also works. And then let's have finally public int quantity. And this is the representation of our object that we want to post right now. Because in the previous example, we just saw, uh, we just saw how to send a simple string as object. Now let's see how we can send a complex object to our controller. Now, if we go back to our first controller class, and let me make this one full screen, and I will duplicate this method. And for the mapping, I will call it post-order. And here, instead of having a string message, I will request or ask to have the order object, which is part of com.alibu.example, the class that we just created, and let's call it order, okay? So here, let's say the request accepted and order is, and let's simply say our object order dot to string. So this is gonna be the default to string method. Let's see what will be the output. But first of all, let's start our application and go to our postman and test this one. So first I'm gonna start the application. So we will get this new endpoint ready to use. So as you can see, the application is up and ready. Now, if I go to postman, and here I will duplicate this tab. So just right click on it and here you have duplicate tab. So here I will just change the URL to post order and then I will change the body. So here we have the type, it's a JSON and to represent the object that we created in our backend to a JSON type, all we need to do is the, is the following. So here in, the, in this order object, all we need to do is to take these names right here, the field names, copy them, and then go back to postman. And here I will remove all this and just paste this. So here the name should be exactly the same. So no typos in, in there. And then I will show you how we can perform the types. So here for string, it should be also in double column. So let's say Alibu for the customer name. And then for the product name, let's see, let's say, for example, iPhone. And for the quantity, since it's an integer, so it will be just one. And then don't forget to add a comma after each field. So now let me format this. And now we have, this is the JSON representation of our Java object. So the names should match. And then I will show you how we can also, if we want change the JSON uh, property names, so we can also do that. So now let's go ahead and click on send 
and see what will happen. So here we have this com.alibu.example. So this is the object. Now I will restart my application in debug mode and let's add a breakpoint and see what's happening exactly. Going back to our first controller, I will remove this breakpoint and move it to line 27. Since here we receive the other object and then I will restart my application in debug mode. And then I will go back to postman and click on send again. So here we have our order object. So let's check what we have. We see here that we have customer name is null, product name is null and quantity is null. Okay, so I will resume this. Also, I will just go back to my order class and generate the two string method. So here just use the auto completion. And here we see that we have this two string method. And I want this two string method to include all the fields that I have. And then I will click OK. So here, this will be the string representation of my order class. So if I restart again, just to make sure that we uh, we see exactly uh, the, this two string method or what we expected. Let's go back to postman, click on send, and then I will resume since I have my breakpoint activated. And then let's go back. So here, as you can see, we have null, 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 but we already sent an object in here. Okay, so we sent values Alibu, iPhone and one, but we see that we have null values. So let me explain to you why we have this. When we sent our request containing this request body right here with the following values, Alibu, iPhone and one, we saw that the response was containing null values. So as we saw, customer name was null, product name was null and the quantity was there was zero, which are the default values of the types that we chose. And this is because we didn't create any accessors for our order class. So coming back to this order.java class, we see that we just created private fields, customer name, product name, and quantity. And this is without any accessors. So the accessors are getters and, set and setters, also known as accessors, are mutator methods. They play a crucial role in the serialization and deserialization process. In the context of a frameworks like Spring and libraries like Jackson, which are commonly used for serializing and deserializing data and for, uh, from formats such as JSON. So these methods have specific uses. So for example, the getters, when an instance of an object is serialized into a format like JSON, the getter methods are called to access the current state of the object. The values returned by these methods are then written into the serialized format. Now for the setters, during deserialization, setters are used to populate the field of a newly created object with the data from the serialized format. So now to fix the issue, all we need to do is to generate getters and setters. So I will click on generate and here we see that have we have getters and setters. And also, as I mentioned before, each time I use a shortcut, you will see the green pop up right here to, to see or to learn which uh, shortcut I used. So now I will generate getters and setters for all the fields that I have right here. So it will be for customer name, product name and quantity. And then I will click on OK. So now we have the accessors. So now if I restart my application, I can also leave this breakpoint. I will restart the application and then I will go back to postman and send again the request. So here I will click on send. And now let's evaluate this order. So we see that the customer name is Alibu iPhone and we have also the quantity. If I resume the program and go back to postman, we see that we have the object that we already sent. So now I guess you understand the importance of having accessors while you use object to transfer data from a client or a REST client, which is in our case Postman, or it can be any other application like a front-end framework like Angular or React or even native JavaScript, and you need accessors to deserialize and deserialize the object. So now as a next step, let's see how, for example, I can customize the name of this JSON field. So for example, I want to have a different name for my JSON representation and another different name in my Java object. Now to specify a different 
property name and this case can happen for example in case I want to consume or I want to send data to a third party API and the names are not the same as my Java object. For example, we can have a case of uh, a customer name, it might be C name, P name for product name and Q for example just for quantity and I want to create a decent and comprehensible, comprehensive Java object with customer name, product name and quantity and also I want to uh, I want Java or my Spring Framework and Jackson to correctly map these objects. So all I need to do is to use an annotation called JSON property and this JSON property comes from the from the package com.fasterxml.jackson.annotation, which is the Jackson library, which is used by the Spring Framework for the serialization and deserialization process. So here, let's say that this customer name, I wanted to have a C name, for example, to reference or to say that this is the customer name. But before going forward, let's quickly check the JSON property annotation and here in the official documentation of this annotation it says that it marker annotation that can be used to define non-static methods as a setter or getter for logical property depending on its signature and so on and so forth. So here this is the most important part. The default value is empty as you can see in here indicates that the field name is used as the, pro as the property name without any modification but it can be specified to non-empty value to specify different name. So here this is what we are doing right now and now let's just duplicate this and specify it also for the second property and I will call this one p name and let's say for example I want to call this as just Q or let's let's leave this one to quantity for example. Okay, now if I restart my application in debug mode and go back to Postman and try to perform the, the request, let's see what will happen if I leave the properties like this. So I'm going to click on send so I can also here uh, leave the breakpoint and as you can see we see we have the customer name is null the product name is null but the quantity was correctly mapped so the quantity was mapped because we have this just this json property right here and it's it has the same name as the java property of the java field okay but for the customer name and product name the names are different because we specified this JSON property right here. So all we need to do, I'm going to resume the program right here and I will go back to uh, Postman and all I need to do is to change this property to C name and then product name or P dash name. And here also I left on purpose this name right here with a capital N also to see if if it's case sensitive or not. So let's try this out. Also, we see that we have customer name and product name as null. So yes, the answer is yes, it's uh, case sensitive. So you need to be really careful about that. So here we have C name with a small letter or small n or like a lowercase n. So I will change this one and send again and we will see that we have correctly the mapping to the correct values that we sent from our REST client. So here I'm going to resume the program and also I will show you that we have the correct output right here. So now we understand how we can map properties with different names than the Java objects. So now let's move on and see more interesting parts. Since Java version 14, a new type of objects was introduced, which is Java records. We can also use records to represent our objects. So like we did with this order here, it's just a class. We can create records to represent our uh, request bodies. So let's go ahead and try this one. So here I will create a new Java class and then select record in here and let's call it order record. And within this order record, all I need to do is to create or to declare the same properties that we have in here. So I'm going to just copy paste them. So here I will use a shortcut to uh, to select all the properties, just copy. And then I will close this one and 
paste this in here. So, and then I need, of course, commas. And now I have my record object created. So here I have order, uh, order record. And all I need to do is between these parentheses, all I need to do is to declare my fields. And I don't need any type of accessors like private, public, Okay, so now we have our order record ready. Let's move on and now and create an endpoint that should accept the order or the record as a request body. And now if I go back to my first controller and I will, again, I will duplicate this method. Let me make it full screen. And here I will call it a uh, post order record just to, uh, to make the difference. And here I will call the method post record. And here in this order uh, or request body, it will be order record. Okay. So then I will also use the order dot to string method. So all I need to do is just to run my application again and check what will be the output of this endpoint. So I'm restarting the application. And as you can see, the app is up and running. Now, if I go back to postman, and all I need to do is to change this endpoint to order dash record. And then I will click on send. So here we still, we see that we have null, null, null because we don't have the same property names. Also the JSON property works with records. So whether we can fix it on the Java side or we just rename this one. So what I will be doing, I will duplicate this tab. And then in the body, I will just use, for example, customer name. And also I will just rename this one to product name. So like this, I don't need to change my Java object. So I will click on send again. And we see that we have here request accepted and the object is correctly displayed. Okay. So now in this case, we saw that we didn't need to create any getters, any setters. We didn't need to do anything for our record. Okay. So here you see that we created three fields and then we created, we, we had to generate getters and setters because we need those ones. Also, we saw that we have, we had to override the to string method, but for the order record, we didn't need to do that. Let me explain to you in the next part, what is the difference between uh, POJOs or plain old Java objects like the order object right here and records when it comes to data transfer objects. Whether to use POJOs or plain old Java objects or records for data transfer objects in Java depends on the use case and the Java version you are using. Java records introduced as a preview feature in Java 14 and finalized in Java 16. So they are new kind of type declaration in the Java language. A record class is shallowly immutable, transparent carrier to, for a fixed set of values. Values which can be accessed with accessors method that, that have the same names as the fields. Records reduce the verbosity of Java and make it, make it more suitable for data centric applications. POJOs have been used for many years in Java for such tasks. They are versatile and work with all Java versions, but require more code to write. You have to declare fields and then you have to write or generate constructors, getters, setters, equals, hash code, and to string method. If you are using Java 16 or later and your DTO are simple carriers of data, Without any additional logic, records may be a better choice. They provide a concise and convenient syntax and automatic implementation of equals hash code and to string as we saw in the examples previously. Also, you need to note that records are final by default and all their fields are final, so they can't be used with libraries uh, that require mutable beans such as uh, some older versions of Hibernate or JPA. If you are using a Java version earlier than Java 16, or if you need mutable objects, or if your DTOs need to include logic beyond uh, just storing data, POJOs may be a better choice. So as always, the right choice depends on your specific needs and constraints. Now let's see how we can pass parameter to a method. So let's go back to our first controller and let's see how I can pass a parameter to a specific method. So here I will just create or copy this get mapping method right here and I will put it 
in the bottom. So this works for any type of, uh, of methods, whether get, post, boot, delete, and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's applicable and correct for all of them. So here, let's say, for example, um, path variable. This means that I want to pass my parameter or my variable in the path. So to pass it in the path here, let's say, for example, my value equals, and then let's concatenate this with the result. So then the first thing that we need to do is in this get mapping right here. So let's say that we have um, a method called hello. Let's keep it as hello. And now I want to pass my variable in the path. So this means I want to have something like this. So HTTP and then colon slash slash and then localhost and then the port number slash, for example, hello slash Alibu, let's say. So this is, or I want this one a variable. So it can be Alibu, it can be Ali, it can be Boo, it can be any variable that I want to pass. So here in this case, first, all I need to do is to have my, my variable. So it's a st of type string, for example, and let's say user name, just an example. And now I need to tell Spring that this username will come in the path right here, or I will receive it in the path of my request. So to do that, just go here, whether you have, for example, slash hello, or you have nothing, all, any, all you need to do is slash and then curly brackets. And then for example, let's say user dash name. So like this Spring will know that this user dash name is a path variable. Now, all we need to do is to link this one to this one. So here we have two cases. So the first one, whether I pass the path variable exactly within the same name, like the same naming as my variable right here. So it will be just like that. Okay. So Spring will automatically refer this user name here to this user name right here. So here, here I will just concatenate my username or the best case, which I recommend is to use user dash name, for example. And here, all you need to do is to say that this is a path variable. Okay. And this path variable, as I mentioned before, whether we use it like this, so the path variable is always needed, you need always to specify or to add this path variable annotation to the field that you want to map. Because like this, we will mention to Spring that this username right here, this variable or parameter that we want to receive right here is the same that we have it here. And first we can mention the same name. So the same variable name, or for example, if I have a different one, so to use it like this user dash name here, this path variable also accepts a parameter it's called value. So by default, it's empty. And by default, it will take the variable name as the variable or the, uh, as the variable or the default value. So here, let's specify it like that. And let's say user dash name. So the value we put in here should be exactly the same in here. So what I recommend also try to have like correct namings. So user dash name is more readable than for example, user name like this. Uh, or for example, if you have long complex names, always separating them with a dash is much, much easier to read. So now if I restart my application and go and test this one, we will see that we have my value equals the value that we will pass in the parameter. So I will just restart in debug mode and then I will go to my postman. And in here, I will just duplicate one of these. And here I have, for example, hello slash and then let's say Alibu. And of course, it's a get mapping. So let's click on the get. So we don't have anybody. So we can click on none. And now all I need to do is to click send. So here we see that I have my value equals Alibu. And if I say, for example, hello, or even with spaces as you want, it also able to map the value. So here, this is how we can pass a variable in the path. We call it also path variable. Now let's see how we can pass request params. Now let's see how we can pass a variable as a request param. 
So here I will just duplicate this method just to keep the code. And then I will just here rename it to param variable. And I will just comment this out to keep the same URL. So here I will just remove this one. So it will be just slash hello. And here the URL or the final URL will be hello. And then like this, and then it will be param underscore name or like this, this, this will be the param name equals and then the value. So here param value. And if I have a second parameter, it will be and and param name two, for example, equals value two, just an example. Okay, so now let's transform this username to a param or a, uh, or a request param. So here all I need to do, instead of using path variable, it will be a request param. And this request param, whether we can keep the request param as the this parameter or this field right here, or uh, sorry, it's param, not part. And over here, the, the, in the same way as we did before. So let's say, for example, user dash name. Okay, so if I have as another parameter, all I need is to do is to duplicate it or to add another request param. So for example, username and here, let's say last name. And here, let's say, for example, last name. And here, all I need to do is just to display this plus user last name. And this is how it will look like. Now, all I need to do is restart my application and go back to Postman and send this request again. So when we started the application, we have an exception. And this is actually is going to introduce us to the next topic that I will explain just later on. But for the moment, I will just comment out this get mapping right here. And I will explain that later on. So let's restart the application again, and make sure that everything is up and running. So here the application started. And let's go back to postman. And all we need to do is just change this one. And as I mentioned before, we have user dash name. Also, you can remark that here, we, everything, every time we type a parameter and the value, it will be reflected automatically in the query params. So here, let's say Alibu. And for example, uh, and and then for example, we have user dash last name, and then equals for example, Bu Ali. So this is my last name. And then let's click on send. So here we see that we have Ali Bu and then Bu Ali as a last name, exactly as we mentioned in our code right here. Okay, so this is how you can pass request params. Now let's move on to the next part, which is how we should name or how we can name our methods and URLs and how Spring is already interpreting that and how requests are dispatched from our REST client to the backend. So now let's understand the difference between path variables and request params. So in Spring Boot, path variables and request params are annotation used for extracting values from the URL of an HTTP request. They are used in the Spring MVC handler methods. And here how they differ. So first, when we start with the path variable right here, so this annotation is used to extract values from the URI path. So it's typically used in RESTful web services where the URL contains a value representing some sort of resources identifier. So the annotated parameter in the method declaration is bound to the path variable of the same name. So as we mentioned before, so here if you have whether Spring is capable of referencing the name that you pass right here as a path variable with the parameter name or the field name, or when you use path variable, also like you need to use path, path variable, and you can also pass the name right here to match the name that you have in your URL. From the other hand, when we use request param, so this annotation is used to extract query parameters from the URL. So query parameters are typically used to carry context information for the request and are separated from the URI using the exclamation mark symbol and are chained with the end symbol. So in summary, path variable is used when a value you want is actually part of the URI while request param is used when the value is passed as a query parameter. 
In a Spring MVC or Spring Boot application, the framework uses annotations to define which method should handle which HTTP request. So we have the controller or the REST controller annotations are used at the class level to indicate that an annotated class is a controller. So Spring's component scanning mechanism detects these classes and create beans of them in the application context. So then we have the request mapping annotation or as a shortcut, we have the get mapping, post mapping, put mapping, etc. So this one is used as the method level within these controller classes. So this annotation tells Spring that the annotated method should handle an HTTP request of a certain type and for example, a post, get, put and so and so forth. And when the application starts up, Spring creates a mapping between the URLs, HTTP methods, and the corresponding controller methods. So this is done by a class called request mapping handler mapping, which scans the controller classes and builds up a registry of such mappings. So when an HTTP request comes in the dispatcher servlet, which is the front controller in a Spring MVC, consults these mappings to determine which method should handle the request. So then the appropriate method is then invocated and its return value is used to generate the HTTP response. Next, we will see in the diagram how this is working. So now let's understand in action and even a little bit in details how this works. So in the Spring Boot application or in the REST API application, we have some kind of REST clients and it can be a mobile application, another REST API or the internet or even Postman as a REST client. And then the first step is, is sending a request. So we call this an incoming request and the first thing or the first object that will receive this request is the front controller, which is the dispatcher servlet. Then the dispatcher servlet will forward the, the request to the handler mapping class or the handler mapping object. And this handler mapping will consult the mapping registry and it, it will try to find a mapped controller. And this mapping registry, as I explained before, so it will map or it has a registry of the method plus the path plus the path variables and types and it will refer to a specific method of the controller. Then when it finds a match, it will return the controller and the method that needs to be invocated. And then the fifth step, it will forward this request to the, to the required controller. And then we of course have all the business logic goes, uh, goes along like uh, service validation, database reg uh, registration, consulting another API and so on and so forth. And after that, we have the response. So the response will go back to the controller and the controller will send back the response to the dispatcher servlet and then it will go back to the customer or to the client of this request. And this is how it exactly works. Now let's have a quick look on this. So for example, if we have a get method with the following path slash some path slash string and then an integer as path variable. And for example, we have a get some path slash Ali slash one. So this is correct. Then if we have the same path, but with a different uh, verb or a different method in this case, for example, a post. So we have post slash something slash ID slash one. So this is also correct because we have two different verbs. So th that's why I mentioned here that the concatenation of, of the URL should be unique. So the concatenation or like the composition of the URL is method plus path plus path variables. And here I mentioned type because we need to have different types. So for example, here if in case I have some path slash string slash integer, and then even if I pass a different value, Spring will say that we have uh, we have an ambiguity and it, it's not able to determine which one to use. So you, you really need to be careful about that and we will see in action how this works. So this is globally how request dispatching works in Spring Boot. So now coming back to our first controller class 
and let's bring this back so here we have a get mapping and then it, it has a, a mapping slash hello and in the bottom if you remember we have a get mapping so also it has the same url so it's slash hello and here we see that request params they did they do not interfere or they do not make a, a method unique so now if i start the application i will get an exception telling me that spring is not able to determine or to know which is what so here the error that we have so we have application run failed and the exception here it says that error creating being with name request mapping handler mapping so this is the class that we spoke about defined in the class path blah 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 and so on and so forth and here it's mentioning that so here in the end of this exception we see that we have ambiguous mapping so cannot map first controller method and the method is com.alibu.example.firstcontroller which is our class and then the method called param variable so this is the method that we are talking about and then this method it contains two string uh, parameters to a get slash hello because there is already a first controller being method com.alibu.example and the method is called say hello which is already mapped so in this case we see that this method even the method name is different but spring doesn't refer uh, the method names but first the id or the unicity is about the parameter and the path so you you really need to be careful about that and even if you get such an example or such an exception you now are able to understand where this comes from before moving forward let's first clean up our code so first i will remove this order record i will create one later on if we if we need to and then i will keep um i can keep this order we might use it but also let's just clean clean up everything and let's restart everything from scratch and for this controller i will just leave the first get method just to have our controller up and working so here i will just leave this get mapping and this post mapping and now let me also optimize the imports and that's it so now we have our project again clean and we can start from scratch to introduce and to dig deep and deep in this part first of all we need to install all the required softwares to in order to correctly and easily communicate and interact with the database for this course we will be using postgres sql as a database management system so for you you can whether uh, install postgres sql on premises this means you download and install the um, the software or you can use docker so first let me show you how you can install go to google and all you need to do is to type download postgres sql and then you just select because you will have two uh, or more links like uh, the sponsor uh, sponsored links but then you need to go to the official website which is 3wpostgresql.org and then go to the downloads page so here you will have the download page for the different operating systems like linux mac os windows and so on and so forth and all you need to do is to follow the installation instructions for example for mac os here you can download the installer certified by the edb and so on and so forth also for example if you want to use the postgres.app or homebrew or and so and so forth the same for windows just click on the windows link and then you have download the installer also you can see the versions and what are what versions are available and so and so forth so this is how you can install postgres sql on premises for your operating system now in the next part let's see in case you want to use docker let me show you how to install postgres sql as a docker image or a docker container running on your docker machine now if you want to use postgres sql on docker all you need to do is to go to hub.docker.com so this is the docker hub website and all you need to do is to search for postgres okay so here we see that we have the first image 
and always try to look or to search for the Docker official image. So then in order to install it, so let's say we want to use the latest version. So here we have all the, the information we need. And here we see that we have this command right here. So all we need to do is to copy this command and here we see that we have this environment variable which is important and which is mandatory in order to make Postgres SQL running correctly on Docker. So here we have Postgres password and you need to provide the password for your Postgres SQL and the user will be Postgres just like this by default. So then I will show you how we can use this in order to connect to our database and display all the data we need. So all you need to do, just copy this one and run it on your terminal and also make sure you to have a Docker desktop as installed on your machine and then you're good to go. So I assume if you have Docker and a little bit familiar with Docker, so it will not be an, uh, a complex task to set up and install a Docker container on your machine. Now let's see how we can explore our database. So here, if you have IntelliJ with the ultimate version, all you need to do is to select and click on this database. Otherwise you can go to view and then you will have tool window and then you will have database right here. So just click on it and it will display this bar right here. So then in this plus, so let me make it full screen. So then on this plus, just click on new to select a new data source. So when you highlight this new data source, you will have this pop up right here. And then all you need to do is to search for the database that you are using. So in our case, let's search for Postgres. And then when you click on OK, you will have this pop up right here. So here, all you need to do is like to provide the name. So also you can, for example, let's say test just an example. So this will be the name of, the, of your data source. And then, so if you, if, if it's the first time that you are using this tool, you will have a link right here telling to download the driver. So just go ahead and click, click on it. But for my case, since it's already downloaded, so I don't have it anymore. Then the next step is here. We need to provide the information about the host and the port. So the host, it's always localhost, whether you are running your Postgres SQL on premises or on a Docker container. So it's always localhost and the port, if you did not change it, it's by default 5432. Then we need to provide the authentication. So these are the username and password that you provided when you installed Postgres SQL. So for my case, it's Alibu and then Alibu as a username and password. And now all I need to do is to click on test connection for the database. Just leave the database as a database by default, which is the Postgres. So you don't need to change it, to change it. Or if you have different ones, all you need is just to select database that you want to connect to. So here we see that we have this URL right here and we will need this one later on. So I will show you again how we can also retrieve it again. So now all we need to do is to click on test connection to make sure that we are correctly or we, we can correctly connect to our database. So make sure you have this succeeded message. Otherwise you need to check the information or the inputs that you provided in here. So now all I need to do is to click apply and then OK. So here, let's explore together this UI. So here, this this is the, the data source that we call test. And here we see that we have a Postgres SQL. It's one of three. And then we have the public schema. So here also we can select all the databases that we have or that we will create in this. OK, so now for the moment, we don't have any database selected. Later on, when we create our first database, we will be able to select it and display it in here. OK, so that's it. Now I will show you if you don't have the IntelliJ Ultimate version, what is the alternative to connect and to explore the database? For the students that they don't have the ultimate version of IntelliJ and you want to have a different tool that will help you exploring any database you want. So I recommend using a tool called dBeaver. 
So this dbeaver is an open source and free cross-platform database for developers, database administrators, and so and so forth. So all you need to do is to whether to Google dbeaver or just go to dbeaver.io. And when you click on the link, you will have this interface and then you can click on the download link. But before going to the download, all you need to do, like let's first uh, explore the, the UI. So it looks a little bit similar to the UI that we are using on IntelliJ. So here you have the databases that you can select or the data sources, also like uh, even to connect to a database, like you can change the theme from light to dark. Also, uh, you can see the diagrams, you can see almost everything and even to connect to the database, it's pretty much similar as the steps that we followed together. This is uh, something that I recommend for people that they don't have the ultimate version of IntelliJ, but for me personally, I prefer having everything in one place and in one UI. So that's why I, I will be using IntelliJ for the database, but for you, it should be the same, exactly the same way, even if you don't have the ultimate version. To work with Spring Data JPA and data persistency in Spring Boot project, all we need to do first of all is to add the required dependency. So to add a new dependency, we need to go to our pom.xml and then let's make this one full screen and let's add a new dependency in here. So after the Spring Boot starter web, here open um, a new tag and then you will have the auto completion dependency. So I will click on it. Otherwise the dependency looks exactly like this. So it's a dependency tag and it contains a bunch of information. So we have first of all the group ID and the artifact ID. So the group ID for, for most of the Spring Boot starters, it's always org.springbootframework.boot. Sorry, it's org spring framework boot. So then I will paste this one in here. And then the artifact is the starter name and all the starters or, or, or the, all the spring boot starters, they always start with spring dash boot dash starter, and then the starter name. And here, as you can see in this list, we already see that we have data JPA. So this is the dependency that we need for our project. So let's select this one. And then of course it will suggest the, the group ID since it's the same one, we can also double click it or even ignore that. And also don't forget to right click on this, uh, on this pom.xml and here we have, you have Maven and then reload project. So this will allow and will tell Maven to download all the dependencies. And as you can see here, so now it's, IntelliJ is downloading all the required dependencies, including this Spring Boot Starter Data JPA. So now if we uh, integrate and add the Spring Boot Starter Data JPA, we can now run the project and see what will happen. So let's also explore the logs together and see what will happen. So the first thing, the application is not running because we have an issue and the issue is fail to configure a data source or a URL attribute is not specified and no embedded data source could be configured. So I will explain this in the next video. So now we added a dependency and now we can start configuring our database. As we mentioned before, Spring Boot starters, they leverage auto configuration whenever it's possible. And after adding the dependency for the Spring Boot Data uh, Starter Data JPA, we saw that when we started the application, we had a failing. So here the mention on the, or the description says failed to configure data source and the attribute URL is not specified. This means that we need at least to give some configuration and some details to this starter in order to auto configure the connection to the database. And this is what we will be doing in this phase. And first of all, let's go to our application properties file. And here, as I mentioned before, so let me first clean it up. And as I mentioned before, and in this course, I will be using the YAML representation. So to do so, you have two options, whether to remove this application.properties file and create another one with the YAML extension, or all we can do is just rename it using this shortcut and change the properties to YAML. 
So you can use whether YAML or YML. Okay, so here I will click on refactor. So now my application file is using the YAML representation. So now let's start configuring the connection to our database. And to start the configuration, first of all, we start with providing the data source configuration. So with the data source configuration is uh, located under spring and then colon. And then here you need to be careful. So this is a tab. It's not a space or it's not three spaces or two spaces, but you need to use the tab. Okay. So here, for example, if I remove it, I need to use the tabulation as you can see in the shortcut here and then data source. And you see here that we have this auto completion already. So it's spring data source. And then we need to specify the URL as mentioned in the exception that we have. So here also we will type URL and we see here all already in the description, it's JDBC URL of the database. So it's not Hikari, it's not DBCP2 and so on and so forth. So you need to be sure and to be careful choosing the right property. So here I will choose URL and then where can I, where can I get this URL from? So here we can go back to the database and then right click on this data source that we created before and then click on properties and here we will see that we have this tab again and this window to configure the connection and then the URL is exactly this one so let's copy it close this one and we can also close this and then paste this this one here now let me explain to you what is or like how this URL is composed. So here is the connection type. So we want to have a JDBC connection, which is Java database connectivity. And then this is the, the database type, which is in our case is Postgres SQL because we want to use Postgres SQL. For example, if you are using MySQL or Oracle or something like that, it will be the, uh, exactly that one. And then we need the the host name of our database and in our case since we are using locally uh, our database it's not a remote one so it's localhost or even you can provide the machine or like the remote machine uh, address or IP address and then the port by default it's this one and if you have a different one you can also use it and finally this is the database name and for the database name, I will create a database later on and I will call it demo underscore DB. And this is, will be our database. So in the next, in next phase, we will create this database. So first of all, let's continue with the configuration. And then of course, within the data source, we need to provide other information, which is the username and password, which are the credentials for uh, our database or for Spring Data JPA to be able to connect to the database. And it will be exactly the same as we provided here when we tried to connect the first time to our database, which is in our case, uh, in my case, sorry, it's Alibu as a username and Alibu as a password. So here I will also provide this information. So use uh, choose username and again, be careful. It's not Hikari. It should be ex directly data source dot username. And in this case, it will be Alibu and then password and also choose the second one, not Hikari. Okay. And it will be also Alibu. And then we need to tell uh, Spring Data GPA which driver to use in order to connect to the database. Because as you know, to connect to any database, we need a driver. So here, if I choose also driver class name, it is under spring.datasource.driver class name. And here I need to provide the class name for our Postgres SQL. And in this one, we just need another dependency to add to our configuration. So let's go ahead and add it. To add the Postgres SQL driver, we need to go again to our pom.xml file, and then we need to add another dependency. So here I will click and add dependency. And then the dependency, it has an artifact ID, which is called Postgres SQL or Postgre SQL. And then the group ID is org.postgre SQL. Also, we can add a scope, which is in our case, it should be runtime. So here, this is the scope of this, uh, of this dependency. So it's available on the runtime. And then I click on this pop-up right here, or as I mentioned before, just right click and then Maven 
and then reload project to reload and download all the necessary dependencies. So now we have our PostgreSQL driver available. Let's go back and continue with our database configuration. So now if you go back to our application.yaml and in this driver class name, if I just type command uh, space, and here we will see that automatically IntelliJ will propose driver coming from org.postgreSQL package as a driver class name. Otherwise, you can just manually type org.postgreSQL.driver and then you will have the driver. And in case you don't include or you forgot to include the driver, it will be highlighted as, uh, as a non-found or a class not found exception or error right here. So don't worry about that in case you forgot to add it. Uh, IntelliJ will highlight it automatically. So now the first part is ready and now I can start the application and see what will happen. So here let's start the application and check if Spring will be able to locate and start the application. So yes, the first part is done. So let's check right here and here only thing that we have the database demo DB does not exist. So it was able to locate the database using the, the username and password, but it didn't find any database called demo underscore DB. Also, I want to show you something. For example, if I change the username and the password or just the username or password to provide wrong credentials and restart the application, we will see a different exception. So here it will say that enable to authenticate. So here it says password authentication failed for user Alibu DDD. So even if I fix the username and provide a wrong password, we will see again the same exception, uh, fatal authentication, as you can see right here, but this time it will say that password authentication failed for the user Alibu. So here, like we know now, we understand that Spring is able to connect to the database. Now let's move on and create our database and restart the application. So in this step, let's go ahead and create our database. So in here, click on database and on your data source that we created, we call the test, right click, and then we have new. And then, so let me just make it wider right here. So again, right click and then new, and you see here database. So select database, and then let's provide the database name as we mentioned before, demo underscore DB. And even you will see the SQL uh, query command that it will be executed, which is create database and then the database name. So click on, click OK. So here we see that we have this demo DB, but it says here that no schema selected. So all we need to do is to click on zero of three right here and select the public schema, which will hold our database later on and the list of the tables that we have. So in here we have empty schema for now and we don't have any tables. So let's move on and check that. So now let's create our first Java class, which will represent a table in our database. So I will explain everything later on, but first let's start with creating a new class and let's call it student, for example. And in this case, so here the student will hold the information of our student. So let's say first our student has a private integer ID so this will be the identifier or the unique identifier of our student. Also, it has a string first name and then a private string last name. So let me make this one a uh, full screen and string last name. And then let's say also our student has a private string email and finally a private string age. Uh, sorry, the age should be an int. So here, this is the representation of our student. So again, let's go ahead and generate some getters and setters, because as we mentioned before, we need getters and setters. Let's click OK. And then we need, for, for example, a constructor if you want to. So let's create a constructor. And for this constructor, yet let's use all the parameters except the ID. So this is how we can construct a student uh, using all the fields that we have right here. Also, you can just uh, ignore that and we can use setters later on to create our user. So now we have our object student or student class ready. Let's move on and let's see how we can transform this student class to 
an entity which will be persistent entity into our database. Before transforming our class to an entity, let's first define what is an entity. So in Spring Data JPA, the term entity refers to a Java object that is meant to be persisted in a relational database using the JPA or aka Java Persistence API. So any entity represents a table in a database and each instance of an entity represents a row in a table. So the entity fields represent the column of the table and the state of an entity represents the data in a row. So to map an object to a database with the JPA, we need to annotate with entity and the class must have a no args constructor which can be public or protect protected. Also, it should contain an identifier ID and it's a best practice also to include the table annotation to specify the table name if the table is not specified. So the table name will default to the class name. So Spring Data JPA uses these entity classes to generate SQL queries and to convert the results of those queries back into objects that you can use in your Java code. So the actual database interaction is performed by the underlying JPA implementation, such hibernate in our case. So in the next, next phase, let's move on and transform our student Java class to an entity. So as mentioned in the previous video, we need within uh, Spring Data GPA and if you want to transform a Java class to, uh, to an entity, first of all, we need to have an empty constructor or a default constructor with no args. So let's go ahead and generate that one. So here, let's generate a constructor and to generate a, an empty constructor, just click or select the class name right here and then click OK. So now we have our default constructor. Let's move on and transform this student class or student Java class to an entity. So as we mentioned and explained before, all we need to do is first of all to have the entity annotation on the top or on the class level. And here be careful, the entity is coming or comes from the jakarta.persistence if you are using the spring uh, version three also, if you are using a lower version, it will be javax.persistence. So here, let's select this one. And here directly we see that IntelliJ is highlighting the class name. And if I highlight and check what is the error, so it, see, it says that the persistent entity student should have a primary key. So we need to specify a primary key every time you create an entity and to provide a primary key, it's so easy. Just go ahead and choose what is the primary key of your class or of your entity and add the ID annotation. It's all also coming from the jakarta.persistence package. And now we have our student entity. So now let's go ahead and see if we are able to uh, generate or to manipulate or to start the application within these small changes. So if I click here, to start the application. We see that the application is up and running and also let's see if we have any um, any logs that we can use. Uh, also we see here like starting the application and we also see that we have some, uh, some annotations or some logs from Hibernate. So here it's Hibernate version uh, 6.1.7 and also it's using the dialect, Postgres SQL dialect and the JTA platform implementation, which is the no JTA platform and so and so forth. So here the application is up and running. And if I go to my database and I try to refresh this one and check the public schema, also if I refreshed again, I don't see anything. Spring and JPA and the, the Hibernate implementation of JPA, they provide a tool and configuration to auto create and to auto generate the tables within the database. So in the next part, let's go ahead and see how we can tell Spring and tell Spring Data JPA to be specific to generate or to auto generate our database. So now to, to define the extra properties, first I will stop the application and then I will go back to our application.yaml. Let me make it full screen. 
and then we need to provide few properties. So here within the properties, we see here that we have spring dot data source. Now at the same level of data source, it will be spring and then JPA, and then we can specify some information. So here within JPA, we have hibernate, and then within hibernate, we have this information or this property, which is called DDL auto. So this DDL auto or like this mode, it stands like DDL stands for data definition language. And this is the behavior or like what we want exactly hibernate to do when we start the application. So here we have uh, five options. First, we have create. This means that it will create the schema and destroy previous data. So you need to be careful when choosing this option. This means that every time you start the application, hibernate will create a new schema and destroy the previous data. So you, it's okay. On, on the development uh, phase or like on the early phases of uh, your application development since you don't have the schema fully implemented you can keep it as create otherwise i would say you keep it to uh, validate or to update so the next option is create a drop so create a drop it will create the schema and then at the end of the session it will destroy the schema so it will remove the whole database so it's like you don't have any database at all so we have also none. So this means that we want to disable this DDL auto and this is valid, uh, for example, in production mode, if we want to use um, a database migration tool like Flyway uh, or Liquibase to manage our database. We have update, so it will update the schema if necessary. So if we don't have a schema, it will create it. And every time we make changes, it will uh, try to update the schema if there is ch changes. And the final one is validate. So it will validate the schema and it will make no changes to the database. So assuming that we are managing our database using a database migration tool like Flyway, for example, and this option validate, it will try to compare the existing database to the representation or to the Java representation in our code. And it will validate this one. So here, let's go ahead and choose create since we are still in development mode. Also, we have other properties under JPA. So for example, we can also show the SQL queries. So here, when I choose jpa.showSQL query, uh, show SQL, here we see that by default, it's false, and then we can change it to true. So this means when we run uh, the application and we try to execute any query or any method that will interact with the database, we will see the, we will see the query displayed in the console. Then under JPA, we have also properties. And within these properties, we have hibernate and format SQL. So if we have an SQL query, if we don't add this uh, format option, it will be displayed as a full line. Otherwise, we can format this SQL query and it will be nicely displayed. So the property for this one is uh, spring JPA properties and then hibernate and then we have format SQL. So this format SQL, all we need to do is to set it to true. Also, we have another property which is available again under JPA. So it's spring.jpa. And here we have database. So it's the second option. So here, this is the target database to operate on. So it it's auto detected by default if you want to. So Hibernate will try or JPA will try to auto detect what is the database that we are using. And also we can see it here in the logs. So as mentioned here before, so here, as we can see using the dialect Hibernate dialect and then Postgres SQL dialect. So I will also copy this one and then we can even provide, provide it manually. So we can tell, uh, JPA that we are using this database to be more specific and more precise. Also, we have another option, which is called database platform. So the database platform, uh, it's also so this property specifies the hibernate dialect for the target database. So the dialect defines the specific SQL syntax and features supported by the database. In this case, we will use this one, just the one I just copied from uh, from the console and to set it to indicate that the Postgres SQL dialect should be used. So now we have everything and all the properties that we need for JPA. Now let's go back again and restart our application 
and see what will happen. So just click on start again, and let's check what will happen within our table. So first of all, if we check the log right here, so we see that since we used this show SQL true, we see that we have the SQL query right here. So this is the SQL query for creating the student table. Also, we have this format SQL true. So we have a formatted query. All right. So now if I go back and check my database in here, so select public or the schema or even the database right here and click on refresh. And here, if we expand, we see that we have one table right here. So we have a table student and the table student contains all the information or all the properties that we provided ID, first name, last name, email, and age. So the age is of type integer, same for the ID. And we have email, first name, last name of type varchar, which is the, the re SQL representation for the string type. So now let's move on and see how we can again play more and more with the hibernate on the or the annotations for our entity what if we want to change the table name so by default this entity annotation it will use the class name as a table name but what if we want to have a different one so let's say for example i want to call my table students not just student so in this case we can use the table annotation and it always comes from the jakarta.persistence package. And here we can specify the property equals name. And let's have a look on this annotation. So here it says that specifies the primary table of annotated entity. So we need to have the entity annotation. So additional tables may be specified using secondary table and so on and so forth. So here, if no table annotation is specified for an entity class, the default value applies. So here, for example, we have entity and we have the name cast, for example, for customer and the schema, we can also specify the schema. So by default, if we don't add this table annotation, it will take or the entity annotation will use the entity name or the class name as a table name. So here, let's say, for example, T underscore student, just to, ta to say table student. And if I rerun the application, we will see that the database will change and the table will be again changed. So here we see that create table, even in this SQL query, create table T underscore student. So here, if I refresh my tables, we see that we have a table now it's named the student and also we have the same columns, ID, age, email, and so on and so forth. So this is the use case of this table annotation. We also can have extra control on the different fields. So for example, if I want to change a column name, there is an annotation called column and this column annotation has a bunch of properties. So we have name and here the name of the column. So default is the property of the field name. We have unique, nullable, insertable, updatable, column definition, table, length, and so on and so forth. So here we can specify many properties for the specified column. So for example, let's start by changing the name. So for example, for this first name, I wanted to have C underscore F name, just C to say colon, and then F name. Again, like we can use the same annotation for the other fields, but let's just try on, on only one. So here, if I restart my application and check again the database, here even in the SQL query, we see that we have again C F name. So if I refresh my table right here, we see that we have the first name is now called C underscore F name as we mentioned in here. So now we have our first name named to C underscore F name. Also, we have other properties that we can specify. So in case, for example, I want to have extra or like I want to have some precision or size. So I can also use the length. So as you can see here by default, so let me make it full screen. And as you can see, the length of, uh, of a string by default is 225. So Hibernate will detect that automatically, but I can specify, for example, the length of my first name should be exactly 20 characters. And if I restart my application, 
just to recreate everything from scratch, we see that here the CF name or the colon first name, it's a type varchar and now the, the length is 20 instead of 225. You can increase it or you can even decrease it to have, for example, if you have some specific cases where you need for some specific field or colon to have a specific length. So you, you can use this property length to specify or to provide more precision to that. So here, if I, re if I refresh my table and in the columns, and again, if I go to C name, we see that the CF name is of type varchar and the length of this varchar is 20 characters. So now let's say, let's see if we want to have a unique uh, entry for specific column. So for example, for this email, we know that emails should be unique per user or per student or per person. So again, I can use the column annotation in here at this level. And here there is a property called unique and the unique is by default equals false. This means that we can have duplications for this specific column. But if we, if we uh, change it to unique true and if I restart the application and let's first check the logs, we see that we have here the email is of type varchar uh, 225. And after that, we see that we have alter table if exists, T student and add constraint. This is the constraint name. It's UK and this is a generated uh, value. And we have this unique constraint for the colon email. And again, if I refresh my table right here, let's see what are the changes that we have. So we see that we have an email right here and then we have the keys. So first we have the T student P key. P means primary and key it's uh, for key. And then we have the unique constraint applied on the email column right here. So this is what we exactly the result of this SQL query. We can also add some extra, uh, some extra properties and constraints. Let's say, for example, I have right here a private string, uh, let's say just some colon, just like that. And now I will use the colon annotation and I can specify if this some colon is insertable or updatable. Let's say, for example, let's make it updatable true. So by default, any column is updatable true by default, and then I can make it updatable false. And we have a specific or we might have a specific use case for uh, a field that should not be updatable, which is, for example, the creation date. So we can have a creation date for any field or for uh, for our entry in the database. And we want we don't want this creation date field to be updatable every time. So we can just make it updatable to false. And also we have another property, which is insertable. And by default, it's true. We can make this insertable false. So this means that we cannot create or we cannot insert value for this specific field. So now let's stick with this updatable. And here, let's again restart the application. And we will see that we might have another constraint. So here, if I refresh my table, and for the T student, we see that we have some colon, which is a varchar, and then we don't have any keys, but Hibernate will manage this automatically and will and it will make this field called some colon not updatable. In this part, we will see how we can play a bit more with the IDs. So when it comes to the identifiers of tables, and especially when we use uh, the type or the, the, the digit uh, digits type, which is integer, uh, float, double, uh, also long, and so on and so forth, we can tell Spring and uh, Hibernate to automatically generate the ID for us. And to do that, we can use an annotation, annotation called generated value. And this generated value, again, it's from Jakarta.Persistence API. And let's have a look on this annotation. So if I go to the definition of this generated value and have a look on the, on the documentation for it. So it says provides for the specification of generation strategies for the values of primary keys. So the condition here, it works only with primary keys. 
So the generated value annotation may be applied to a primary key property or field of an entity of mapped superclass in conjunction with the ID annotation. So we, we need to have the generated value always within the ID annotation. So the use of the generated value annotation is only required to be supported for the simple primary keys. Use of the generated value annotation is not supported for deriv derived primary keys. So we cannot use um, the generated value annotation on derived primary keys, for example, like strings or composed keys. So here also there is an important property, which is the generation type. So the generation type, as you can see, it's optional and it has a default value, which is auto. And then the primary key generation strategy that the persistence provider must use to generate the annotated entity primary key. And then let's have a look on the different types of the generation type. So here, if we go to the, to the enum generation type, we see that first we have table. So the table indicates that the persistence provider must assign primary keys for the entity using an underlying database table to ensure uniqueness. So this means that Hibernate will create a table within our schema and it will use that table to store the, the IDs of the entities that we want to use. Again, we have another property, which is sequence. So this indicates, indicates that the persistence provider must assign primary keys for the entity using database sequence. So database sequence, it's something related to a database and it's like, somehow like a table where we have a sequence of values. Then we have the identity. So this means that and indicates that the persistence provider must assign primary keys for an entity using database identity colon. So the database or like the provider will use a database identity colon to auto generate the IDs. Also, we have another property which is called UUID and the UUID is for unique, uh, universal unique identifier. And this indicates that the persistent provider must assign primary keys for the entity by generating an RFC of type 4122, which is a unique, uh, universal unique identifier. And finally, we have this one, this auto, which is always uh, recommended. And this indicates that the persistence provider should pick an appropriate strategy for the particular database. So this means that when we, when we set it to auto, which is the default one, Hibernate will check within the, within the database provider or the persistence provider. And in our case, for example, it's Postgres SQL, and it will choose the appropriate and the best uh, generation strategy for our database. And here there is something which is really important. So the auto generation strategy may expect a database resource to exist or it may attempt to create one. So it will attempt to create the resource. For example, let's say it uses a sequence. So the auto, uh, the auto strategy will try or will attempt to create this resource if possible. If not, it will raise an exception telling that it's not able to create this one. And for example, I can give you an example from my, pre my previous experience. So Oracle databases, they work with sequences and you need to manually create the sequence in order to use it as a generation type. So now let's go back to our code and let's restart the application and see if we have any changes. So first let's check the logs. And as you can see, first we have this hibernate uh, query that was executed, which is create sequence t student sequence starts with one and increment by 50. So here hibernate created a sequence called it t underscore student underscore sequence or seek to uh, and it starts from one and the incrementation is done by 50. And then we have the table and we have the unique constraints that we that we added. So now if I refresh again my tables. We see that we have the student and now we have one sequence package or a folder that was created. If I expand it, we see that we have a T student sequence, which is of type big int. And this is just a sequence as, as you can see in the icon right here. So now let's hit with this, uh, with the annotations that we can use within our entities. Now let's move on and see how we can persist data into the database and how we can perform uh, queries like inserting, reading, updating, deleting, and so and so forth. 
So when it comes to data persistence and to persist data in, uh, in a database, Spring provides us with a list of interfaces that we can use to simplify the life of developers. So Spring provides an interface called repository and this interface is extended by multiple other interfaces. And we have here, for example, we have this repository and we have the crude repository and list crude repository. And also on the left hand side, we have the paging and sorting repository and list paging and sorting repository. And all of them, like the, the basic one or like the first one is JPA repository, which extends all these interfaces. So if you extend or if you use the JPA interface or the JPA repository interface, you have access to all these interfaces right here. And all we need to do in order to access or to have a data access layer in our application is to create an interface and extend one of these five interfaces that we see right here, which is whether JPA repository, list crude, list paging and sorting, crude repository or paging and sorting repository. So each one of them comes with a list of methods, predefined methods that we can use to operate or to, to execute some SQL queries. So the JPA repository, uh, is designed to simplify the development of access layer code by abstracting away the common data persistent operations. So it provides methods such as save, find one, find all, delete, and more. Allowing you to interact with the underlying database without writing explicit SQL queries. So this is the important thing and the important part of using JPA repositories or using the repositories from the Spring Data JPA. And the JPA repository interface comes with some features. First, we have the CRUD operations. CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete which inherits from the basic CRUD operations from these interfaces we see right here, enabling you to perform standard database operations like saving entities, retrieving entities by ID, deleting and finding all entities and so and so forth. Also, we have query methods. So JPA repository supports the creation of query methods based on method names. By following naming convention, you can define method signature that automatically generate the appropriate SQL queries. For example, if we want to have a method for a find uh, by first name and we provide the string first name as a parameter or find all by age uh, greater than int age and so and so forth. So this can be implemented without writing explicit queries. And we will see later on by example, how we can implement this. Also, we have the derived query methods. So along with query method based on method names, JPA repository supports the creation of more complex queries using derived query methods. So this method derive the query based on the structure of the method signature and the names of the parameters. So this allows you to define queries with conditions and join multiple entities together. We can also have a custom query definition. So in addition to the query method, the JPA repository allows you to define custom queries using the at query annotation or the query annotation. And you can write J JPQL, which is the Java persistence query language or native SQL queries and map the query result to the entity or a custom DTO that you want to return. So by utilizing this, the features provided by the JPA repository, you can significantly reduce the amount of boilerplate code required for data access operations and leverage the power of query derivation and handle pagi pagination and sorting with ease in your Spring Data JPA based application. So now let's move on and see in action how we can create uh, repositories and how we can generate methods and how we can even persist data. To create a repository, all we need to do is to create a new interface. So select new and then Java class and select interface right here. And let's call our interface student repository. So in this way, we are creating a new interface and to transform this student repository interface to a JPA repository, all we need to do is to extend the JPA repository. And the JPA repository is a generic 
uh, interface and let's see here click always on download source to see everything and all the source code and here we see that we have a t and id so the t represents the entity and the id represents the identifier of our entity so let's go back here and provide these types so here this is a jpa repository for our student entity okay so this is like from the name but here like our goal is to create a repository for our student object so select the student here and then comma and the type of the id so in our case the type of our I unique ID of this student table is integer as you see, as you can see here. So we have integer ID annotated with the ID annotation. So this is how you can identify or you can check the ID. And that's it. That's pretty much it. And here even you don't need to add any repository or any component annotation because Spring Data JPA will automatically understand that this is a repository and it will transform this uh, this interface to to a managed bean or to a component or to a repository. All these names are valid for the JPA repository. So now let's move on and use this JPA repository and try to persist some data. Now, in order to use this student repository, all we need to do is to inject it somewhere in some class or in another spring bean and let's inject it in this first controller so i will make it full screen and here i can also even clean up this one and here i will create a private final student repository and let's call it repository or even student repository and then we need to generate of course a constructor parameter and here we see that we will use the constructor injection. So as I mentioned before, we no longer need to use the auto wired annotation. So here we have our repository available and now we can just use it. So here in, in this post method, so let's say slash students and like to follow the namings. So now we have our first controller and I want to use the post for the post mapping slash student. And here as a request body, let's change this one to type student okay so here we have the student and, and i will just rename this one to student so then it will not return a string but i wanted to return the student object instead so here it will return the student so I will, we will go back to this later on and here all we need to do after receiving the student object all we need to do is to call the repository instance that we created and then we have a method called save so the save it takes an s of type entity so here if i pass student so this means that the student will be persisted and as you can see this method it will t it takes the entity as parameter and it will return the same entity or the saved one so all like all i need to do is to just return repository dot save and now let's start the application and go to postman and start this and test this method. So this is our postman interface again. Let's change the URL to students. And then we have a body and for the body, it will be exactly the same way as the student object right here. So we need the first name, last name, email and age. So first name, last name, email and age. And I will copy these ones and then I will just create an object of type student. So let me remove this and then adding the columns everywhere. So here and also for the age and here for the first name, let's say Ali. And for the last name, let's say Bu Ali. And for the email, so this is my email if you want to get in touch with me. So it's contact at alibucoding.com and the age, let's say i'm 34 years old i'm getting old but it's totally fine so here we have our json representation for the student object now if i click on send let's see what will happen so first we see that we have this 200 okay and we persisted our object and now we have the id equals one so if i go back to my database click on here let's refresh the tables and if I open this student, we see that we have an object that, that got persisted in the database. So here we still have this uh, some colon 
colon that we added, but we can ignore it for the moment. And here we see that we have the object or the user or the student that we just inserted. So let's go ahead and insert another one and see the changes. So here, let's say John, John Doe. And here, for example, let's say John at alibucoding.com and let's leave the age as it was and hit enter. So here we see that we have a different ID and we return the saved object. So if I go back to my database and refresh, so here you have the icon to refresh or to, to reload the page. And now we see that we have this user again inserted. So here let's just check again um, our entity and we see that the email is unique. Okay, so now if I go back to Postman and try to insert the same object, click on send and we see that we have a 500 internal server error. So if I go back to IntelliJ and inspect this one, let's see the type of the exception. So here we see that we have an error, duplicate key value violates, unique constraint for this constraint that we created before. So just to remind you, this is the constraint that we created for the unicity of the email. So it's this one. And now we see the exception that we have a violation. And even we have more details, it says that the key email, like the field called email, and the value john at alibucoding.com already exists. So Hibernate is performing all the checks and checking that the email should be unique within our database. So this is how we can persist an entity. Now let's see how we can update an entity and how we can delete, fetch all, and the operations that we can use. Now let's implement another method that will return a student by its ID. So here we have student and then I will pass as a path variable and let's say student dash ID and here it will return just a single student. So let's change the type and here find student by ID. So this will be the method name and of course we need our path variable and here let's call it student dash ID and then integer ID. So here we have our method ready. And now all we need to do is to use the method find by ID. And here this find by ID, it will return an optional of type student. So here let's pass first the ID and then let's say or else, for example, null. Okay, so if we don't find the student with the specified ID, it will return a null object or let's say even some new student. Okay, like an empty student object. So let's restart the application and let's go to our postman and try to test this endpoint. So first let's insert uh, an object or like few a few elements. So this one and this one, and we have three elements. So here, if I test again the slash student, we see that we are returning three elements with the specified uh, objects and values that we provided. And now if I say slash student slash one, so it should return this first object. And if I click on send, so we see that we have only one object. And here before it was a list, so just to make sure. And as you can see, it's a list in here and it's a list of objects. So now slash students slash one. And if I try to find an object that does not exist, so for example, a student with the ID number 10, which we don't have in the database, we see that we have an empty object with null values. And this because when we retrieved the, the student, we say or else new student, or we can just say or else null or whatever you want. So this is how we can retrieve. And this is the, the method find by ID that we can use to retrieve an object by its ID. So now in the next part, let's see how we can create a custom query and for example, find a student by the first name. Now let's see how we can retrieve the list of students that are persisted in the database. So I will duplicate first of all this method and instead of post, I will just use get. So here it will be get mapping and I will use the same URL students and here like I will say find all students and here instead of returning a single student 
I need to return a list of students. So here I will use list as a return type and then I will just give it the type student. So here list of students and here we don't have any request body since it's a get and we don't have any parameters and now instead of saving we have a method called find all. So this find all method will return all the students that we have in the database. So let's restart the application and go to our postman and test this one. So opening postman, first I need to persist few data. So this is the first one, second one, and let's say this is the third one. And again, I will duplicate this tab. And here I will change this one to a get and I don't have a body. And all I need to do is to click on send. So here we see that we have this 200 OK. And we see that we are fetching and displaying all the students or all the objects that we have persisted in the, in the database. So it's Ali Bu Ali, and we see that the email is changing. And this is contact one and contact 31, the one that we just inserted. So this is how we can retrieve data from the database. And as you can see here, I did not create any SQL query for that. But all these methods, they come from the Spring Data JPA or from the JPA repository that we extended right here. So if I open this one, we see that we have a bunch of method right here. And even this find all, it comes from other uh, from other interfaces. So here we have the save all, we have this find all method that we just used. So click on download source. And this is all the methods that are available. So let's see more and more methods and try to perform the CRUD operation. So then, so here we have the create and you have the read here. So let's check the delete operation and the update operation. So again, let's duplicate this method right here. And here it will be slash student slash search, for example, and then let's say student name. Okay, so here it will return also a list of students. So we'll just copy this one and replace it in here. So here we will say find students by first name or by name. It's also okay. And here we need student name instead of student ID and the type should be of type string. But here, as we can see, we don't have any method that will return uh, a student by name or by first name. So what we need to do, we need to go to our student repository right here. And let me show you how we can create a method that can filter or behind that hibernate will generate the query for, for us. So what we want to do is searching for the list of students. So first we need to provide the type, which is list and the, uh, the object, which is our entity or a DTU or any other object that hibernate can be able to map it. So we have list of student and then our method should start find all by and find all because we want to have a list. If for example, we just, we want to return only a single student, we can use find by instead. Okay. But in this case, we want to use find all by and then after the find all by, all I need to do is to specify the colon name, like the Java colon name, like from the class that I want to use it as a filter. So for example, here I want to use first name. So you don't use the C underscore F name, but you use the Java field of the Java class. Okay. So I want to use the first name as my filter. So all you need to do is to use a capital letter for the first uh, for the field name. So as you can see here already IntelliJ. So this this uh, is part of the ultimate version, this auto completion. And as you can see, Hibernate, uh, sorry, IntelliJ is already suggesting first name as a filter. Okay, so now I say first name. And also I can add like, okay, so this means that the first name contains this value, or I can say containing. So containing, this means any string I pass, it should be part of the first name. So for example, if I have a first name Ali, if I pass just L, it should return and filter all the students containing this L letter. So here, all I need to do is to pass my string P 
so here I uh, p mean, uh, means parameter so I'm um, on purpose I mentioned p because I don't you don't need to specify first name for example so because the type what really matters so the type of the first name here should match the type of the parameter that you are passing right here okay so now we have our method let's go back to our controller and call this method to return the list of students so here we have find all by and here we have first name containing and then when we start the application and when we execute the query we will see what is the output of this query so here instead of this string id let me just change it to name and here pass name as a parameter now if i restart the application and let's go back to postman so here i can clean the console so we can see the query that will get executed i will go back to postman first i need to insert some data so this is the first one and let's call the second one john and let's call uh cole for example and now let's go back in here and now instead of passing this um, this id i can pass for example slash ali okay and if i click on send we see that first we have a bad request let's check why we have that so we have a bad request because in IntelliJ here when we created this method we added slash search and with within the ali and the object or the value ali so spring is trying to map the ali to an integer and as we can see here let's check the exception and it will say that it was not able to map or to convert the value ali to an integer id so now let's go back to uh, to our IntelliJ and also i need to insert some other uh, data and here let's click on send and then also john for example and let's change this and click on send again because i guess i uh, it was it was not inserted before so now if i go back to slash students slash search and now if i pass ali as a parameter and click on send so we see that we have a list containing this object which is Ali, Bo Ali, and so on and so forth. Now let's go back to the console and see the query that was generated. So here we have select and we have the fields from student where the CF name, so Hibernate was automatically capable of transforming this first name to use the colon called C underscore F name. And here we have like and then so this is the value because it's an interrogation mark and then escape the the backslashes so this for example in case we pass a backslash as a value so this is the query that was generated behind and all this came from just this method that we created right here so we just told spring data jpa to search the list of students by first name containing so any first name or like the first name contains a, the a portion of the string that we pass right here all right so now you understand how we can create queries now let's move on and see how we can delete objects for example now let's create another method to delete a student so here i will use a delete mapping and then for the delete, for the delete mapping it will be slash students slash and then i will need the student id so it will be student dash ID and then I will have a public void and then I will call it delete. So here, of course, we need our path variable and then let's call it student ID as we mentioned before. And then I will need the integer ID. And all we need to do is to call our repository dot delete. And then we have a, a method to delete whether to pass the whole student entity or just delete by id so the delete by id we can just pass the id and here we can also use as explained before the response status annotation and here for example let's say accepted or or just okay so for example let's say http status and of course we need to import the http status so now let's restart the application and let's go ahead and try deleting student by the ID. So now the application is up and running again. So let's go back to Postman. And of course I need to insert some students and I will insert another one. So here we have two students. 
Also, let's check in the database. So let's open the student table and we see here that we have two students created. And now if I try to delete the second one or the student with the ID number two, let's see what will happen. So now let's duplicate this tab. So duplicate tab. And then instead of post, I want to send a delete and then slash student slash two. And all I need is to do is to click send. And we see that we have 200 OK. And also let's go back and check in the database. So if I refresh, we see that the student with the ID number two was successfully deleted. All right, so we performed all the CRUD operations. We saw how to filter. We saw how to create um, a custom method using the JPA repository. And now let's see how we can perform and add relationships to our entity. So here we have our student entity and let's try to create other entities which will have some relation and mapping between them. So in order to uh, create mappings and relationships with different entities, first we need to create the entities that we want to, uh, to create the mapping for. So here let's assume that a student is part of a school or studies in a school and a student has a profile. So first let's start with creating uh, the entity school. So I will create an entity called school. And then of course we need the entity annotation. So we don't need the table because we can leave it just to school. And then we need the ID. So this is will be the identifier and then generated value. And let's say private integer ID. So this will be the ID of the school. And simply let's say this school has a string school name or just a name. Okay, so this is our school entity. And of course we need to generate getters and setters. So let's select both of them and generate getters and setters for the ID and the name. And also let's generate a constructor. And this constructor, we can say a constructor using just the name and another empty constructor, because if you remember, we need that. So here we have our school entity ready. Now let's move on and create the profile entity. And then we will start implementing relationships. Now let's create the other entity, which is will be the student profile. So the student profile, again, we need the entity annotation and we need also the ID. So this will be the identifier and it will be a generated value managed by Hibernate. And then we will need a private integer ID. And then let's say the, the student has a private string bio. So this will be like just a bio or a description for the student. We can also add many other fields for the profile. But for now, let's just keep it simple and let's generate now getters and setters. So let's select both of them. And then again, let's generate a constructor. Let's generate an empty one. And let's also generate a constructor using the bio. So we can just create or in, uh, instantiate a user uh, student profile just using the bio. So now we have our student profile and to end school ready to use. Let's move on and understand the class diagram that we need to implement and the relationships between these three entities. This is how our class diagram looks like. So as mentioned before, we have one student and a student has a student profile. So the student has only one profile. So that's why we see a one to one relationship between the student and the student profile. And then a student studies in one school. So here that's that's why we have a relation from the student to the school, which is mapped with the one right here. And then the school has many students. So one school has zero or many students. So this means that we can have a school, but without any students yet. But what if we have a student, the student should be assigned to one school. So this is how our class diagram looks like. Now let's start implementing the relationship between these three entities. And we will start with student and student profile, which will be a one to one relationship. Now let's create the first mapping one to one between the student and the student profile. So I will move this to the right. So I'm going to split it and move it to the right to have both classes open at the same time. So first what we need to do. So let me first remove this column because we don't need it anymore. And first thing we need to do is to create an object 
or a field of type student profile inside the student class. So let's go ahead, private student profile, and let's call it student profile. Okay, now in the from the other side, we need also to create a, an object or a field of type student in the student profile, but we will come back to this just in a few moments. So now to declare and to tell Hibernate that this is a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the student and the student profile, all we need to do is to add the one-to-one -one annotation. And this one-to-one -one annotation comes with some properties. First, we need the property mapped by, and this mapped by should reference to the field of type student in the student profile. So let's say here student, and then I will explain later on. And that's it. So here we have one to one, and also we can add the cascade type, a cascade type dot all. So this means this cascading type. This means if I perform or if I delete a student, this means automatically I will remove the student profile at the same time without even performing a delete operation on the student profile itself. Now, from the other hand, on the student profile, I need to create a field of type student. So here, let's call it student. And here, be careful, this student should be exactly the same as the object mapped by because the mapped by will look for an object of type student called student. So for example, just an example, if I say ST, and I start the application, so the application will fail because here in the student profile, we don't have any attribute or a field called student. So you need to be careful about this one. And then we need to add a one to one annotation also from this side. And now let's define where to add the join column. So this means because you know, in class diagrams, when we have a relationship, we need to have a foreign key in one of the tables. So here, our primary entity is student, and then we have the student profile. So we can create a student, but we can skip and update the student profile later on. So this means that the student is the primary entity and the student profile is the secondary one. So in this case, we need to add the join column annotation. So here we have a join column. So this means that we want to declare a join column. Let's give it a name. For example, student underscore ID. So this means that when we start the application, we will have an extra field in the student profile class or table having the name student ID. So let's start the application and check that. All right, so the application is up and running. Let's check the logs first of all. So here we have, first we are creating the school, uh, the table school. So this, we will come back to this one later on. And then we have a student profile. And after that, we have the table called T student. So here for the student, we have the primary key, which is the ID. And in here, we have the student profile. And the student profile, we see that Hibernate created a new field called student ID and it chose an integer as the type. So the integer, it chose it from the ID or the ID type of our student class. So now let's go back, let's go ahead and check the tables right here. So if I refresh, we see that we have three tables. So here, if I open the student profile, we see that we have one foreign key. And if I expand this one, we see that we have this foreign key with this constraint. So FK for foreign key, and this is the key or the ID for this foreign key. And this one, it's the field student underscore ID, which is the field that we defined already. And it refers the table called T underscore student with the ID or the field or the primary key called ID. So in this way, we performed or we created our first relationship one-to-one -one between student and student profile. So now let's go ahead and create the mapping between the student and the school. All right, now let's move on and create the relationship between the school and the student. So we said that the relationship between the school and the student is one to many. This means that the school has many students and a student can study in one school. So let's start from the school side. Here we need to create, first of all, a list of students. So because 
here we have one school can figure out many times in one uh, in multiple students so this means like this the school has multiple students so i will create a list of students let's call it students and then we need to add the annotation one to many so this means one school can figure out or can be uh, or can exist in many students lines or many students row in the students table that's how or that's why that's how we can determine what is the type or which annotation to use so then within the one to many we need an uh, the attribute mapped by and the mapped by should be exactly the same like the one to one should be for example in this case school and the school should be an attribute of type school in the student dot java class or the student entity so the first thing is to create a list of students when we have a one to many so here from the school side just as i mentioned before we have a list of students and then this list of students so anytime or every time you have a list here just go ahead and don't think twice and use the one to many annotation and also use the mapped by attribute to map this list of students to the school from the other side. And of course, let's not forget to generate getters and setters. So let's generate getters and setters for the, for the students. Let's click OK. And now we have students, getters and setters. So let me just move them to the bottom. And now we have our student list. So this is how we can create a one to many mapping. So now let's move on and create the many to one mapping from the other side. So now let's perform the, the link and the mapping from the student side. So here, let's create a private school field. Let's call it school as exactly the name right here. So then semicolon and here. So this means that we have many students to one school. So many students can study in one school. And every time you have the many to one annotation, always think about adding the join colon so here let's give it a name so here let's say school id school underscore id so now if i restart the application we will see all the changes that we will have within our database and of course let's not forget generating getters and setters so i will generate the getters and setter and also the student profile which i guess we forgot the last time so let's click ok and also let me move them to the bottom and now let's restart our application and see the changes so here first we can also check the check the logs so here we have alter table student profile if not exist and then we have alter table the student and we are adding all the references and the links and the relationships so here let's open this again and let's refresh the tables so we see that we still have three tables, but let's let's check now the school, uh, sorry, the student table. We see that we have two foreign keys. So here we have the T, uh, two keys for it, sorry. And then we have one foreign key, which is this one, which is called school ID. And it's referencing the school and the ID from the school entity. And here from the school, we have again the ID and the name, and we don't have any other foreign keys because the foreign key belongs to the student table and the same here for the student profile we have again our student id which is reference the t student id so like this we are able and this is how we can perform and create mappings between the different entities using annotations from the jpa and hypernate and using spring data jpa now let's move on and see how we can insert data before we move on to implement the controllers, let me first show you a way how you can check that you implemented correctly the mappings between the different entities. So here, open the database and let me make it a bit full screen. And then on the, on the schema that you have or the database that you created, right click and then you have this diagram menu and then you can click on show diagram. So here, it will show maybe two options maybe not for you but click on database schema if it shows the diagram type so then let me close this one we see here that we have 
to the three tables that we already created. We have the student, we have the school, and we have the student profile. So let me just organize a little bit. And here, let's move this one. And then also you have this, uh, this link right here. And then when we make, when you make, for example, like when, when you move entities and so on and so forth, and to organize these lines right here, all you need to do is to click on apply current layout and it will adjust itself in a smooth way. So here we have our student table, which also named T underscore student. And also if you highlight it, you will see also the, um, the script or the SQL script for it. And then we have here the student profile and you see that we have the student ID as a foreign key. So the, the primary key will be with, uh, with this golden key and the foreign key, which it will be with blue one and the same here for the student. And we see also that we have the school. So now let's move on and start creating the controllers for the, the school. And let's implement few methods to insert some school and then insert students and assign them to a school and see how we can do that. Now let's create our school controller. So right click and then a new Java class and let's call it school controller. And then of course we need our rest controller annotation. And now let's create our first post mapping and then it will be slash schools. And then it, we have a public school and it will be create or save for example. And here we have our request body. And then we need the school object. So request body, it will be object of type school. And then let's name it school. So after that, we need, of course, to inject our repository. So it will be private final school repository, which we don't have for, for the moment, but we will create it in just a few seconds. And let's call it school repository. And now, even if you don't have it, so here, just highlight it and use the auto completion and it will suggest to you to create a class school repository or an interface or enum and so on and so forth. So in our case, we want to create an interface school repository and we want to create it in the same package. So let's just hit enter. And here we just made a typo. So let's rename this one. So let's call it school repository. And then of course we need to extend the JPA repository and we need to pass the school as an object and integer for the ID. Then let's go back to our controller. And here we need, of course, to add a constructor. So let me make this one full screen. And now we have our school repository and now we can use it. So here in this method, all we need to do is just return school repository dot save school, not save all, just save. And then the school that we get as a parameter. So then I will just duplicate this one. And instead of a post mapping, I will create a get mapping. So now you are familiar how we create controllers, how we return objects and so on and so forth. So we don't have any body and we need to return a list of schools. So here we have a list and then let's import this list and then let's say find all. And here instead of save, let's say find all. All right. Now let's start the application and insert some schools. And since we also have our student controller, which is already named uh, first controller. So let's go ahead and just rename it and call it student controller to be consistent. So now let's start the application and go to postman and start our new API and see how we can insert schools and assign students to schools. So our application is up and running. Now let's move to Postman and test the, the school controller and try to insert some schools. And then let's go and insert also some students. Now let's duplicate this tab. And then instead of students, it will be schools. And in the body, we will need only one attribute, which is the name. So let's just change this one and let's call it Alibu school. And here, all I need to do is to click on send. 
and here we see that we have a 200 OK. So this means that the school was inserted and we see that we have the ID and the student. For now, it's not because we don't have any students assigned to this school yet. Also, let's go to the database and check that. So here, if I refresh my database and open the school table, we see that we have the school that we just inserted called Alibu School. Now, if I want to insert a student, so let's see the structure we have right here. We have the first name, last name, email, and age, and also we have an object called school. So let's go to Postman and Structure and create an object of type student to insert the student and assign it to the school that we just created. So here, let's go back to the first tab where we have the school, the students to insert. And here, I, all I need to do is to add another attribute of type school. And this one is an object. So here, and all I need to provide is the ID because Spring Data JPA uses the ID to insert an object. As you can see, the school that we inserted has the ID equals one. So this is all we need to provide. So here we have the school and the ID, you can also provide the name and so on and so forth, but it will not affect anything because Hibernate and Spring Data JPA only needs the ID. So now let's, cl let's click on send. And we see now this is the result. So first we have a 200 OK. And here we have the ID with the first name, last name, and the student profile for now it's null. And we see that we have the school, which is ID equals one name student, and the name and the student is null. So this is also is not a problem. Now if I go back and duplicate the school request and change it to a get, and of course for the body we don't have anything and I click on send and here we see that we don't have a response yet and this is because here we have let's let's understand the structure let's go back to the code and let me open the student and the school so here we have the school object and the school object it has a list of students okay and then it will try to get the school and the students list and then from the student it will try also to load the school information and then it will go back to the school and it will try to load the list of students and so on and so forth. So we have here an infinite loop and this is because Hibernate will, will try to load all the information altogether. So let me show you how we can fix that. Before fixing the problem, let's have a look on the exception. So here I will use this uh, soft wrap just to have everything wrapped. And here we see that we have this main exception and failure trying to resolve exception from this uh, Spring Framework and call send error after this response. And this means that we encounter, encountered uh, an infinite recursion with the, with the JSON mapping. So here when Jackson tries to map the, the object, so when it tries to map or to transform or to create a JSON response for the school, it has a list of student. And then as I explained before, it will go to the student and then the student has also an object of type school. So it will try also to, um, to serialize the school and back again. So we have an infinite recursion loop, so or an infinite loop. And let me show you how we can fix that using the Jackson annotations. So for this one, we will be using two annotations, one on the parent level and the second one on the, chi on the child level. So the, the parent level is where we have the list. So the school is the parent of the students. I'm gonna make this one full screen. And here on the list level, we, we need to use an annotation called JSON managed reference. And this JSON managed reference so this tells Jackson that the parent is in charge of serializing the child and it prevents the child from trying to serialize the parent. Now, so we need the JSON managed reference on the parent level and then we need to go to the child level which is the student right here and we need to go to the field of type school and here we need an annotation called JSON back reference. So this is the back reference or this will tell that this entity, the student entity or the student object doesn't need to serialize the parent, which is in our, in our case, the school. So now let's restart the application again and let's go back to Postman and try to insert the data once again. So here the application is up and running. So also let me 
keep it like this. I will clean up the console. So here again, we need to insert the school and insert the student and assign it to the school. And now if I try to fetch all schools and I click on send, we see that we have a response and we have the status 200 okay. And here we see that we have the ID and the school name, and then we have the list of the students. So for example, if I insert a new student, so here let's say uh, contact two and within the same school ID, and here let's say Ali Bo Ali, and I will click on send. So the school, the student is correctly inserted. And now if I fetch again the list of schools, we see that we have the school with the ID number one, and we have the list of students. We have this ID two, it's the student we just inserted, and we have the first one, which is John Bo Ali, and with this email address. So now we have our application functioning, but there is one thing which is a little bit uh, not okay with all that is because we are exposing almost everything and even when we want to insert a student we have or we need to provide the full school object and imagine that we have other relationships within the school within the student like for example the student profile and imagine we have subjects and so on and so forth so this will make our object or our student object more and more complex and it will prevent us and it will add more complexity when we want to save or to interact with the student entity. So this is introducing us to a really important topic. We will see just in a few moments. So let's move on and ex explore the next topic of our course. DTO stands for data transfer object, which is a pattern often used in software design. The main purpose of a DTO is to encapsulate and structure data that needs to be transferred between different parts of a system or different systems entirely. A DTO typically includes only simple data fields or also called attributes and lacks the behavior of the model or entity it represents. So here, if we take the example of our application, we have a student and we have a school, we have also a student profile, which will hold some sensitive information about the student, like the address, like phone number, date of birth, and so and so forth. And mainly, we don't need to expose this information to the outside world. And also even, for example, if you want to retrieve the, retrieve the information of the school, we only need to expose the school information. And since these information are represented by entities and stored into a database system, which, which is a secured system, so we need to expose only what the user or the end user is expecting and no more extra information. So for example, as I mentioned, for the user, with, for the student, we don't need to expose uh, sensitive information such as address, date of birth, phone number, even if, if, the, if the student has a password, so we don't need to expose that. So then what we need to do, we need to include a, a, a mechanism in the middle, in between, between the entity itself and the outside world. So we need to, to add a mapper and this mapper is just a simple mechanism. You can use many implementation or many tools and libraries to map objects. And then if we use a mapper, we can have multiple representations for the same object. For example, for the student, we can have a representation one only to expose first name, last name, and we can have another representation to expose or to receive data from the outside world in order to create a new student. And for example, we need only first name, last name, and email, and so and so forth. So this is one of the advantages is we can have multiple representations for only one object or only one entity. And this also applicable for school, student, or the student profile in our case. And generally speaking, it's applicable to any kind of entity. And the REST API should communicate with the client through these representations. And we can have one representation for the read and other representation for the write. For example, to create a student, we can have one representation which holds the information or like the minimum required information to create a student. And for the read represent representation, we can have a different one or a different object that will be responsible for exposing only the necessary 
and non-sensitive information to the outside world. So when building a RESTful API, DTOs play a crucial role. And now let's give you some reasons why they are important. First of all, we have data separation. So the data transfer object pattern helps to separate the internal domain model from what is exposed, exposed through the API. This way, you can change your internal model without affecting the external representation. It also helps in not exposing, exposing sensitive or unnecessary data to the API customers. Then abstraction. DTOs provide an abstraction layer. They give you a clear structure of what your API will provide to the client, abstracting the complexity of the domain model. Then performance improvements. Instead of sending entire entities over the network, you can instead send a DTOs which include only the necessary information. This can significantly improve the performance of your API as you can control the size of your response payload. Then we have flexibility. Since DTOs are separate from your domain model, they allow you to tailor your API response to exactly what your client need, even if that does not exactly match your domain model. And here we are talking about multiple representations for the same object. And finally, versioning. So DTOs make it easier to maintain different versions of your API. By using different sets of DTOs, you can support multiple versions of an API simultaneously. And then in the next part, we will see how we can use this DTO pattern in our application. Now let's go ahead and create a new object that will represent a student request, for example. So let's start with the student. And here we have in our student controller, we have the bunch of methods that we created to persist a student, to fetch a student, and so and so forth. Now, let's see what are the changes that we need to apply after creating our student DTO object. So I will close everything. And here, right click and then new and then Java class. And for this example, and for the DTOs, we will be using records, as I explained before, what is the difference between records and normal POJOs. So let's say student DTO, for example. And here for this student DTO, it will be a similar representation to the entity itself. So here, to create a student, we need the first name, we need the last name, and we need, let's say, just the email and the age is not mandatory to create a new student. So I will copy these fields right here. I will copy them and then let's paste them in the student DTO. So here I will just paste these fields and they will add the comma. And now we have our record ready to use. So also, since we have a relationship within the school, so a student is linked to a school, all we need to do is to pass a school ID instead of the whole object. So let's imagine that the information we have within the school is uh, address, uh, location, and like a bench, a bunch of information about the school, but for hibernate and for persisting the data, all we need to do is the ID of the entity. So here within the student DTO, after the email, I will add also an integer school ID. So I will create an object and then we call it school ID like this. So now we have our student record or student object ready to use. Now let's move on and create an object for uh, for school also also. And let me show you how we can use these DTOs to persist data and to send back information. So now if I close all these classes right here, and if I go back to the student controller, let me make it full screen. And here in the post mapping or when we want to create a student. So here we are requesting an object of type student, which is our entity. But let's change this. And instead of requesting the student uh, entity, let's request a student DTO object. So now we are asking the, the the rest client to send a student DTO, which is represented by the first name, last name, and an, and then field called school ID, which represents the identifier of our school. 
So then we see that the repository.safe is now not working because here it's expecting a type student and we are passing a student DTO. So here, as you can see in this error message, so inferred type S of type parameter S is not within its bound. So it should extend com.adibu.example.student. So we need to pass an object of type student. So now let's see how we can use this DTO to save an object. So as we explained before, here we need to transform this student DTO object to a student object. So here, let me just let me create a private student method and let's call it to student. Okay. And this to student method will receive exactly this object. So let's call it DTO right here just for clarity. And here what I will do, I will create a var student equals new student. So here I just have a new student. So I can use also this constructor that we that we created before, or we can use the getters and setters. So it's actually up to you to choose which way you want. But let's go ahead with with setters and getters. So here let's say student dot set first name. And then the first name is the one coming from the DTO dot get or dot first name. And then we have student dot last name. So here it's a set instead of a get. And then we need the DTO dot last last name. And then we have student dot set email. And then again from the DTO dot get email. So here it's not a get like within records, we don't have gets, but we have methods representing like with the field name. So now we have all the three fields that we specified for this student DTO, first name, last name, email. And now we need to set an object of type school and link it to this student object. So here I will create a var school equals new school. And then for this school, I can just use DTO and just set the ID. So here just school and then DTO so here I need to set the ID, sorry. So it will be my DTO dot school ID. So here I have, or I prepared my school object. Now I need to assign the school object to the student. So here I will say student dot set school, and then the school object I just created right now. So now we have our two student method. So again, let's just return the student object. So here we have our two student method. So all I need to do here is just replacing this method call right here. So we'll create a variable and here I will just rename this one to DTO or student DTO. You can name it as you want. And here I will create a var student equals to student from my DTO. Okay. And like this, I will be able to persist the data. Okay. So let's go ahead and try this. So now the application is up and running. Also, I will just do a, a small change here in the application.yaml instead of using create drop, I will use just update. So because I don't want to lose the data each time I restart the application and now I will just restart again and let's go ahead to postman and try to create a new student. So here in postman, first we need to create a school. So let's just send this one and we have the ID number one. And here we have the, the method that will allow me to create a new student. Okay. So it's a post and then student. So here we said that we no longer need the age since it's just a requirement from us. And here, instead of passing the school object, all I need to do is to pass a school ID right here. And this school ID, I will give it the name one, uh, sorry, value, not name. And then let's click on send and see what will happen. So here we have 200. Okay. So this means that the student was persisted and it was linked to the school that we recently created. So let's go back to the, to our database and check if we have everything persisted and working as before. So here, let's go to the database. Let's refresh. And then here we have our school. And if I open the student, we see that I have the student that I just created with the name Ali Bo Ali, and we have also the school ID equals one. So like this, we saw that we using the DTO, we are no longer requiring all the information or all the fields from all 
from the entity, but it's just a representation that suits our need. But we still have one small issue. We are returning again the student object. So we are returning or exposing the student entity. And here, as you can see in Postman and the response, we have the age which we don't want uh, to expose and also have this object uh, student profile, which is null and so on and so forth. Also, we have the ID and maybe we don't want to expose that. So now let's see how, which DTO we need to create in order to return a proper, uh, a proper object and a proper response to the user. So now let's create another record and it, with this one we will call it, so it's a record and we will call it student response or student representation DTO. So let's say student response DTO and exactly as we did right here. So we need the first name, last name and email, for example. So these are the information that we want to expose to the end user or to the to our client, uh, to our REST client. So let me stop the application. And here all I need to do, I need to go back to my controller. And then instead of returning a student, I would return a student response DTO. Okay. But here again, we see that this repository.save is returning a student object and I need to return another type. So again, we need another method, method right here. So we need a private student response DTO and let's say to student response DTO. And this to student response DTO should receive student object as a parameter. Okay. And then all I need to do is return new student response DTO and then I need to pass all the information that I need. So it will be student dot get first name. And then so let me inline this one. So it will be student dot get first name and then student dot last name and finally student dot get email. And like this we have our student response DTO and here semicolon and now we have our representation ready. So here I will say just var saved student equals this one or like the result of saving the student. And, the, and then all I need to do is to return to student response from the saved student. And like this, I have again a new object or a new representation of the response that I want to expose to the customer or to my REST client. So let's go ahead and start the application and let's try this out. So now if I go back to Postman and let me duplicate this tab and let's use a get in here and let's search student by its ID. So let's say for example, student slash one or let's save another student again and we will come back to that method later on. So here, for example, if I say Ali or like John Doe and here let's say it's John dot uh, at alibucoding.com and now if I click on send we see that we have the response or a different response from our backend and we do not expose extra information. So here the response is really encapsulated and an abstract response without any further information that we should not expose to the outside world. So here we are exposing only the necessary information. Even if you see, for example, that this email is a sensitive information, all you need to do is just remove it from the DTO and adjust the mapping. Now for our school object, let's create a DTO for that. So again, just new and then record, let's say school DTO. And here in this record, all we need to do is a string name. So or string school name, you can name it as you want. So now we have our school DTO record or school DTO object. And we can use this one now in the school controller in order to save and expose information about our schools. So again, let's move, go ahead and implement that. Let's now introduce all the necessary changes to our school controller in order to receive a school DTO and expose also a school DTO. So here, let's check back again. Here, if I go back to Postman and let me start the application, I will explain to you what I mean. So now if I go back to Postman and here, if this is the, the school or like to retrieve the school with all the students, we see how we see here that we have the information of the school 
and we have the list of the students. So now it's it's okay to have it like this because in this case and so far we have only two students assigned to this uh, to this school. But imagine the case we have hundreds and even thousands of students assigned to the same school. When you request the information or like you need just a light information about the school, we will be loading the school and all the students. And imagine also we have other relationships for the students and like the response will be really, really heavy and it will take time until it gets from the backend to the rest client. So what we need to do again, we need to just use DTOs and expose only the information that we need. And I will then show you how we can expose or like fetch the students for a specific school. So now let's go back to our code and let's adjust our controller to only expose and receive all the only the necessary information for the school object. So here for the post mapping or to create a school, first I need to return a school DTO. Again, I just want to remind you that the school DTO takes only as a parameter the school name. And then here we also need to get a school DTO as an input or as a request body. So here all I need to do is just to have var school. So here let's call this one DTO and school equals to school. For example, because I need a method that should do or make uh, or perform the mapping and the object transformation from school DTO to an object school. So here we don't have yet this method. So let's create a method school in school controller. So here it should return school and that's it. So now all I need to do is just return a new school. And for this new school, it will be DTO.name since our school contains only one attribute, which is this one. And we don't really need to pass any students. Then we need to perform saving or like we need to save the school and all I need to do. So in this case, I can whether return or like have, for example, saved school equals school dot repository. And then I will do var and then I need another method to transform this school DTO, uh, this school object to a school DTO. But here, as you can see, it's just for this case. The school object is the same as the for the input as the output. So all I can do is return DTO again. So this also valid and this will allow me to have or to save some time on the execution level. So here we have our our method right here. It's a post mapping and we receive the school DTO and then we save this the school and return the object back. So let's go ahead, let's restart and let's try out this. So if we go back to postman and here, this is the tab for posting a school. So let's say Alibu school two. And then if I click on save, so we see that the, the school was persisted and here I have the response that I already get from my backend. Now, if I go back and check the database and here, let's open our school table, we see that we have Alibu school and Alibu school two, two sorry, not two, which is was persisted into our table. Now for fetching the list of schools that we have in the database, we don't need to expose the school, but we need to return a school DTO object. So here I will just change this return type to school DTO and then we need to perform also a mapping. So we need to do a transformation for each element of the list to a school DTO object. So here let's create private and then school DTO and let's call it to school DTO. And these two school DTO will receive a parameter of type school. And then all I need to do is to return a new school DTO and then it's will, it will be school dot get name. Now we have our method and this method, it will transform like it will take a school object as a parameter and then it will return a school DTO out of it. So here what we need to do. So first let's have a stream and then let's perform a mapping. So then stream. So it will, this will return a stream of schools and then a map. So we can do this and then we can use the 
method reference and then we can call this method to school DTO and then of course we need to collect and return a list so here now we have a transformation so after finding all the students which will return a list of schools then we open a stream so this will transform our list to a stream of schools and then we will do a mapping so we'll tr do a transformation of object so this means for each element of this list of schools or of this stream of schools we can or we will perform a transformation and then it will, we will call the to school DTO method which will return later on a stream of school DTO object and then we call a reduce method method which is collect and then we want to collect all of this as list so now let's go ahead and try this one and see the output so let's open again postman and here we have the method or like the request to call or to get the list of schools if I click on it we see that we have now an object name Alibu school and then name Alibu school 2 so we don't expose any more the list of students or any extra objects or any extra information that we don't want to expose it to the outside world or to our rest customer all right so now we have everything uh, we need so let's move on and and talk about a really interesting topic so see you in the next lecture as the application and the business requirement grows we see that the code that we are producing in here in this controller student controller and also in the school controller has grown significantly and for that we need to introduce another layer in order to make our code more you more reusable and we we need to create a separation of concerns so for that we need to create another layer which is called the service layer so the service layer in rest api plays a crucial role in separating the concerns of handling business logic and application specific operations from the presentation layer which is the controller and the data access layer which is the repository so it serves as an intermediary between the controller and the repository encapsulating the business logic and providing a reusable modular and testable code base and here are some key reasons why the service layer is important in rest apis first we have business logic encapsulation so the service layer is responsible for implementing the business logic and performing complex operations required by the api it encapsulates the logic that goes beyond simple data retrieval or modification such as validation calculation transformation or coordination of multiple operations so by centralizing the business logic in the service layer you promote code reusability maintainability and readability also the service layer provides a separation of concerns so the service layer helps to maintain a clear separation of concerns within the api architecture controllers are responsible for handling incoming http requests and providing appropriate responses while repositories handle the data persistence and retrieval the service layer sits in between ensuring that the business logic and application specific operations are decoupled from the other layers so this separation improves the code organization makes the code easier to understand and allows for independent changes and testing of each layer and finally testing and maintainability so the service layer provides a boundary of unit testing as you can test the business logic independently for the, of the controllers and repositories by mocking or stabbing the dependencies you can focus solely on testing the logic within the service methods so this makes it easier to write comprehensive and targeted tested enhancing test coverage and ensuring the correctness of business logic additionally the separation of concerns achieved by the service layer improves the maintainability of the code base as changes to the business logic and can be isolated to the service layer without affecting the other layers so in the next part let's go ahead and create the service layers that we need for our application so now let's start with refactoring the student controller and create and extract the code for each layer so here let's first start with these two methods the method that 
can convert and map an object student DTO to an object student. And also we have another method which converts a student to a student response DTO. So for that, let's go ahead and create a new class and let's call it student mapper. So this class or this service is responsible for mapping or creating mapping for our students. So first to make this class a service, all we need to do is to add the service annotation on this level right here. And then let's go back to our student controller and let's copy or let's cut these two methods right here. So I'm going to use comment X to cut these two methods. And then we go back to the student mapper and then just paste the code right here. And don't forget to make these methods public. And again here, let's make the second method public. So now we have these two methods available in this student mapper service. So now in order to use the student mapper and the student controller, all we need to do is to inject our student mapper. So let's go ahead and do it. So here we have private final student mapper. And then let's call it student mapper. And here, of course, we need to include that or to add this to our constructor. So let's go ahead and do it. And now we have our student mapper injected. I'm going to make this one full screen. And now let's fix the test. So here, instead of calling directly the to student, we need to call student mapper dot to student. And here we see that the code still works and we don't have any compile issues. And the same here. So for the other method to student response DTO. So here we started or we extracted our first service and we have our student mapper service, which can handle the mapping and the, the objects transformation. So now let's move on and create another service for this student controller in order to make our code more and more reusable and make our code maintainable and encapsulated. So now we extracted the code and we make we made our code less complex on the student controller, but we still see that we have more logic, which is happening around here. So here we have like mapping, saving, and then returning the mapped object. So the idea is always to make the student or the controller layer responsible or only for receiving the requests and sending back the responses. And all the logic and all the business logic needs to go to a, to a separate service. So for that, let's go ahead and create a, a new class and let's call it student service. So here student service class. And again, to make the student service a service, we need to give it the annotation service. So here we can use whether the annotation service or just a component. But since we decided that this is a service layer, so we can annotate it with the service annotation. So then we see here that we are using repository and mapper. So we need to move these two dependencies to the service layer. So I'm going to close this one and then I will just cut this student uh, these two dependencies and I will paste them here. And again, let me make it full screen. And now I need to create or to add a constructor with these two objects or two dependencies in order to you inject them using constructor injection. And here let's go back to uh, to this one. And now instead of injecting the repository and the mapper, all we need to do is to inject the service that we just created. And we will come back to this in a few seconds. So here we see that we have this post method. So first I'm gonna uh, change this one and I make it save student. So I will just re rename the method. And here in the student service, I need to create also a method that will perform these three operations. This means transforming a student DTO to a student and then saving the student and then finally mapping the student to a student response DTO. So I'm going to cut this one. And here I will go back to my student service and I will create a public method. So I will call it or like it should return a student response DTO. So let's call it also save student if you want to. 
and this save student needs to take as a parameter the same object that we have right here. So let's pass our student DTO as an input and then let's open this and just paste the code that we, we copied from the controller. So now if I go back to my student controller and then I will just remove this construction constructor and again I will inject my private final student service, the one that we just created and let's call it student service. And of course we need to create or inject it through the constructor and here we have our student service. So here in this save student method let's just do this dot student service dot save student and then we pass this the DTO as an object. So for this method we see that we have only one line and of course we need the return keyword and here we have only one line which is calling the student service in order to perform all the business logic that we need. So here let's go ahead and also migrate and move all the logic for the other methods also to the student service. So now before we move on, I want to give you a small exercise and I'm pretty confident that you will handle it your own. So here I want you to migrate and to move all the logic in this controller to the student service. So this means you need to create a method find all student in the student service and the same for find student by ID and find student by name and the same for deleting a student. So go ahead and do it and I will give you the solution just afterwards. That's good. So now let's correct this exercise. So first of all, let's create a method in our service and let's call it find all students. So we can just copy this one and then move it to the student service. So here I will have my method. So find all students. And now if I go back here instead of repository and I will call this the service. So here I have student service dot find all students. And now we migrated the find all students to the student service. So in case we need to perform any other operations on the student on the find all students, we can just do it on the service layer and we no longer need to update or to change anything on the ser on the controller layer. So again, let's do or let's migrate this one. And then of course I will give you another exercise just to transform or to return the student response DTO instead of the student for this controller. So let's go ahead and let's do this. So here we have, we need the integer ID and then all we need to do is just to return this one. So let's copy this code from here and then paste it here. And now instead of calling the repository, so it will be the student service dot find student by ID. And then we need to pass the ID as a parameter. So we migrated also the find student by ID. And now let's go ahead and migrate this method too. So let's copy it and then let's go to the service. And here we need the string name as a parameter. And then also we can just go back and copy this line of code and paste it in here. So again, let's go back to the controller and here instead of returning the repository, so it will be student service dot find all by name or find students by name. So here find students by name and then we need the string name. So now also we migrated this method and finally we need to migrate this delete method. So let's make it also a void. So let's go back to student controller and let's paste this one and we need our integer ID and then we need just this line of code. So let's just copy it and then paste it in here. So then we know we go back to the student controller and instead of calling the repository, let's just call student service and then just the method called delete. So now we migrated all the code to the service and as you can see here in the controller methods, we see that we just making a call to the student service. So we have no logic in here. So that's good. Now we migrated everything and the next step, let's see what we need to do again. Now I want to give you another exercise. 
So as I mentioned before, here we see or we need to return always the DTO or the DTO representation and we want to do the same for all the other methods. So here instead of returning the student object, I want you to return the student response DTO object instead. So now I will leave it to you and just go ahead, fix this and change the return type and I will see you in the solution for this exercise. That's good. You made it this far, so now let's correct together this exercise. So here, instead of returning a student, we need to return a student response DTO. So let's first change the type of this list. And here, in this find all method, let's start and open a stream. And then let's make a map. And then we need our mapper. So student mapper, and then we can make a method reference to student response DTO. And finally, we need to collect our objects. So here we have collect and then collectors as list. And of course, we see that we have still one related problem, which is the student controller or the return type of the student controller. So we need also to change that. So now we have our student response DTO for the find all student methods. So next, let's go ahead and also migrate and change the, the return type for the find student by ID. So let's go back to our student service. And here in the find student by ID, let's just paste this one. So we change the return type. And here this find by ID, as you can see, it returns an optional of student. So within the optional, we have also the map method. So we can also perform a transformation and return the transformed object. So for the transformation, we need also the student mapper and then to student response DTO. Otherwise here we need to return a new student or we can just return null for the moment. And then I will show you in the, in the future sections how or how to deal with this kind of object in case we don't find any student with the specified ID. So now let's go back to the controller and also change the return type for this method. So here it should be student response DTO. And now let's move on and also change the return type for the find students by name. So again, let's go back to the service. And here, instead of student, we need to return student response DTO. And here also we know that this find all by first name returns a list of student. So it will be exactly the same thing as in here. So we can just copy this code to make it faster and just paste it in here. So we have the find all and then stream and then we perform the mapping and then we collect the response. And of course, don't forget to change the return type in the controller. So here I will just use the content to paste. So here I want or I need my student response DTO and we have the issue fixed once and for all. So now we have everything fixed in the student controller and we migrated and moved all the business logic to the student service. So here, as you can see, if we need to perform any operation or to apply any business logic, we just do it on the student service. And also, for example, if we need anything or a new method on the map uh, for the mapping, or if we want to return another type or another representation of the student, all we need to do is to perform and do this transformation on the student mapper level. So now we have our student controller clean. Let's go ahead and also migrate the business logic for this school controller to a school service. That's good. You made it this far. Now I want to give you another exercise. So now let's move to the student controller and I want you to extract all the logic that we have in here to separate services. So just to give you a hint, just re I want to remind you that we have mapping methods right here. And we also we have some logic in here. And also we have some logic in here. So just go ahead and do this and extract all this code to separate services. And I will see you in the solution for this exercise. Good, you made it this far and I'm pretty sure that you correctly implemented the services and extracted the services for the school controller. So now let's fix that together. First, we need to create a new class. So let's call it school mapper. So this school mapper, of course, we need the service annotation 
to make it a service and to make it injectable. And first, let's move these two methods right here. So I'm just gonna cut them. So let me make it full screen. And then let's paste these two. So here also we need to make these two methods public in order to be able to use them from outside this class. And now also let's create another class and let's call it school service. So here we have school service class. And again, we need the required or the, sorry, the service annotation. And again, we need to create two methods since we have just two methods right here. So I'm gonna just copy this one or like I'm gonna copy the whole method and I will paste it in here. So here we don't need this request body and we can also make the code a bit cleaner and I'm gonna make it full screen. And here, of course, we need to inject our mapper. So private final school mapper and then let's call it school mapper. And of course we need our constructor for that. So add a constructor and here, instead of using to school, I'm gonna use my school mapper dot to school and the same in here. So here we need also the school repository. So let's go ahead and inject it. So we have private school repository and let's call it school repository. And also let's make it final and inject it and add it as a parameter into our constructor. So here we extracted the create method. So let's go back to the controller. And instead of calling this, we need to return the call from the school service. So here I will just change this one to school service. And also I will rename this one to school service. So let me just remove the controller and inject it again. So here let's call it school service and let's create a new controller with the school service. So here I will just remove everything. And instead of remove just returning the DTO, I will just return my school service dot create. And then I need to pass the DTO as a parameter. So now we just mig successfully migrated and extracted the code for the create. Let's do the same within the school or the find all method. So I will copy this one. So, or I can just copy everything. And here I will go to my school service and I will paste this method right here. So here, instead of this for the mapping part, instead of this, I need to call my school mapper and then the method to school DTO. And of course, let's not forget to change or make the changes in the school controller. So here, let's call our school service dot find all method. So again, we also need to optimize the imports. And now we have our code migrated and extracted to separate services. So here we see that the code is more and more readable and maintainable. So if we need to, again, to perform any business logic, we only have one place to perform it and we don't need to make everything in one place or in the controller. And this will make our life easier later on when we move to the, to the unit tests part, you will see the impact and the advantages of extracting the code to service layers. As our application grows, we see that each time we need new classes, new interfaces, and new objects to create. And this is too much and makes our code really not easy to target. And for example, if you search a specific class or specific object to update or to perform any operation on it, it's really a bit hard to, to, to find it. And here it's just a simple example. Imagine if you are working on an on a, a bigger application and let's say for example an e-commerce application within the same code base so this makes our life a bit complicated to find and identify the correct class and the correct object to update so for this i want to introduce you to a topic which is the best way to organize your code within your application and for for this one we have several approaches and I will walk you through each one of them and explain how to organize this, the code using each of these approaches. And then we will choose together the best approach, or I will give you my recommendation for the best approach to organize the code, but you are always free to choose the best approach that suits you. So now let's first start explaining the approach. The first approach is called by feature. 
in this approach, the code is organized around the business capabilities of features of the applications. For instance, if you're developing an e-commerce application, you might have packages like product, order, customer, and payment. And each of these packages would then contain all classes related to that particular feature, such as controller, services, repositories, and models. So this organization style is beneficial for large teams and projects because it's easy to locate code related to specific feature. The second approach is the layer approach. So in this approach, the code is organized around its architectural layers. Common layers might include controllers, services, repositories, models, and utils, for example. So this styles is beneficial when the focus is more on technical roles classes rather than they, their business roles. So however, one downside is that change to a single feature could affect multiple packages. And the next approach is by domain. So in a domain-driven design or also called DDD approach, the focus is on the business domain packages. So packages are formed around different bounded contexts of subdomains within the large domain. So for instance, in a healthcare system, for example, there might be packages like patient management, billing, scheduling, and medical records. And finally, on the final approach is by component. So in a more modularized approach, you may have top level packages for each high level component or uh, of your system. Within each of these packages, you can further organize code by feature layer. For example, if we have a user component, we can have sub, sub packages like controllers, services, models, and so on and so forth. Same for the product component. We can have controllers, services, models, utils, and so on and so forth. And personally, I prefer the layer approach. So here we can have packages for product, order, customer, and payment. And inside of each package, we will have all the related classes to the product. So in this, in our case, we will have a package for school, a package for student, another package for user profile, and so and so forth. And if we need a common package, like for example, let's say validators or exception handlings or like custom exceptions and so on and so forth, we can create a specific package for that. So now let's move on and organize our code together. So now, in order to move all these classes to the appropriate packages, there are several ways. And let me show you how you can use your IDE to do that. Here on the first line of each class, you will see a line called package, and it refers to the package that holds the, this class. So here, for example, if I want to move the school class to a package that I want to call school, all I need to do is to add dot school, and then IntelliJ will say that we don't have a package for that. And if I open this one, this small pop-up right here, we see that we have set package name to com.alibu.example since IntelliJ is considering this as a typo, or it will propose also to move to package com.alibu.example.school. So let's go ahead and choose this option. And here, if you uncheck this button right here, you see that inside this example package, it will ask to create a school package. So let's go ahead and click on OK and see that here we have this school package. OK, but this will come with some related issues because we need to import now the appropriate classes. But first, let's move all the school related uh, classes to the school package. So here we can just perform a drag and drop. So let's just drop this one here and ask IntelliJ to refactor. Same for school DTO and then refactor and also school mapper. So here and finally we need the school repository and the school service. So it's easy to do it within the within the IDE. So here, let's check if we have another school object. So we don't here. If I go back to the school, I need again just to import the student, but let's do it for later. And then what I can do also like a different way, I can just create a package like new and then package. And then let's say, for example, student. So here, this package will hold all the information about the student. And now I can select multiple classes. So student, student controller, student DTO, student repository. 
and then student response DTO and student service and finally student mapper and then I, all I need to do is just to drag and drop them to the student package and then click on refactor and let NTJ take care of the rest and finally we see that we have the student profile so let's also create a new package for that so let's call it student profile and finally we need to move the student profile to this student profile package and then let's go back to here and let's check everything so here we see that the school we need just to import this one and if you just type or uh, open the auto uh, code completion it will propose that to import the school from this package so just select this one and now we have our school object ready to use so then if i go to the school and also open let's import our student object here and now we have everything fixed and if I go back to the school we see that our application is compiling successfully and also to make sure that everything is compiling just go to build and then build project and let's see if our project is successfully built so we still see that we have one issue is with the student mapper so let's click on this one and again we need to import the school from here so now let's check back again and we see that we have in the school mapper and the student mapper sorry not the school mapper because we are using the school object in here so we need to import it from the appropriate package since they are now in different packages so again let's check if our application is building and then click build on and build project so now the project is, is successfully built and everything looks a bit nicer and pretty much nicer not just a bit so here we have our code organized if I need something school related all I need to do is to go to the school package and here we have all the classes related to the school the same for the student so now let's move on and check what comes next now after all this refactoring and the code organization let's go ahead and check if our application is still working so let me close all this and then let's start the application and go to postman and make sure that the application is still working so here we see that we have the application is up and running and everything is totally okay so let's go to our postman and make sure that everything is working fine so here in postman so for example if i go to schools and try to retrieve the list of schools we see that we have the response and we have 200 okay and now for example in case i want to insert a new student let's say alibu and i will just provide the first name and the school id and let's click on send we see that we have our student persisted and we receive a 200 okay but here we see that we have the last name and the email are null and also let's go check in the database and see the changes so here i'm going to make this full screen and now let's open the student class or the student table we see here that this is the the latest student that we inserted and we inserted it with the first name alibu but we see that the email and the last name and even the age are null so the age is zero because it's of type int so by default the int is zero but we see also that we have the email and the last name they are null and this is not really appropriate when it comes to database and for the data we want to persist there we can accept null values uh, for some fields but for other fields we cannot accept null values for example when we talk about the email or the student so the email can be also a unique identifier and an important and sensitive information for a student so we need always to have the email and the last name for the student so this also introduces us to the next section of this course so let's go ahead and introduce that and let me explain to you the issue and how we can fix that data validation is crucial in rest api for several reasons first data integrity Data validation ensures that the data being received and processed by API meets certain rules and restrictions. This helps maintain the, cons the consistency and real reliability of your data. For instance, validating an email address format ensures that you won't have invalid email addresses in your database. Preventing attacks 
and validated data can expose your API to security vulnerabilities. Malicious users can send harmful input to your API in an attempt to perform SQL injection, cross-site scripting also known as XSS, and other types of attacks. Proper data validation can significantly reduce these risks. Error preventing. By validating data before it's processed, you can prevent errors that might occur during processing. If you receive a number where you expect a string, it can cause errors in your code. Data validation helps detect these issues early. User experience. Validating input on the server side and providing clear error message can greatly improve user experience. It lets users know what they did wrong and how to correct it rather than leaving them guessing. Performance. Receiving large amount of incorrect or poorly formatted data can affect your API performance. Validation can serve as a first line of defense against unnecessary processing such data. And finally, business logic compliance. Often, business rules determine the acceptable values or formats for certain data fields. Validation ensures that the data your API receives and processes complies with these business rules. Now, let's see in action how we can implement this in a Spring Boot application. The first thing that we need to do is to add the required and the needed dependency for validation. And Spring Boot provides already a starter for validating objects. So let's go to our pom.xml file. And here, after Spring Data JPA, for example, I'm going to make this one full screen. Let's add a new dependency. So here we need the dependency called Spring Boot Starter Validation. And it comes from the same group ID, which is org.springframework.boot. And then all you need to do is to click on this button to load the Maven project or the Maven changes or right click and then reload project. And like this, Maven will download this new dependency. And now we are ready and able to use this dependency within our project. So the next step, let me show you how you how we can validate objects just using some annotations and use the power of Spring Boot starters to delegate almost everything. Now, the question that you need to ask is where to add the validation. So we mentioned before that validation within Spring Boot starter validation, it's just a bunch of annotations that we need to add to some fields and then Spring will do the rest for us. Of course, it will not do it by itself, but we need to tell Spring that we want to validate this object that contains the validation annotations. So the answer is we need to add the validation on the first entry point object that we use to interact with our REST API. So now I guess you get what I what I mean. And this is on the on the DTO level. So for example, here, if we go to our student controller, and go to the post mapping, the method that helps us to create or to save a new student, we request a student DTO object. So the validation needs to be done on this level. All right. So let me show you how we can validate this object. So first, as I mentioned, we need to add some annotations telling Spring Boot Starter Validation what are the validations or what are the controls that we want to add on each field of our object. And these annotations are valid whether you work with records or if you work with only simple classes or simple POJOs. Let's first start by validating, for example, our first name. And let's say that we want to make sure that the first name should not be empty. Okay. So here we have an annotation called not empty. And here to make sure that this is the right and the correct annotation, it comes from jakarta.validation.constraints or if you are using Spring 2.7 point something or like a prior version before the Spring 3, it will be javax.validation.constraints. So now let's use this not empty annotation on the first name. So I'm going to make this one full screen. So this not empty annotation, let's go and check the documentation and the code of this annotation. Always don't forget to download the source code. So you have everything 
clear and, and complete. So here it says that the annotated element must not be null or empty. Okay, so if we add uh, the not empty annotation to a field of type string, or here we can see the lists or the supported types for this annotation. So here the supported types are, so here we have char sequence. So this means the length of character sequence is evaluated or a collection. So the collection size is evaluated, a map, the map size is evaluated or an array. This means that the array length is evaluated. So here it will make sure, so this annotation will make sure and ensure that the first name is not null and is not empty. This means that the length should be greater than zero. So also I will add this not empty annotation to the last name just to make sure that the first name and the last name are not empty when we try to create a new student. So now let's move on and let me show you how we can make or how we can tell Spring to validate the student DTO when we receive a request body from the user or from the REST client sending us an object and we want to transform it to a student DTO. So let's see how we can validate that. So this student DTO is used to interact with the student controller. So as we can see here, we have in the post mapping for the method save student, we have a request body of type student DTO. So we need to tell Spring that this object should be validated. So now how to do that? All we need to do is to add an annotation called valid and this annotation valid comes from jakarta.validation. So it's the same package as the, the not empty. So here this one's jakarta.validation.constraints. So these are the constraints that we can use. And here is the valid comes from the jakarta.validation package. So you need to be careful about that because if you import the wrong annotation, the application might not work. So now let's start our application and test these changes. So let's start the application and then let's go to postman and send an student DTO object, but with the first name and the last name with null values. So here, this is our post request. And here we see that we have only first name and the school ID. So here we don't have the last name. So I'm expecting to have an exception or an error or validation error raised by Spring if we don't pass the last name. So let's go ahead and click on it. So here, let's say Catherine as a student name and let's click on send. So here we see that we have a bad request. So our backend raised automatically a bad request response. So let's go and check what we have as exceptions or what we have as logs. So now let's check this. And here we see that we have nothing like but we see just one warning so here we have a word and we have a default exception handler resolver and it says here resolved an exception of type method argument not valid exception and here validation failed for argument zero in public student response dto and so on and so forth so save student controller and here we say that field last name rejected value null all right, so here we have an exception raised and REST client received a 400 response. 400 means bad request, as we can see right here. So it's a bad request, but with no further information about what happened exactly. And here we are missing one th something important that we explained before, which is the user experience. So the, so the user doesn't know what happened or what he missed exactly. So he needs to, in this case, he needs to recheck the everything and then try to send a new request. So let's see how we can catch this type of exception and how we can handle and return a proper response to the, to the end user. As we can see here in the logs, spring validation through an exception of type method argument not valid exception. So I'm going to copy this one. And now what we need to do is to handle this exception inside this student controller. So what I will be implementing right now, I will explain it in details, really in deep details, just in the next lecture. So now I just want to show you how we can handle an exception inside the controller and then we raise a proper and a clear message for our end user. So now I would just scroll down 
and here I will create a public method. So a public and then response entity and then this response entity will be of any type and then so here I will say handle and then the method argument not valid exception and here as a parameter I'm expecting an exception of type method argument not valid exception so we need to import this one so let's import it and then let's write the logic for this one and of course, to make this method a handler method or an exception handler method, we need to add an annotation called exception handler. And this exception handler takes a list of classes or a single class as value. So here we want, in, like within this method, we want to handle the exception of type method argument not valid exception. So each time we receive or this controller, the student controller throws an exception of type method argument not valid exception, this exception will be handed inside this method. So as I mentioned, don't worry about that. I will explain all this in details in the next lecture. So for now, let me create a, a, a map. Let's call it errors equals new hash map and this hash map will be of type string and string so the first string will hold the field name and the second one will hold the message name okay and then what I need to do I need to get the exception or the validation exception from this method argument not valid exception and then transform them and send back a map of key value and the key is the field name and the value is the message that was raised by the validation so here all i need to do is exp like or my exception and then the, the dot get binding result and then we have a method called get all errors and as you can see it will return a list of object error so let's do that and then i will do for each so for each element or for each error which is returned by the get all errors here so like the these errors that we have are coming from the annotations that we used in here so for example if we use multiple annotations even on the same level name here so we will get all the errors then so now what i need to do is i need my object which is let's call it error and then i will use the lambda expression and for each element what i will be do doing is i want to extract the field name and the error message so i will have here a var field name equals and then i need my error and then i need to get the field but i need to cast this error object to another type so it should be casted to a type of type field error so then it will be field error and then i have a method called get field so this will return the field name and then i need another variable which is the error message so i will call it error message equals again we need to we need to go to error dot get default message so this will return the default error message that will be thrown by the exception and also get we get this error message from this annotation right here so now, once we get the field name and the error message, all I need to do is to store this in the errors map and then put, and the key is the field name and the value is the error message. And like this, we gathered or like we captured all the error messages and we formed a, a proper object that we can expose to our customer. And now, of course, we need to return a new response entity and then for this response entity, we will pass the errors object and then a bad request. So it will be HTTP status dot bad request. So now every time a method argument not valid exception will be raised inside the student controller, this method will intercept this exception and try to extract and transform the error message messages that are coming from the validation process and transform them to a proper response that we can send to the user. So now let's restart the application and see what happens. All right, our application is up and running. Let's go back to Postman and let's just click on send. So here we see that we have a proper response. So here we see that last name must not be empty. And even if I remove, for example, the first name, we will see that we have two error messages because for now we have two annotations. One is on the first name level, 
and the last one is on the last name level. So now let's let's move on and explore more annotations and how we can validate and give proper validation and proper control on the fields that we have for each object. All right, before we move on and explore more annotations, first let's see something or a property which is really important. And let's see here we have first name and then we have a message must not be empty. So this message is the default message coming from the Spring Boot Starter Validator. And then what we need to do or what we can do, we can customize this message. So instead of having first name must not be empty, we can set our proper or our custom error message. So let me show you how we can do that. So here on the student DTO level, where we have the not empty annotation, here we have a property called message. And as you can see here, by default, it's jakarta.validation.constraints.empty.message. But we can provide our own proper message. And here, for example, let's say first name should not be empty. And this should not be empty. And this message will be returned to the user. Also, I can copy that and add this message to the last name and here I will say instead of first name I will just say last name. So now let's restart the application and see the impact or how this is going to be displayed on our postman. Now all I need to do is to click on send again and here we see we have first name should not be empty and last name should not be empty and in this case we can even enhance a bit a little bit the code that we created so we no longer need to expose the field name that we have in our backend. All right, so let's go ahead maybe and do this, or we can just for now leave it as it is because I will show you a better way how to validate objects. So now we can move on and explore the rest of the annotations that we can use to validate the different type of objects and the, its different boundaries. So in the project, if you go to external libraries and then scroll down, it's almost in the middle and you will see a dependency called jakarta.validation so this is the dependency that we added already in the pom.xml file and then if you if you expand this one you will see a package called jakarta.validation and then you have a sub package called constraints and here we, we see the list of all the annotations that we can use to validate fields in a class and now let's walk through these annotations and see what are the use cases for each one. So for example, here we have the first one, assert false. And from the documentation, the annotated element must be false. And the same for assert true. This means that the annotated element must be true. For example, if you have a Boolean field and you want to add validation that this Boolean field should be true or false, you can use the annotation assert true or assert false. Now we let's move on to the decimal max and this one, this annotated element must be a number whose value must be lower or equal to the specified maximum. So if you want, for example, that a field or a value should not pass the value equals 100 for example you can use the decimal max and give it the value 100 and then the validation will take care of the rest and make sure that the value we that the value we receive should not go beyond 100 and the same for the decimal min so this will check and validate if this decimal or, or if the value should not be under that value we specified and here also you need to check the supporter types. So here we have, so for the decimal max and decimal mins, so we have, it applies to big decimal, big integers, charged sequence, byte, short, int, long, and their perspective wrappers. So wrappers means the integer class and the long with, with uh, an uppercase or a capital L and so and so forth. The next one, we have digits. So this annotation, the annotated element must be a number within accepted range. So here we have a message group and we have fraction and we have a list of properties that we can specify when we use this annotation. 
and the next one is email so as the name mentioned so this one it will make sure that an email address or a string email address should be well formed and here we have by default or we have a default rejects for the email so this is the one provided already by the Jakarta validation but if you want to provide your own email formatting rejects just use the, the property called rejects p and you will be able to format or to give the rejects for your email then we have the future annotation so this annotation is applicable to all the date types as you can see here so here this annotated element must be an instant date or time in the future so when for example when you have a field date let's say for example uh, event or event date or something like that and we want to make sure that this event date should be in the future we can annotate this field with the future annotation and then of course the spring boot starter validator will take care of the rest so also if we want the date to be future or present we can use this future or present annotation to validate that then we have the max and min so the max and min so this annotated element must be a number whose value must be lower or equal to the specified maximum and the same for the minimum and here we see also the list of the supported types then if we want a value to be negative all we need to do is to annotate the field with the negative annotation so this annotated the annotated element must be a strictly negative number for example zero is considered as an valid value so it will it should be or the value should be lower than or strictly lower than zero and then we have if we want to accept zero values for example we have the annotation negative or zero and it will do the same except that uh, that this annotation accepts the zero value then we have the not blank annotation so this annotated element must be not null and must contain at least one non white space character so this is important so for example if i pass a white space and i use the not blank annotation to validate the field so this will throw a validation exception as we saw before so here we have the not empty and the not empty we already used and we saw in action so this would just ensure that the element must not be null or empty but it accepts white spaces and then we have the not null so for the not null it just checks that if the value or if the element must not be null and then we also of course have the null so since we have the not null we have also the null so this checks or um, specify and uh, that the annotated element must be a null value and here it says accepts any type so we can use this null or not null on any type so then we have we go back again to the to the date annotations so here it's exactly the same as future and uh, and future or present we have also past or past or present so for example past we can apply it to date of births to uh, a date that we wanted to be in the past also we have the past or present where we can use this annotation to make sure that the date should be in the past or we also accept a present date so present date means today's date then we have the pattern annotation so this pattern annotation is applicable on annotated uh, or a field of type charge sequence must be a match for the specified regular expression so here we have like 100% freedom to specify the regular expression that we want to, to, to use it to validate this field and then we have positive so this ensures that the, the annotated element must be a strictly positive number so zero is also considered as an invalid value so here you need to know exactly the difference between for example positive and positive or zero so positive positive or zero just the difference that it accepts zero and finally we have the size annotation so the annotated element size must be between the specified boundaries and for example here if i have a string and i want the size or the length of that string to be between a minimum and a maximum value all i need to do is to use the size and then specify the min and the max values so these are the the 
all the annotations or all the validation annotations that we can use. Also, we can create custom annotations, but this we might cover in a future lesson. For now, let's move on and let me show you how to validate or like how like it's a proper way to validate objects. All right, so now we implemented or we are almost done with the implementation of our REST API. We also organized the code, we added the validation, we added the mapping, our code is well organized and each part and each domain is in, uh, is in its own package and everything is all right. Also, we tested the application and the application is working fine. But the question is, are we done with this implementation? So let me give you the answer. So the answer is no, because we are missing really a crucial part and a critical part of the application, which is testing. Yep, exact. It's all about testing because why we need test? Because for example, if I do a small change in one of the domains that we have, what are my guarantees to say that this change won't impact anything else? So software testing is a crucial process in the realm of software development designed to identify and rectify defects, errors, and inconsistencies with a software application. It serves as a quality assurance mechanism ensuring that the software performs as intended and meets the requirements and expectations of both developers and end users. Through a systematic and a structured approach, software testing evaluates various aspects of programs, functionality, usability, security, and performance. So then in the next part, first we will see what is the importance and how Spring is going to help us for testing. And after that, we will try and we will do testing and we will see software testing in action. So we will implement the three parts of testing. So unit testing, integration testing, and end-to-end -end testing. So stick with me and I'm really happy you reach this part and let's go ahead. Implementing tests for a Spring Boot application is important for several reasons. First, we talk about quality assurance. So tests help ensure that your application functions as expected. They identify bugs, error and expected behavior early in the development process, allowing you to fix issues before they reach production. And then regression testing. As you make changes or add new features to your application, tests act as a safety net to the catch regressions. They ensure that existing functionality continues to work as intended even after code changes. Also, test serves as documentation for your code base. They provide examples of how your code should be used and demonstrate its expected behavior. This is especially helpful for other developers who may join the project later on. Also, a well-written tests encourage good coding practices and modular design. They often lead to the more modular, loosely coupled code that is easier to maintain and refactor. When you want to refactor or optimize your code, tests provide a safety net they allow you to make changes with the confidence that you'll immediately know if something breaks. Also, the tests facilitate collaboration among developers. When multiple team members are working on the same code base, tests ensure that changes made by one developer don't negatively impact the work of others. Also, in a CI-CD pipeline or like continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline, tests are run automatically whenever new code is pushed. This helps catch issues early in the development process and prevents faulty code from reaching production. Also, writing tests can take more time upfront, but it can significantly reduce the time spent on debugging later in the development process. It's much easier to identify the root cause of a failure when you have a well-defined tests. As your application grows, the complexity also increases. 
tests provide a safety net that allows you to confidently make changes and add features without introducing unexpected issues. And finally, of course, tests, certain types of tests like security and vulnerability tests help identify potential security weaknesses in your application. This is crucial for protecting sensitive data and ensuring the overall security of your application. So generally speaking, in a Spring Boot application, you can implement various types of tests, including unit tests, integration tests, and even end-to-end -end tests. So each type of test focuses on a specific aspect of your application's functionality and provides a comprehensive safety net to ensure its reliability and correctness. Now let's see how Spring can help us in implementing the tests and what Spring provides exactly. So first, Spring provides utilities and annotations for testing applications. So the test support is provided by two modules. The Spring Boot test contains core items and the Spring Boot test auto configure supports auto configuration for testing. And then we have also the Spring Boot starter tests, which imports the following modules. First of all, we have the Spring Boot test module. We have also JUnit, AssertJ, Hamcrest, and number of other useful libraries. So a Spring Boot application is a Spring application context. And this I will explain it more in details when we go to the practice part. So the Spring Boot provides a Spring Boot test annotation when you need Spring Boot features during tests. So for example, if you want to load the application context in your tests, all you need to do is to annotate your class with the Spring Boot test annotation. And then in case you are using JUnit 4, you need to add the annotation run with Spring Runner .class to your test, otherwise the annotation will be ignored. Other than that, if you are using JUnit 5, there is no need to add the equivalent extend with Spring uh, extension as the Spring Boot test annotation and the other annotations will be already annotated within the at Spring Boot test. So now we mentioned that Spring comes with a Spring, uh, Spring test auto configuration module. So the Spring Boot's auto configuration system works well for applications, but can sometimes be a little too much for tests. So it often helps to load only the parts of the configuration that are required to test a slice of your application. So the Spring Boot test auto configure module includes a number of annotations that can be used to automatically configure such slices. And finally, each slice restricts component scan to appropriate component and loads a very restricted set of auto configuration classes. Now we are done with the theoretic part. This might be a little bit too much or like too much talking. Now we will move to the practice part and you will be able to understand and start implementing tests your own. So let's move on and let's go ahead and do it. All right, now let's dive into the implementation of tests for our different classes. So here, this is the diagram or the composition or the class diagram of our small application and I'm focusing only on the student domain. So here we see from the bottom to the top, we have the student composed of the student service. This means that the student controller uses the student service and the student service use both uh, of student repository and student mapper. And the student mapper will use both object student and student response DTO. So now I want to tell you and explain to you what you need to implement test for. So what do you need to test? Which classes and which objects you need to implement tests for? So here we see that the student response DTO and the student object, they are just classes. So there is no logic inside it. So it's just a class holding some information about the student. And this class or this record is only holding some information about the student response DTO. Now, if we go a level down, we see that we have the student mapper and then we have the student repository. So the student repository, we can also implement tests for that, but it doesn't make sense or it's not 
really required to implement tests for repository. So we will skip this one. Now let's start with the student mapper. So the student mapper right here. So if we go to the navigation or if we navigate to the student mapper right here to this class, we see that we have two methods. All right. So now I want you to change a little bit your mindset and suppose that you don't know the code before. So you just have a mission or you're asked just to implement tests for these classes. So here we have two methods, two student and two student response DTO. So the first one will return a student object and the second one will return a student response DTO. So normally from the name of the method, we can understand what is its functionality. Otherwise we can go ahead and read the code. So we don't need that because we already implemented this our own. And now what we need to do is to create a test class for this student mapper. So to create a student mapper test class, let's start with the recommendation. So here we see that we have the Java and this is the base package that we have, which is com.alibu.example. And then we have school and student and student profile and so and so forth. Here, if we check the test, we have also Java and then com.alibu.example. And here we have also example application test, which is the same or like the same loader class or the class that will load the application context for our test. So for now, we will just ignore this one and I will explain it in the coming sections. All right. Now, the first recommendation is when you create a test class for one of the uh, for one of the services or the classes that you want to test, be sure and make sure that you keep the same package naming. So you, you need to keep the same hierarchy of, uh, of packages and folders just to make it easy to find. So you can just create it anywhere or like even without creating packages, but the recommendation to make your test classes clean and clear and easy to understand and easy to point, you just need to keep the same hierarchy or like the same package hierarchy. And we are lucky because our IDE, whether you are using IntelliJ, Eclipse, NetBeans and so on and so forth, you always have some shortcuts and you have the instruction and menu to generate test classes for the class that you want to test. So here, if I open back my test student or like my student mapper class, and I want to generate a test class for it. So if I do like um, right click, and then let's click on generate right here. So here we see that we have many options and among these options, we have test. So if I click on test, you will see that it will be it will be generating a student mapper and then it will have or it will give it a suffix called test. All right. And here you see the destination package. It will be com.alibu.example.student. You can select a different one or you can change the name and so on and so forth. But as I mentioned before, I recommend you keep the same the same hierarchy. And then you also can generate methods for setup, teardown, or also showing the inherited methods. And even you can generate two methods or like two test methods for the two students and two student response DTO. But for now we won't do that. We will do it one by one and step by step. So I will cancel. Then we have a different option. So here, just uh, focus on this area. You will have this green pop-up to show you which um, command or which shortcut or keyboard shortcut that I will be using in order to navigate to the test. So here, if you do uh, command shift T or control plus shift plus T, if you are using Windows or Mac, IntelliJ will try automatically to navigate you to the test class of this student mapper. All right. But if it can't find any test class, it will suggest you to create a new one. So it will also open and display the same window that we used before or that we saw together before. And here for the testing library, since we are using Java, like recent version of Java and also like a recent version of Spring Boot, so we, we can keep or we can use the JUnit 5. Also, if you have another project uh, using JUnit 4, for example, I already explained that before that you need to add a few annotations or like one annotation in order to make it work. So now, all we need to do is to click on OK button. And here you see that automatically a new package was created and it contains a new a student mapper class test. All right. So now we have everything ready. Let's go ahead and start implementing or let's start writing the first 
test method that we have for our student mapper class. All right, so first of all, let's generate a first test method. To create a test method, all you need to do is to create a public void. So this is the signature and it should be always public void and then the method name. So let's call it test method one. So this, is, this will be the first test method and the test method is a method without any parameters. So here to make this test method as a test method, so all we need to do is to add the annotation test. So the test, it comes from org.gunit.jupyter.api. So here, once we add this test, you see automatically that now we have this button to run this single method, or you have this button right here to, to run all the test methods inside this class. So let's first of all, just add a system.out.println and here my first test method. And now let's run this test class using this play button to run only this method since we have only one, or if we want, we can run the whole test. So let's run student mapper test class. And then you will see that it will open the test view. And here we have the system.out.println, the message that we printed, my first test method, and the test was green since we have nothing to assert yet. We will come to this in few moments. But before that, we need to understand what are the properties and what are the things that we can do within a test class. So the first thing that we need to know is that we have a setup method or we can create a setup method. So if you click on generate, here you will see that you have a setup method. You can generate it automatically or you can even write it your own. So let's generate it and see what it, what is this method. So it's just a void called setup and it contains an annotation called before each. So this means that this before each method or this setup method will be executed before each test that we have. And we mainly use this setup in order to initialize few things or few parameters or anything that we want to initialize before running any test method that we have. So I will just copy this message right here. And here I will just write inside before each method. And now if I run again my class, let's see what will be the output. So here we have, if I click in here, we have inside the before each method and then my first test class. So now I will just duplicate this method right here and I will call it my test method two. And here I will say my second test method. All right, so I will rerun again the class. And here we see that this one we have inside the before each method, my first test, and here we have also inside the before each method and then my second test. So as I mentioned, this before each will be executed before each test class. So in case, as I mentioned before, in case we want to initialize anything before running the test method. All right, so also as before each, we have other methods and let's go ahead and explore them one by one in order to understand the structure of a test class and what are the usages and the benefits of using these methods. All right. Also, if we want to execute any script, for example, to reset the values of variables or classes or services or whatever, we also have a method, we call it teardown. So the teardown is after each execution of test method. So here, let's use the generate again. And here we see that we have the teardown method. So let's generate it. And here you see after each. So let's copy the same message. And here inside the after each method. When we run the test class, we will see inside before each method. And then my first test method. And finally inside the after each method. So let's go ahead and execute it and see the output of this execution. So now I'm going to select the first method. And as I mentioned, we see inside before each my first test and then inside after each. So as I mentioned before, in case you want to reinitialize or for example, to change the value of a specific 
attribute or for example if you are running your tests against database so you can just initialize and insert some data in the before each and after each you can delete them or re-update the data in order to be able to use them in the, in the next method all right so now let's move on and let's see what are the other methods other than the before each and the after each all right now the question is what if i want to execute a setup or to initialize a few attributes and variables only before the execution of the, the whole class so i don't want to run this method before each method but i just want to wanted to be executed only once so in this case we have also another method so let's click on generate and here we see we have a before class so when i use a before class so it's called a before all again i will copy this message and here i will say inside the before all method so now when i run my test so you can whether run it from here or again click on this play button or just run one of the tests so let's go ahead and run and rerun the whole class and see what we have. So for example, let's select this one. So here we have first, when we select the method, we see only these three output messages, which is the before each, the method, and then the after all. But when I select the class, we see that we, we are inside the before all methods and then inside the before each method and the after each method and we have it again for the second method so now just i want to make this output clear so i will be running only one method so like that you will see it in a better way so now we see that we are inside the before all method and then inside the before each my first method and then inside the after all method so this is the case if i want to initialize something a service for example or to create a new instance of an instance or an array list uh, or something like that but i just wanted to i want to do it only one time i don't want to do it each time so in this case we need or we use the before all method so now in the same way we have another method called after all so let's go ahead and try this one and then let's move to the real implementation of the real test cases of our student mapper class all right in the same way let's generate an after class or an after all method and again i will just copy paste and here inside the after all method so if i run one of the test classes or the test methods that we have and here let's go ahead and check the output so here we have inside the before all and then inside the after all and in between we have the before each the, the test method and the after each so the use case of the after all and the before all is for example i want to initialize or insert some data into my database in case we are using for example an in-memory database so i want to insert some data and then once i'm done i want to remove them for example or even if i'm working against my dev environment uh, database or something like that so in this in this way we can initialize data work with them and once we are done we can remove all the data that we already inserted so in this case in this way we are safe from polluting and inserting wrong data into our database all right, so now you know the structure of a test class. What are the methods that we can use within a test class? So now let's go ahead and start implementing a few test cases for our student mapper class. All right, now let's start implementing our tests. First of all, let's start by cleaning up all this code. So let's remove it and also let's re-optimize the imports. And now let's implement the first method. So here, just to remind you, we have our student mapper class that performs a mapping. So it transforms a student DTO to a student object and then we have to student response and it transforms a student to a student response DTO. So now coming back to our student mapper test. So here the first thing that you need to do is to declare the service that you want to test. So here we want to test our student mapper. So let's create an object of type student mapper and then let's call it mapper for example. And then the first method or like the first use case or the test case that we want to implement 
is that we want to make sure that this to student mapper performs a correct mapping from student DTO to the student object. So here let's create our first method public void and let's call it should map student DTO to student class. All right. So this is our first method and to make it a test method, we need to add always the test annotation. So then you see that this student mapper right here is not yet instantiated. So we don't have an instance or an object of type student mapper. So it's just the variable or the field. So now we have two options, whether to initialize it in here so we can do new student mapper or we can use one of the test of, of the setup methods. So here we can add a before each and then we can move this part right here to this setup method. So we can make it this way or the other way round. So let's go ahead with the before each. So now we have our mapper object initialized and now let's start creating and implementing our first test method. So here, the first thing that we need to do, we need to create an object of type student DTO since this is the input of our to student method. So now let's go ahead and do it. So here we have an object of type student DTO. Let's call it DTO equals new student DTO. And for this, let's call it John. And then for the last name, let's call it Doe. And we have an email. So john at mail.com, for example. And then we have an int the school ID. So in this way, so I'm going to just align this one. So in this way, we have our student object. So after that, all we need to do is to call this to student method. So here, let's create an object of type student. And let's call it student equals our mapper dot to student. And then we pass the student DTO. And then we will start asserting that the output of this mapping method is what we expect. So here, let's go back to this to student method. And we know that we when we call this student method, we just set these fields. And then we have an object of type school. So again, we can test. So what we want to focus on is that we have also a mapping for this school object and that we have all the fields not changed. So now let's first start by asserting and in order to assert. So here we have assert equals and this assert equals. So it comes from assertions. So the assertions is from the package org.gunit.jupyter.api dot assert equals and here for the assert equals we have multiple implementations so we can assert equals shorts bytes uh, strings integers and so and so forth so here let's do assert equals and then what we want to test we want to make sure that our dto dot get first name to be equals our student object dot get first name so here we want to make sure that this first name is the same for the class student. All right. So now also we can import statically this assert equals and we can do that by add static import for the unit ju uh, Jupyter API assertions dot assert equals. So when we do that and when we go up, so you will see right here that we have a static import for that method. So the next time you see assert equals, or any static usage of a method. So you know that it's statically imported in here. All right. So now let's continue the assertion. And here we have the first name. Let's also test the last name and here get last name. And after that, we have the email and also here get email. And finally, we want to make sure that this, the school is not null. So here, for example, we have the assert not null. So as you can see here, so I want to assert not null that my student dot get school is not null. All right. So then we can also make sure that the school ID was correctly set. So what I can do, we can assert equals. So our DTO dot school ID is the same as student dot get school dot get ID. 
So at this level, we are safe because we have an assertion that the school is not null. But if we change the order, we might encounter a null pointer exception in case the school is not correctly mapped. So now let's just go ahead and run this test method and let me show you what is the impact and the execution of this method. So here we see that the method was green. But now you might ask the question, I'm just making sure that this object that I created manually is the same as I called this method. So now let's go to our student. And for example, let's say that I forgot to set the school to the student object. And now if I go back and rerun again the test, let's see what will happen. So here we have a test failed. So here we see that expected not null, but the object was null at this point. So here you see that assert not null of the school. So this means that the school was null and I'm expecting the school to be not null. So now step by step, you see the importance of having unit tests within our application. So let's go back to the mapper and let's bring this back. And then, for example, let's say when I transform the first name or the last name, I just I just do to uppercase. All right. So I transform the first name to an uppercase. If I rerun the test again, you will see that the test will fail. And here we see this message. So here we have assertion failed error and the expected was John which is the object right here that we initialized with, a, with our DTO and the output was John with an uppercase. So this is also another or a different assertion level or an assertion test that we make sure that the input should be exactly the same as the expected output. All right, so now let's go back to our mapper and let's just remove this one. And in case, for example, you have changed the implementation of this to student method, you need also to update the test. Okay, so in this case, you make sure that everything works fine. So let's run the test one more time and make sure that everything works fine. So our test is green. Now we can move on and implement other tests. All right, so now since you know and you understood how to implement tests, so I want to give you a small exercise. I want you to implement the test method for testing these two student response DTO and it should take a student object and then return a student response DTO. So you can also inspire and follow the same example we did right here. I want you to create another method and you call it should map student to student response DTO. So I will let you do it and I will provide you the correction in the next lecture. That's good. I was sure that you will implement it correctly. So let's do it together. All right. So first of all, we need to create a public void method and then let's call it should map a student or student to student response DTO. All right. And then parentheses and then the brackets and don't forget the test annotation. All right. So the first thing, as we did before, we need to create an object of type student. All right. So here go student, student equals new student. And then let's initialize our student object. So here, let's say Jane as a first name and then Smith as a last name. And then let's provide an email. So Jane at mail.com. And then we need an age. Let's say, for example, it's 20. And let me align this. All right. So now we have our student. Then all we need to do is to create an object of student response DTO and let's call it response equals our mapper and then to student response DTO and we need to pass our student. All right, now comes the assertion part. So the first thing we need to do is to assert first name, last name and email and make sure that the result is the same since within our student response DTO, we only have three attributes. All right. So now let's say assert equals, and then I want my response dot first name to be the same as my student dot get first name, the same for last name. So here last name and then get last name, the same for the age. I want the age to be the same as the student dot get age. Uh, sorry, we don't have an age for the response DTO, but it's email. 
and here it should be the same as get email. All right, so now let me add a few comments. So here, how, how we can read the test. So here we have given a student object and then when we map the student to a student response DTO, then I want or I expect this result. So now let's go ahead and run the test and make sure that everything works fine and we did not forget anything. So the test is green. Also, let's go ahead and run the whole class. And here we have all the tests are green and passing. Okay, so that's it. Let's move on and let me talk to you about something really, really important when you implement an application and mainly you can detect that with the tests. All right, now let me talk to you about something else. So here I will just start by creating a new test method. And after this method, I will just create a method called public void. And then this is also a different way of writing the, the method name. So we can write it in this way, should map student DTO to student object. All right, but this new method, I want to add if, or let's make it when, student DTO is not. So this means I want the mapping to be or to perform correctly or in an expected way, even if the student DTO that I'm passing right here is null. So what I will be doing, I will just copy this part right here and then paste it in this method. And instead of passing the DTO, I will pass a null object. So here, what I will be doing, let's say for example, so we will change this later on, but let's start expecting this. So here, let's say an empty string and here an empty string. All right, now if I run this test method, let's make it a test. And if I run this test method, let's see what will happen. So here we have a null pointer exception cannot invoke the student DTO dot first name because DTO is null. All right, and the exception happened inside the mapper itself. So if I click here, we see that the, the problem is exactly in here because we are trying to get the first name from a null object. And here we mainly talk about code coverage. So we need to cover all the use cases that our method and our service class and our class, generally speaking, should handle. So here you see and you noticed that we did not handle the case when we pass a null DTO object. So in this case, what we need to do, we need to go back to our student mapper and then we need to add a test or a check or do whatever just to make sure that when we receive a null object, we want to do something, whether raise an exception or just printing a message or even, for example, initializing an empty student object with, for example, let's say empty values. So the implementation always depends on the requirements of, of your story or of the application that you are implementing. So now let's go ahead and start doing this. So in this case or in this use case, we will see many things. So the first thing, let's go back to to student. And here I want to do if my DTO is null, for example, I want to throw a null pointer exception. All right. So here we need the new keyword. So a new null pointer exception. And here the student, for example, as a message, the student DTO is not all right so now we add we added a coverage to our method so now let's go back to the test and make sure to readjust the test right here in order to make sure that this student method should throw a null pointer exception when we get a null dto student so we don't need this one since we don't have any assertions and now let's just rename this method to make it more relevant and here instead of should map so let's say should throw and then a null pointer exception when student dto is null so now we have this mapper dot to student and then we are assigning it to a student so we can also remove this assignment since we know that it will throw an exception and it will return nothing so now how can how can i expect or make sure that this to student is going to throw a null pointer exception so in order to do that 
all I need to do, I need to assert that this method is going to throw a null pointer exception. So I'm just going to remove it. And now I'm going to use assert throws. So here, this throws method, first of all, it gets the expected type. So in our case, it's a null pointer exception dot class, and then it's a Lambda expression. So here, when we call the mapper dot to student, I'm expecting to have a null pointer exception dot class thrown. So let's run this method and make sure that it passes green right now. So now this method is throwing this exception. So now what if I want to check the message that the message should be the student DTO is null or should not be null. So here, let's just rename it should not be null. And I'm going to copy this message. And now I will go back here. So in order to do that, all I need to do, let's create a var message equals this. So as you can see, this assert throws, it will return the exception itself. All right. So now if I do msg dot, and here I have access to the method get message from the null pointer exception or from the exception, generally speaking. So now I want to do assert equals. I want this error message to be equal to my message or exception dot get message. So let's just rename this one to exp to say it's an exception. So exp for exception. And now if I run again, let we need to be sure that the, the method through this exactly the correct error message. So here, for example, if I add a dot and run again, the method should fail. And as you can see, now the method failed. And the assertion failure is we are expecting this, but we got this one. So in this case, we gained two things. The first one is that we add a coverage to our to student method. And then we also covered this with it within the test. So for example, in case I want to change from null pointer exception to a different exception, it will be automatically detected by this test method. Again, if I change, for example, the exception message, it will be also automatically detected. So now let me run it again and make it green. And now we added a new coverage to our method. So this is how you can test exceptions. And this is how you can catch exceptions and make sure or you can do whatever you want. Even if you work with custom exceptions that you create your own, you can also capture that and do whatever you need to assert everything is as expected. All right. So now let's move on to the next part. All right. So we finished the implementation of the student mapper and we saw how we can create a test class, how we can create test methods. Also, we saw how we can or how, how much we need to cover our code like we need to cover all the use cases. Now let's move and start testing or writing tests for our student service. So we know that this student service is a spring component and it has a strong dependency with student mapper and the student repository. And especially when we talk about student repository, we talk about communicating with database. So when it comes to testing, how can we test and how can we tell Spring or this student service that we have a student repository and this one needs to communicate with the database? And what happens in case we don't have a real database for testing? Because testing, it does not necessarily, necessarily need to have a database for testing. So that's why we will talk about test isolation. So test isolation means that we want to run and to write tests for this student service in isolation of its dependencies. In a different way, I want to execute and write tests for this student service, but I don't necessarily need to have the real instance and the real object of my student repository, the same for my student mapper. So what do I need to do? I need to mock these two objects. So to do that, we have, there is a framework called Mokitu. So Mokitu is a popular Java testing framework that helps you create mock objects and stab behaviors when writing unit tests. So it's especially useful when you want 
to isolate a specific component of your code and test it in isolation from its dependencies. So now we know what we need to do. We need to isolate and we need to mock. So you need to remember this term. We need to mock our objects. We need to mock the student repository and the student mapper to be able to run the student service test in an isolated way. So let's go ahead and let me show you how we can isolate and how we can mock the objects and the methods for each service that we have right here. So now, as always, the next step is we need to go and create a test class for our student service. So all I need to do, navigate here and then command shift T and create a new test. So here we don't need any of these. We just maybe need or use the setup method. So I will just check it out and then click on OK. So here we have our before each and we have our student service test class. So as we did for the student mapper, what we need to do here, first of all, which service that we, wa we want to test. So in this case, we want to test our student service. So I will create an object of student service and I will call it student service. And then when it comes to objects that have dependencies, Let's check in here. So we see that our student service has two dependencies that we need to inject. All right. So our constructor is a constructor with parameter and it requires a, an object of type repository and an object of type student mapper. So let's just go ahead and do that. I'm just going to copy this one and in here declare the dependencies. All right. I'm going to paste this and then I will just fix the code. All right, so now I have my service and I have the dependencies. So what I need to do, so we said that in order to run this student service in an isolated way, what we need to do, we need to mock the student repository and the student mapper. So what we need to do, there is an annotation called mock. So this mock annotation comes from org.mockito. It's not the one coming from the org.spring framework. We want to use the mock from org.mockito. So let's select it one and the same we need to add it to our student mapper. So in this, in this way, we are telling our test class and the mockito framework that we want to create mock for this repository and a mock for this student mapper. All right. Now, how can we tell this mocking framework that we want to inject these two properties and these two dependencies into this service right here? So the answer is kind of straightforward because I just mentioned injecting. So we have an annotation called inject mocks. So inject mocks always is coming from the org.mockito package and like this, our mocking framework will try to find any dependencies annotated with the mock annotation that is compatible with the dependencies that are required from our student service. So this means when we try to create an instance or to initialize this student service, the mocking framework will look for two objects annotated with the mock annotation and that are of type. One of them is of type repository and the second one is of type student mapper. All right, so now we prepared everything. We still need to do one more step. So then what we need to do, we need to tell the Mockito framework that we want to open the mocks or like we want to start the mocks for this current class. So this means that in the before each here, what we need to do, we need to use the Mockito annotations class dot open mocks and these open mocks takes an object, which is the test class, as you can see right here. So let's give it this because we want to open the mocks for the current class. All right. So may you might see this warning right here. This is because the open mock methods return an auto closable. So, and this, the IntelliJ or your IDE will recommend to you that you might need to, you might want to use a try with resource, but we can ignore that for the moment. It's not something really important or really uh, gonna break our test. All right, so now we set up our test class. Now let's move on and implement the first test method 
that will allow us to save a student. So the first one, it will be this save student. That's good. Now let's analyze our save student. So we have here, first of all, we are doing a mapping and then saving the repository. And then again, we are doing a second mapping. So this is what we need to test in our test method. So let's go back to our student service test. And here I will create a public void and then should successfully save a student. All right, so this is our test method. Let's not forget the test annotation. And now here, let's remember the given when and then. So here, given what? So here in our save method, we have a student DTU. So let's first of all, create a student DTU object. So let's go back here. And here I have, first of all, my student DTO object. Also this class it is going to need a, an object of type student, which is this one. So let's also go ahead and prepare our student. So it will be almost the same. So just copy the signature right here. And here I will create an object of type student. Let's call it student equals and then new student. All right, here, let's remove this one. All right, here we have also our student object and our student DTO. So what we want to do or like how this is gonna work, this means is when we call our student service dot save student, we are expecting an object of type student response DTO. All right, so here I will create an object of type student response DTO. I will call it response DTO equals our student service dot save student and then we have a DTO. So this is the DTO that we will pass as a parameter. And then what we need to do is to start asserting. So let's say assert equals, and then we have our DTO object dot get first name should be equal our response DTO dot get first name. All right, let's do the same also for the last name and also the email. So we can stick just to these few fields. We don't need to test everything. So this is what we want to test. So now if I run the test, what should happen? So let's go ahead and check together. So I will run this test method and let's see what will be the output. Here we see that we have a null pointer exception saying that we cannot invoke student response TTO dot get first name because the response TTO is null and this is happening in here. So this means what? I'm gonna just add a breakpoint right here and I will run again this test in debug mode. So here, let's see our student service. So we have an object since it's already mocked, the same for our repository. So we, as you can see, we have a Mokito interceptor and so and so forth. So now if I evaluate this expression and then evaluate expression and then evaluate, we see that the result is null. Okay, so let me explain to you why we have this null result. So this null result is because the student service is trying to call the student mapper and then we have the student repository is also going to call the save method. But remember, here we have a mock. So we don't have the real instance or the real service running for our test because we decided to run our student service in isolation mode. So to do that, what we need to do here, we need to mock the calls. So which calls that we need to mock? We need to mock every call that uses another service or another dependency in our student service. And in this case, we have the student mapper and we have the repository.save. So let me show you now how we can mock these calls. So the first thing that we need to mock is the, as you can see here, the first thing that we that we do is the mapping. So let's mock the mapping. All right, so now in order to mock the calls, so the first thing that we need to mock is our to student. So student mapper dot to student method. So this comes from Mokito. We have a static method called when so this means when we call a method, so we have as a parameter the method to call. So here we have student mapper dot to student. So when we call this to student with our DTO object. So make sure that 
the mock will work only if we pass this object right here. So then what we want to do, then we have so many options. So we can return, we can return whether a student, we can also a student and a list of other students, we can return an answer, or we can even throw an exception. So in our case, we want to return an object, which is our student right here. So let's return the student. And now we are done with the first mock of our student mapper dot to student method. So here when we say when we are mocking a method. All right. So this when we call the student mapper dot to student DTO, then we need to return the student object. So this means that our student service will run in isolation mode and it does not 100% depend on the real implementation or the uh, not the real implementation but the real instance of the student mapper so also let's import this in statically so when student mapper then return all right so let's do the same for our repository so when our repository dot save and then student then return our student itself all right because we know that when we save a student we return another student or if you want to be more consistent or if you want to have like more uh, details, you can even create another student object. You can call it like saved student and set the ID and set everything. And also you can return that one. So let's just do it. It's, it's totally fine. So I will call it saved student and then I will just do saved student dot set ID and let's give it the ID number one. And in here, I will return our saved student. All right, so now we have three objects. So first we have the DTO and then the student that will come from the mapping. And now this is the student that should be saved in the database. So now again, we mocked the second call, which is our repository. So if we go back in here, we still need to return another call. So here we need to mock also the student mapper dot to student response DTO. So in order to do that, just in the same way. So here we have when we call our student mapper dot to response DTO of our student object, which one, which is the saved student. All right. So here we have then return. Let's now just return a new student response DTO. And all we need to do is to pass the first name, last name and email. So this is the first name, last name and email. So let's just copy them from here. So we have our John Doe. I'm also going to inline this so you can see the full code and the email is just john at email.com. All right. So now we have our test set and ready. So let's go ahead and run the test right now and see the output. So I'm just going to click and run this one and let's see what will happen. So now our test is green. So we have all the expectations and everything was running in a successful way because we have here, we mocked everything. And in case, for example, I just change anything or I, you forget to, uh, to mock a step, your test will fail. That's good. Now we created our first test method and we saw how we can mock objects and also do some assertions. So this is the classic assertions. But now what if we ask the question, how can I check that my application is performing well? So here, for example, in this save student, I want to make sure that I only save one time the student into the database. This means, for example, I don't want to have some error or like someone typing two or three times this repository.save because this will save the student many times. And in case, for example, you have a unique constraint, it might throw an exception and this will break the application. So let me show you how we can prevent this from happening. So if I go back to my student service right here, we can do this in the same place since we have our code already set up. All right. So here we are mocking. And now what I want to do, I want to make sure that this student mapper dot to student was called only one time, same for the repository and the same for this one. All right. So to do that, 
Mokito also provides us with a method called verify as you can see here. So we want to verify and then we need to, to type the mock object. So our mock object is the class or the instance itself and then we can pass a parameter. So it's a verification mode. So here we have a mokito dot times. Also we have timeout. We have so many other options. I can, for example, check that a method call should take only just, just as an example, should take only two seconds maximum to be executed. If it goes beyond two seconds, the test will fail. And like that, I can also make sure that I have performance issues with my application. All right, so now let's continue with these times. So I want to be sure that this student mapper dot to student and then the object student DTO or the DTO object that we created, it has been called only one time, All right? So let's do the same for repository and then times one and then the save method when we pass the student object. Again, I will do, I will duplicate this one and here's student mapper and then to response DTO or to student response DTO. And here, just to make sure that we passed the saved student as an object, all right? So here we need to say saved student. All right, I'm just going to align these methods right here just so you can see everything. So here verify that this method or these three methods of the different services were called only one time. So let's go ahead and run the method again. So run this and then the test passed. So now let's suppose for example that one of the developers or me for example as also as a developer of this application I accidentally forgot to remove this extra line. All right, so now if I rerun the test again, let's see what will happen. So the test will fail and we will see here that wanted one time. So this means that we wanted to have our call only one time, but it was called two times. And here, so as you can see here, you have student service .save student that was called two times. All right, and it was pointing to here and then to here. So here we see that even the test will point us directly where the issue has happened. All right, so that's good. Now let's move on and let me give you a small exercise and I'm pretty sure that you will be implementing it really easy without any issues. Now let me give you an exercise. I want you to implement the test for these find all students. So it needs to cover and to make sure that when you make a call to this repository dot find all, it should return the exact same list that you already expect. And in the next lecture, I will show you how to fix this one. All right, that's good. I'm sure that you correctly implemented the test for this find all student, but also let's go ahead and do it together. So I will create as usual, a public void, and then I will call it should return all students. And then we have the given. So for the given, the first thing that we need to do is to create a list. So let's create a list of students. So this is the object that will be returned. So let's call it students equals new array list. And then let's add one student. So student dot add, and we can even copy the student from the previous method right here. So I'm just gonna copy this one and I will insert this student here. All right, so now we have one element in, in our student list. And then we need to mock the calls. So the first call that we need to mark is when we call our student repository or the repository object dot find all, then I need to return the students list that we created. All right. And then what we need to do, we need to mark the call for the mapping. All right. So here we have when mapper or student mapper dot to student response DTO 
and here since we might add or pass any student so we can use the power of mokitu and here we have argument matchers dot any and here when we say any we can also specify the class so when we receive any class of type student dot dot class then i want to return for example a new op like a new object of type response student response dto something like that so i'm just gonna inline this so when we call the student mapper dot to student response dto passing any object of type student we want to return this object we can also make it more dynamic but for the sake of a simple um, test case it's also easy and it's also okay to make it like this and here we just forgot the test annotation so we need to add it and now all we need to do is to have a list of type student response dto and then let's call it response dto's equals our student service dot find all all right and here so this is given and now it's when when we call this one so then so here for here we do assert equals that our students list dot size to be equal to our students dto's dot size or response dto's dot size all right so this is the implementation let's go ahead and run this method and make sure that everything is fine all right also should return all students is green we can also add an extra test and make sure that for example this repository dot find all was called only once so let's go ahead and test it just to make sure always that we have per our application performing really well so here we have our repository and then times one and then dot find all to be called only one time let's rerun again all right so the, uh, the test is still green so now let's move on and let me tell you what we will be doing next all right now i want to give you another exercise and i want you to implement the test for this find student by id i'm pretty sure you're gonna do it in a correct way and i will see you in the correction all right so as usual let's go back to our student service test java class and the first thing that we need to do is adding this test annotation and then creating a public void and let's call the method should find student by id or should return student by id all right so here always the given and here we have an int student id or an integer let's make it an integer student id equals one and then let's create a student object we can also take it from here so let's call it student so here we have student student equals new student and then we have when so here we need to mock so here we have when we call our repository dot find by id and then we pass our student id and then i want to return an optional dot of my student all right and you might ask the question why i used optional because this find by id is going to return an optional the second mock that we need to do we need to mock the two student response dto from this from the student mapper class and to return that one so from that we can just copy this one and then let's paste it in here so here we have when we make a call to our student mapper we are going to map this one and again we can just go up and copy this assertions so here i will create an object of type student response dto i will call it dto equals my student service dot find by id and then i will pass the student id that i created and now we have the then so here we start the assertions so here we have our the dto dot first name should be exactly the same one as the student dot get first name so here i will just copy the student from here and i will just replace it in here so now we can select all and here we have get and then let's make this one uppercase and now that's it 
Also, we can add another check. We want to verify that our repository has been called one time for the method find by ID. So passing also the student ID as an object, as a, uh, as a parameter. And now let's go ahead and run this new test method. All right, so we might miss something. Okay, so here expected john at example.com, but the actual was john.mail.com. So maybe let's fix it. So here we have mail. Let's change this one also to mail. And let's rerun again. And the test is green and fine. All right, so that was it for this method. Let's move on and implement the next one. That's good you really made a really good progress and I'm really proud of you. So the next method that we need to implement the test for is find student by name. And just I want to give you a quick hint, you can inspire from the previously implemented methods in order to implement it in a correct way. So take your time and I will see you in the next lecture to provide you the solution for this exercise. All right, you did a good job. Now let's correct this exercise together and you might learn something new. So as always, we need to add the test annotation and then we have a public void and let's call the method should find student by name. All right, so then what we need to do, the first thing we can also copy things from what we have before. So I'm going to explain it one by one. So we can copy this part right here. We can also copy this one right here. So here we copy it. So also let's copy it with a given. So here the initialization of the students list. And then we have the mock for the find all. This one we will change later on. And also we need to copy the mapping. So let's go back the, here and now. So when we call the find student by first name containing, and here I just need also to declare a string student name. Let's call it John. All right, so here containing student name, then return the students list. And then when we call the student mapper dot to student response DTO of any student object, I want also to return this mapped object or the student response DTO. Now, when I call, so here let's use a var just to make it shorter. I will call it response DTO equals our service dot find all by name. And here I need to pass the student name. So then I need to do some assertions. So I want to do assert equals that the students dot size is equals to our response DTO dot size. So this is what we need to do or what we need to check. Also, we can add a verify that our repository has been called one time for the method find all by first name containing our student name. So I'm going to break the line for this one. And now let's run the test and check the result. All right, so the test is green and our method is correctly implemented. All right, that's good. So now we still have only one method in our student service. So let's go ahead and create an exercise for that. And also we will see the solution together. I'm really happy to see you here. So this means that you finished the video to the end and now it's the moment for the greatest announcement. So this is just the beginning for this new year and the coming videos will cover much, much more things and much more topics and context about the spring framework. So the next video will be something super important and we will cover in, in five or six hours the whole spring data JPA. So don't miss the opportunity if you're not part of our community. If you're not subscribed to the channel, just hit the subscribe button, join me on this journey and stay tuned to the coming videos. Also, it's not just the end because 
the video that's coming after that will be a real game changer it will be like a huge content so i'm super excited to share to share that with you and i really would like to see you sharing this video helping others learn help me grow this channel and i hope to see you very soon